Welcome to Old Time Rewind. I'm your host, Raven. Get comfy, get cozy. Tonight's Rewind is... Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. A vicious killer has taken the life of a 62-year-old woman. Suspicion points in only one direction. The murderer was heartless, cold-blooded. Your job, get him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. It's the long cigarette that contains an essential ingredient of all the very popular cigarettes, Turkish tobacco. That's why you see the turkey symbols on the attractive golden yellow Fatima package. That's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima doubles and redoubles its smokers. Yes, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Saturday, November 5th. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 3.35 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. This is Friday in Homicide. I'd like to place a call to Mr. Frank Renard in Murphy, Idaho, the number is 761. Frank Renard, Murphy, Idaho, 761. Yeah, that's right. The call's been cleared with the business office. All right. Uh, do you want me to call you back, Sergeant? No, I'll hang on. Okay, I'll place it for you. Long distance, Mr. Frank Renard, Murphy, Idaho, Murphy, 761. Your number, please. Charge call to Madison, Sergeant Friday, Los Angeles Police Department. I've got an urgent message for you. For me? Well, what's the matter? Well, your wife, Dolores, asked me to call you. Something's happened to your mother. What do you mean? What's happened? Well, I better let your wife tell you. She wants you back in Los Angeles right away. Look, what's this all about? I can't leave my job now. You better come. Your mother's been murdered. Talk to the skipper, Joe. He's on his way in. That's good. Did you call my husband? Did you? He's flying down from Idaho tonight. Be here in the morning. You tell him about me? The trouble I'm in? I told him his mother was murdered. That's all I told him, Mrs. Renard. What am I going to say to Frank? He always sided in with his mother. He'll never believe me. 
What can I tell him? Jury can give you more trouble than your husband can. What you gonna tell them? Are you stupid or something? How many times do I have to say it? I didn't kill her. I didn't kill her. It's a small room, Miss Renard. We can hear you. Sit down, please. I won't sit down. You're not pinning this on me because I didn't do it. Anybody could have killed the old hag, but I didn't. Will you sit down, please? I don't have to take this. I'm no tramp. Keeping me in here asking me questions. I told you all I know. Look, you're in a bad spot. I hope you realize that. I didn't kill her. Miss Renard, how long have you and your mother-in-law been living together in the house on Chavez Road? Since Frank took the job up in Idaho. About six months. He said it'd be better for me while he was away living with her. Your neighbors told us you didn't get along very well with your mother-in-law. That's right, I didn't. She hated me, I hated her. You used to fight with her, is that right? You hit her. Only a couple of times. She called me dirty names. I hit her. She pulled me by the hair. And I hated her like everything. And I didn't kill her. Once more, Ms. Renard, would you mind telling us how you spent your time since early this morning, where you went, what you did, everything? I told you already everything. Will you tell us again, please? I got up about quarter to nine. I had a cup of coffee, and then I got dressed. The old lady was on the back porch doing the washing. What did your mother-in-law do for a living? I told you. She took in washing. After I got dressed, I left the house. About ten minutes after nine, I went downtown to the dentist. He filled a tooth for me. This one here, you can ask him. What time did you leave the dentist's office? About quarter after ten. Maybe twenty after. You can ask him. What'd you do after that? I walked around window shopping. Did you buy anything? Talk to anybody? I told you no. What time did you get home? Half past twelve. I went in the bedroom. The old lady was on the floor. Blood all over. I felt her heart. It wasn't beating. Is that when you got the blood on your dress? Yeah. Now, that's all I'm going to say. Three times I told you the same story already. And you still can't account for your time between 10 20 this morning and the time you found the body and called the police at 12 30. I told you, I left the dentist, I went window shopping, then I walked home. And during that time, you didn't talk to anyone and no one saw you. Lots of people saw me. People on the street downtown. I'm no tramp. I don't talk to everybody. None of your neighbors saw you come home, Ms. Renard? Of course they didn't see me. I cut across the back lot up from San Jose Avenue. I came in the back way. The lady who lives next door to you, she says she was in the backyard about noon time. She stayed there till after 1 o'clock. She didn't see you come in the back way. Then she's a liar. She's a dirty liar. You and your husband took out an insurance policy on your mother-in-law last year. Is that right, Ms. Renard? Sure it is. What of it? Five thousand dollars? Yeah, so what? You know a man by the name of George Martino? No. You better tell the truth, Ms. Renard. All right, so I do. He's a friend of mine. You've been running around with him since your husband's been away. None of your business. I do what I want. Your mother-in-law found out about Martino. That's what you fought about most of the time. Oh, she was crazy. He's a friend of mine, that's all. Are you telling the truth, Ms. Renard? Martino's a boyfriend of mine. I told you, that's all. Your mother-in-law found out you were running around with him. She warned you if you didn't shake Martino, she'd write your husband. You said you'd kill her if she did. That's a lie. That's what your mother-in-law told one of the neighbor ladies. And I said it just to scare her. One night I was drinking. We had a fight. She was yapping at me all night. I said it just to scare her. But she wrote the letter anyway. And that's what she said. But I didn't kill her. You had the time, the motive, and the opportunity. It wasn't me. I didn't kill her. Interrogation room, Friday. This is Brennan, Joe. Yeah, Bill. Where are you? Santa Monica. Picked up George Martino. <laughs> Ben and I drove Mrs. Renard to Lincoln Heights Jail, fifth floor, and had her booked on suspicion of 187 PC. When we checked back in at the office, Brennan and Wiseman, the other two men on the case with Ben and I, were questioning George Martino in the interrogation room. Ben and I stood by. Martino admitted only two things. He had been running around with Mrs. Renard since her husband left town, and he had heard Mrs. Renard express a desire to do away with her mother-in-law. After the questioning of Martino, Sergeant Brennan, Ben and I met with Chief Ed Baxter. It was 5.15 p.m. You got everything but the murder weapon, huh? That and Mrs. Renard's confession. She ought to come through, huh, Joe? I don't know. She's scared, but she's still got a smart mouth. What about Martino, Brennan? You think he had a hand in it? I don't think so. We spent most of the afternoon talking to him. He hasn't got the guts. We took a statement. And does he have an alibi? Solid. What was the cause of death? Strangulation, multiple fractures of the skull. All motives are with Mrs. Renard, Chief. Pretty clear-cut job. No evidence of robbery or burglary, I guess. A couple of dresser drawers in the bedroom were emptied on the floor and clothes tossed all around. Pretty obvious plan to make it look like burglary. Maybe. 
We found three $1 bills in plain sight. They were on the floor near the body. If a burglar went through this stuff, he wouldn't have missed that money. And uh, it shouldn't be too much trouble tying it up. Shouldn't be, Skipper. Uh, Friday and Romero, you follow the case through. Uh, just a minute. Hello, Backstrand. Yeah? What? All right, I'll send him over. Lee Jones. Just finished checking the evidence at the crime lab. Yeah? He thinks Mrs. Renard's innocent. <laughs> There they are, fellas. Facts don't lie. But she had every reason in the world to kill the old lady. In my book, she couldn't have killed her. All right, let's have it, Lee. How does the evidence add up? That's just it, Joe. It doesn't. Take a look. All right. The dress Mrs. Renard was wearing when she found the body. That's it. Blood smears near the hem. Two smears, that's all. Now, if she murdered her mother-in-law, there should be more blood on this dress. It shouldn't be smeared. How do you mean? First of all, the manner in which the old lady was killed. Head was battered in. Must have bled profusely. No question about that. All right, go ahead. Whoever murdered the old lady must have stains all over their clothes. Here's the important part. Because of the nature of the wound, it would have stained in drops, not smears. Well, how can you tell the difference? Maybe these are drop stains on her desk. They're not. I checked them with the microscope. Only the higher ribs of the cloth are stained. The smears, nothing else. But a drop forms its own definite drop pattern and permeates the cloth, soaks in. Mm -hmm. No signs of that on her dress. Not a one. Now, here's the silk scarf the old lady was strangled with. Yeah. Here's what I found in the knot tied in the scarf. A blonde hair, wavy. Old lady had dark hair. So does Miss Renard. So does her boyfriend. That's what I mean. This blonde hair is one of two things that didn't belong at that murder scene. What else you got? This hair. What is it, Lee? Small piece of plastic. A gun butt, I'd say. See here? Uh-huh. Crisscross surface and a little smooth area here. Yeah. The killer could have hit the old lady with the butt of a gun. And a piece of the stock could have chipped off like this, huh? Miss Renard doesn't own a gun. Neither did her mother know. Where does that leave us? I don't know, Joe. There's the stuff. You can't disregard it. Maybe you can explain it. Yeah. How? Well, first prove this dress isn't the one Mrs. Renard was wearing this morning. Then find the dress she did wear. We know she wore this one. The dentist identified it, and so did two of the neighbors. That's what I mean. The dress is too clean. Doesn't belong. Yeah. And this blonde hair, this piece of gun butt, they don't belong either. Well, then you think she's innocent. You're looking at the evidence. What do you think? <laughs> 6 p.m. Saturday, November 5th. Ben and I went back to the office and met with Brennan, Wiseman, and Ed Backstrand. The open and shut case against Mrs. Renard was up in the air, but we still weren't sure that she was innocent of the murder of her mother-in-law. Ben and I drove to the Lincoln Heights jail and interviewed the suspect again. She agreed to submit to a lie detector test. We drove back to the office, contacted Sergeant Berger, the department's polygraph man, and set up a special test for the following day. The next morning, we met with Berger and formulated a list of key questions. And then we picked up Mrs. Renard and brought her to the third floor of the old city jail building, the polygraph room. At 10.33 a.m., the test got underway. As usual, Sergeant Berger conducted the interview alone. Backstrand, Ben, and I waited outside. Well, um, how about Mrs. Renard's husband? Getting down yet? He's doing around noon, Skipper. Uh, uh, got a smoke? Yeah. Here you Yeah, thanks. What time is it now? 11.25. Mm, here's Berger now. Huh? That's it, Ed. Well, what'd you get? I can study the chart a little more. The results are pretty well defined, though. How's it look? No reaction to the key questions. What's your opinion? I don't think she did it. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. And in leading magazines this week, you'll see this authentic story. Headline, Fatima's sensational growth sets a record for long cigarettes. Then you'll read the actual reasons smokers give for changing to Fatima. Fatima is different. It's mild and has a wonderful flavor. Fatima's best. These are the words of Miss Pamela Bookman of New York, where Fatima has increased its smokers... 132 percent. Fatima tastes much better than any other long cigarette. It's the best. Says Mr. James S. Winterhalter of Detroit, where Fatima smokers have increased 348 percent. I like the flavor, and Fatima is mild. It's the best long cigarette. That's the statement of Mrs. Mary C. Werdeman of Los Angeles, where Fatima has increased its smokers 545 percent. Yes, More and more long cigarette smokers every day agree. A change to Fatima is a change to the best. Enjoy Fatima yourself. 
best of long cigarettes. Eight a.m. Monday, November seventh. Mrs. Renard was released from custody. We questioned her husband, Frank Renard, briefly. He could tell us nothing more than we already knew. Brennan and Wiseman were called back on the case, and together the four of us started over again from the beginning. We had a dead body, two pieces of physical evidence to work with, no idea how to fit them together, and no suspects. We went back to the Chavez Road neighborhood where the murdered woman lived and started pushing doorbells. We canvassed the neighborhood for three days, and we uncovered one slim lead. He was selling magazines, officer. Went door to door, right up the street here. Young fellow. Could you describe the main force, please? Nothing to talk about. Pasty face, pimply complexion, blonde hair. 5.30 p.m. Wednesday, November the 9th. Ben and I met with Brennan and Wiseman in Ed Backstrand's office to compare notes. Together, we had more than a dozen reports of the magazine salesman's presence in the neighborhood just prior to the murder of Mrs. Renard's mother-in-law. The various descriptions of the man which we obtained from the people in the neighborhood tallied closely. About six feet, 170 pounds, pimply complexion, blonde hair, fast talking. About... 25 years old. As far as we know, Skipper, he was the only stranger in the neighborhood last Saturday morning. Only one that people remember, anyway. How close did you trace him to the Renard house? You got your list there, Brennan? Yeah. There you are. Thanks. Let's see. Well, he picked up his tracks down on Floresta Street, sold a couple of descriptions there, then he headed up Landers Avenue onto Chavez Road. Yeah. The Renards live at 2280 Chavez Road. That salesman talked to the woman at 2274 Chavez. That's three doors away from the Renards. Uh, when was he seen then? Well, let me see. Where is that, Brennan? Oh, on the 15-7 sheet, Joe. Didn't have enough room on the report. Oh, yeah. Here it is. Mrs. John Rico, 2274 Chavez. The guy was there about 11.45 Saturday morning. Yeah, well, that puts him in the running. First time he ever showed in that neighborhood. First time, Skipper. Fresh kid, not a very good salesman. Here's the name of the company he's working for, the Harrison News Distributors. You check with them? No, they're closed for the night. We'll call them the first thing tomorrow. Good. Here's something else for you. I had a call from Frank Renard this afternoon. What'd he have to say? Seems in the excitement just after the murder, Mrs. Renard overlooked a couple of things. What's that? Well, they're missing a yellow table model radio. radio. It was in the bedroom where the old lady was killed. Uh, well, that ties in with a robbery motive, huh? And they're missing a ring, too. Belonged to Mrs. Renard. Topaz ring. It's supposed to be worth a little money. But she didn't notice it was gone until today. That's right. You got the serial number on the radio? Yeah, right here. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, Ben, here we are. It's an Emerson model 511... One eighty thousand two seven seven six zero nine. A lot of small radios in town. There's only one with that serial number on it. Track it down. A complete description of the topaz ring and the serial numbers and description of the yellow table model radio were sent to the pawn shop detail. The information was then placed on the stolen property list and relayed to every pawn shop operator in the city. The next morning, Ben and I interviewed the manager of the Harrison News Distributing Company. There, the suspect had given his name as Sam Bricker. We checked out his home address. Turned out to be a gas station in North Hollywood. We took the suspect's job application blank with a specimen of his handwriting, and then we drove back to the office. Sam Bricker. We were unable to get a make on the name from the record bureau. We checked the cards and every known criminal who was cataloged in the oddity files having a pimply complexion. None of them matched. That night, we got out an APB and a radiogram. The suspect's trail led from one salesman's job to the next. On his last job, he gave his name as Albert Berry. His address is 1430 Palo Alto Drive. That was in the Echo Lake District. Ben and I drove out to check it. 1428. 1430. There it is, Joe. Yeah. At least it's not a gas station, huh? Come on. Tiresome, huh? Yeah, I could stand a change. Yes, what is it? We're looking for an Albert Barry, ma'am. Does he live here? Mr. Barry, I'm sorry. He and his wife moved four days ago. We identified ourselves as police officers and had the landlady, a Mrs. Catherine Hoffman, show us the apartment which Barry and his wife had occupied. It was still vacant. In one of the closets in the apartment, we found a cheap overnight bag. The lock on it was broken and one of the seams had ripped. I forgot about that old bag, and Mr. Barry told me I could throw it away. Take a look. I'm in. Yeah. How long has Barry been married? Do you know, Mrs. Hoffman? No, I don't. But the way they acted, lovey-dovey all the time, I don't think they've been together long. Hey, Joe. Hmm? Look, some kind of an identification tag. Yeah, let me see. Get it up here. It's a tool disc, it looks like, doesn't it? Jameson Larrabee, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You're not after Mr. Barry, are you, officer? Yes, yes. ma'am, we are. Did he leave a forwarding address? I wish he did. I'm holding three letters for Mrs. Barry in my apartment right now. May we see them, please? Certainly. Would you step this way, please? My apartment's just across the hall. Yes, ma'am. 
Would you like a bottle of beer or something? No, ma'am, thanks. Let's see. I thought I put... Yes, here they are. Three of them, Sergeant. From her folks, I think. Mrs. Berry's from Fresno. Oh, that's good. I want to copy down this return address, ma'am. Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead. Okay. That's C.K. Ulrich, U-L-R-I-C-K. Mm. 525 North Lamona, Fresno. Yeah, go ahead. Where you are, Miss Hoffman. By the way, did the Berry say they'd call for their mail? Uh, Mrs. Berry did. That's why I'm holding on to it. All right. Just one more question. Do you remember if Mr. and Mrs. Berry had a radio? Yes, they did. A small one. Do you remember what brand it was? No, I don't. It had a yellow case. That's all I remember. <laughs> Before we left, we called Ed Backstrand, and he had an immediate stakeout placed at the apartment house in case the Berries returned to pick up their mail. Ben and I went back to the office and placed a call to the Pittsburgh Police Department. We gave them the description and the number of the tool disc which we'd found in Berry's old suitcase. They said they'd check with the Jameson Larrabee Company in the morning, and then they'd call us back. That night, Ben and I drove to Fresno and checked in at the police station up there. Two officers were assigned to stake out the Ulrich home. We interviewed Mr. Ulrich, who identified himself as Albert Barry's father-in-law. He told us his daughter had married the murder suspect eight months before, and he gave us pictures of Barry taken at the wedding. Ulrich told us that he'd catch a Santa Fe train out of Fresno the next morning. He wanted to be in Los Angeles to take his daughter home when Barry was apprehended. It was almost 2 a.m. when Ben and I left Fresno and started back for Los Angeles. We checked in at the office at 10 minutes past 8 the next morning. At 8.35, the call came through from the Pittsburgh Police Department. What did they say, Joe? It was a tool disc, all right. Jameson Larrabee Company, issued 18 months ago to one of their workers. Can I give a name? Albert Barry. 11 a.m., Monday, December the 5th. One month to the day since the 62-year-old woman had been beaten to death. The pictures of Barry and his wife, which had been taken at their wedding, were printed up in wholesale lots and distributed to all points. Mr. Ulrich, Barry's father-in-law, arrived in town and got himself a hotel room. We waited. There was no report from the stakeout at the apartment house. We checked back in at the office at five minutes to one. I'll get it. Homicide, Friday. This is Mr. Ulrich, Sergeant. I just got a call from my wife in Fresno. I thought you'd want to know. What's that? The wife got a letter from Norma. They're living in South Pasadena, an apartment. You got the address there? Yes, sir. That's what the wife called about. It's 134 Norway Terrace. When was the letter mailed, do you know? I've said it was postmarked December 3rd, day before yesterday. Get your coat on, Ulrich. We'll be right over. Ben and I picked up Mr. Ulrich at his hotel and drove to the South Pasadena address. Barry and his wife had the apartment on the top floor. Neither of them were at home. The landlord let us in with a pass key. In the bedroom, we found a small yellow radio. We checked the serial numbers. They matched. It was the same radio stolen from the Renard house. In the bedroom closet, we found two suitcases. We checked through them. Mm, nothing in this one, Joe. Oh, here we are. Look at these. What are they, Sergeant? A pair of plastic gun butts. Let's see, Joe. One of them's been chipped, see? Sergeant. Hmm? Somebody coming up the stairs. All right, let's get in the living room. Be quiet. Police, Norma. They want Albert. He killed a woman. It's all right, Norma. It'll be all right. Did you know your husband killed a woman, Miss Berry? He just told me last Saturday. We've been running away for a month now. Moving all the time. I wanted to know why. So he told me. He said I was in it as much as he was. And I'm tired of running. <laughs> Why did he kill her? Did he tell you that? He said he broke in the house. He didn't know anyone was home. The old woman was in the bedroom. She started to cry out. He had a gun. He hit her with it. Where's your husband now? I don't know. He said he'd come home for dinner. About five. I bought the groceries. What time you got, Ben? Uh, half past three. Um, that ring you're wearing, Miss Barry. Husband give you that? Yes, why? What kind of a stone is that? Topaz. Britt gave it to me. Why? Nothing. We'll wait. 
Five o'clock came and went. Barry failed to show. 5.30. Ulrich started to get nervous. Six o'clock. 6.30. No sign of Barry. I went to the window and kept an eye on the street below. At 6.45, a light green Nash sedan pulled to a stop in front of the apartment house. A man got out and went into the main floor entrance. Bert. I'll let him in. All right. How long have you had the new car? A couple of days. Bert got it. Credit. What do you want me to do now? Does he have a key to the apartment here? He lost it. Okay. When he rings, let him in. Just act natural. Ben? Yeah, yeah. You cover me. I'll get the cuffs on him. Right. Hi, Bert. Look out, Joe! All right, drop it, Barry. Okay, Ben. Yeah. He's fast with a gun. Nice looking, isn't he, Sergeant? You'd never think he'd kill anybody. Come on, let's take him in. I love him. I still love him. <laughs> but you're a cop. You wouldn't understand. That's right. I wouldn't understand. I'm a cop. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On February 16, 1947, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 82, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Earlier tonight, you heard the reports of amazing increases in Fatima smokers from New York to Los Angeles. Yes, all over the country, Fatima is doubling and redoubling its sales. And here's reason one. Fatima is the long cigarette that contains an essential ingredient of all the very popular cigarettes, Turkish tobacco. Reason two, Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Reason three, to millions of smokers, the name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Smoke Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. <laughs> Albert Ralph Berry was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. His wife, Norma Berry, was found innocent of the charge that she harbored a criminal. She was returned home with her father. Berry was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of acting chief of police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Private Hubert W. Estes of the District of Columbia Metropolitan Police Department, who on the night of May 16th, 1947, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. <laughs> Fatima Cigarettes, best of long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portion transcribed from Los Angeles. Be sure to hear songs by Morton Downey tonight on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. A vicious killer has taken the life of a 62-year-old woman. Suspicion points in only one direction. The murderer was heartless, cold-blooded. Your job, get him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. It's the long cigarette that contains an essential ingredient of all the very popular cigarettes, Turkish tobacco... That's why you see the turkey symbols on the attractive golden yellow Fatima package. That's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma...
than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima doubles and redoubles its smokers. Yes, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Saturday, November 5th. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 3.35 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Long distance. This is Friday in Homicide. I'd like to place a call to Mr. Frank Renard in Murphy, Idaho, the number 761. Frank Renard, Murphy, Idaho, 761. Yeah, that's right. The call's been cleared with the business office. All right. Uh, you want me to call you back, Sergeant? No, I'll hang on. Sergeant Friday, Los Angeles Police Department. I've got an urgent message for you. For me? Well, what's the matter? Well, your wife, Dolores, asked me to call you. Something's happened to your mother. What do you mean? What's happened? Well, I better let your wife tell you. She wants you back in Los Angeles right away. Look, what's this all about? I can't leave my job now. You better come. Your mother's been murdered. Talk to the skipper, Joe. He's on his way in. That's good. Did you call my husband? Did you? He's flying down from Idaho tonight. He'll be here in the morning. You tell him about me? The trouble I'm in? I told him his mother was murdered. That's all I told him, Mrs. Renard. What am I going to say to Frank? He always sided in with his mother. He'll never believe me. What can I tell him? Jury can give you more trouble than your husband can. What you going to tell them? Are you stupid or something? How many times do I have to say it? I didn't kill her. I didn't kill her. It's a small room, Mrs. Renard. We can hear you. Sit down, please. I won't sit down. You're not pinning this on me because I didn't do it. Anybody could have killed the old hag, but I didn't. Will you sit down, please? I don't have to take this. I'm no tramp. Keeping me in here asking me questions. I told you all I know. Look, you're in a bad spot. I hope you realize that. I didn't kill her. Ms. Renard, how long have you and your mother-in-law been living together in the house on Chavez Road? Since Frank took the job up in Idaho. About six months. He said it'd be better for me while he was away living with her. Your neighbors told us you didn't get along very well with your mother-in-law. That's right, I didn't. She hated me, I hated her. You used to fight with her, is that right? You hit her. Only a couple of times. She called me dirty names. I hit her. She pulled me by the hair. 
And I hated her like everything. And I didn't kill her. Once more, Ms. Renard, would you mind telling us how you spent your time since early this morning, where you went, what you did, everything? I told you already everything. Will you tell us again, please? I got up about quarter to nine. I had a cup of coffee and then I got dressed. The old lady was on the back porch doing the washing. What did your mother-in-law do for a living? I told you. She took in washing. After I got dressed, I left the house. About ten minutes after nine, I went downtown to the dentist. He filled a tooth for me. This one here, you can ask him. What time did you leave the dentist's office? About quarter after ten. Maybe twenty after. You can ask him. What'd you do after that? I walked around window shopping. Did you buy anything? Talk to anybody? I told you no. What time did you get home? Half past twelve. I went in the bedroom. The old lady was on the floor. Blood all over. I felt her heart. It wasn't beating. Is that when you got the blood on your dress? Yeah. Now, that's all I'm going to say. Three times I told you the same story already. And you still can't account for your time between 10 20 this morning, the time you found the body and called the police at 12 30. I told you, I left the dentist, I went window shopping, then I walked home. And during that time, you didn't talk to anyone and no one saw you. Lots of people saw me. People on the street downtown. I'm no tramp. I don't talk to everybody. None of your neighbors saw you come home, Miss Renard? Of course they didn't see me. I cut across the back lot up from San Jose Avenue. I came in the back way. The lady who lives next door to you. She says she was in the backyard about noon time. She stayed there till after one o'clock. She didn't see you come in the back way. Then she's a liar. She's a dirty liar. You and your husband took out an insurance policy on your mother-in-law last year. Is that right, Ms. Renard? Sure it is. What of it? Five thousand dollars? Yeah, so what? You know a man by the name of George Martino? No. You better tell the truth, Ms. Renard. All right, so I do. He's a friend of mine. You've been running around with him since your husband's been away. None of your business. I do what I want. Your mother-in-law found out about Martino. That's what you fought about most of the time. Oh, she was crazy. He's a friend of mine, that's all. Are you telling the truth, Ms. Renard? Martino's a boyfriend of mine. I told you, that's all. Your mother-in-law found out you were running around with him. She warned you if you didn't shake Martino, she'd write your husband. You said you'd kill her if she did. That's a lie. That's what your mother-in-law told one of the neighbor ladies. And I said it just to scare her. One night I was drinking. We had a fight. She was yapping at me all night. I said it just to scare her. But she wrote the letter anyway. And that's what she said. But I didn't kill her. You had the time, the motive, and the opportunity. It wasn't me. I didn't kill her. Interrogation room, Friday. This is Brennan, Joe. Yeah, Bill. Where are you? Santa Monica. Picked up George Martino. <laughs> Ben and I drove Mrs. Renard to Lincoln Heights Jail, fifth floor, and had her booked on suspicion of 187 PC. When we checked back in at the office, Brennan and Wiseman, the other two men on the case with Ben and I, were questioning George Martino in the interrogation room. Ben and I stood by. Martino admitted only two things. He had been running around with Mrs. Renard since her husband left town, and he had heard Mrs. Renard express a desire to do away with her mother-in-law. After the questioning of Martino, Sergeant Brennan, Ben and I met with Chief Ed Backstrand. It was 5.15 p.m. You got everything but the murder weapon, huh? That and Mrs. Renard's confession. She ought to come through, huh, Joe? I don't know. She's scared, but she's still got a smart mouth. What about Martino, Brennan? You think he had a hand in it? I don't think so. We spent most of the afternoon talking to him. He hasn't got the guts. We took a statement. And does he have an alibi? Solid. What was the cause of death? Strangulation, multiple fractures of the skull. All motives are with Mrs. Renard, Chief. Pretty clear-cut job. No evidence of robbery or burglary, I guess. A couple of the dresser drawers in the bedroom were emptied on the floor and clothes tossed all around. Pretty obvious plan to make it look like burglary. Maybe. We found three one-dollar bills in plain sight. They were on the floor near the body. If a burglar went through this stuff, he wouldn't have missed that money. And uh, it shouldn't be too much trouble tying it up. Shouldn't be, Skipper. Uh, Friday and Romero, you follow the case through. Fra oh, just a minute. Hello, Backstrand. Yeah? What? All right, I'll send him over. Lee Jones. Just finished checking the evidence at the crime lab. Yeah? He thinks Mrs. Renard's innocent. There they are, fellas. Facts don't lie. But she had every reason in the world to kill the old lady. In my book, she couldn't have killed her. All right, let's have it, Lee. How does the evidence add up? That's just it, Joe. It doesn't. Take a look. Mm -hmm. The dress Mrs. Renard was wearing when she found the body. That's it. Blood smears near the hem. Two smears, that's all. Now, if she murdered her mother-in-law, there should be more blood on this dress. It shouldn't be smeared. How do you mean? First of all, the manner in which the old lady was killed. Head was battered in. 
must have bled profusely. No question about that. All right, go ahead. Whoever murdered the old lady must have stains all over their clothes. Here's the important part. Because of the nature of the wound, it would have stained in drops, not smears. Well, how can you tell the difference? Maybe these are drop stains on her desk. They're not. I checked them with a the microscope. Only the higher ribs of the cloth are stained. The smears, nothing else. But a drop forms its own definite drop pattern and permeates the cloth, soaks in. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. No signs of that on her dress. Not a one. Now, here's the silk scarf the old lady was strangled with. Yeah. Here's what I found in the knot tied in the scarf. A blonde hair, wavy. Old lady had dark hair. So does Miss Renard. So does her boyfriend. That's what I mean. This blonde hair is one of two things that didn't belong at that murder scene. What else you got? This hair. Where is it, Lee? Small piece of plastic. A gun butt, I'd say. See here? Uh-huh. Crisscross surface, then a little smooth area here. Yeah. The killer could have hit the old lady with the butt of a gun. And a piece of the stock could have chipped off like this, huh? Miss Renard doesn't own a gun. He did her murder and all. Well, where does that leave us? I don't know, Joe. There's the stuff. You can't disregard it. Maybe you can explain it. Yeah. How? Well, first prove this dress isn't the one Mrs. Renard was wearing this morning. Then find the dress she did wear. We know she wore this when The dentist identified it, and so did two of the neighbors. That's what I mean. The dress is too clean. Doesn't belong. Yeah. And this blonde hair, this piece of gun butt, they don't belong either. Well, then you think she's innocent. You're looking at the evidence. What do you think? <laughs> 6 p.m. Saturday, November 5th. Ben and I went back to the office and met with Brennan, Wiseman, and Ed Backstrand. The open and shut case against Mrs. Renard was up in the air, but we still weren't sure that she was innocent of the murder of her mother-in-law. Ben and I drove to the Lincoln Heights jail and interviewed the suspect again. She agreed to submit to a lie detector test. We drove back to the office, contacted Sergeant Berger, the department's polygraph man, and set up a special test for the following day. The next morning, we met with Berger and formulated a list of key questions. And then we picked up Mrs. Renard and brought her to the third floor of the old city jail building, the polygraph room. At 10.33 a.m., the test got underway. As usual, Sergeant Berger conducted the interview alone. Backstrand, Ben, and I waited outside. Well, um, how about Mrs. Renard's husband? Getting down yet? He's doing around noon, Skipper. Um, got a smoke? Yeah. Here you are, Ed. Yeah, thanks. What time is it now? 11.25. Mm, here's Berger now. That's it, Ed. Now, what'd you get? I can study the chart a little more. The results are pretty well defined, though. How's it look? No reaction to the key questions. What's your opinion? I don't think she did it. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. And in leading magazines this week, you'll see this authentic story. Headline, Fatima's sensational growth sets a record for long cigarettes. Then you'll read the actual reasons smokers give for changing to Fatima. Fatima is different. It's mild and has a wonderful flavor. Fatima's best. These are the words of Miss Pamela Bookman of New York, where Fatima has increased its smokers... 132%. Fatima tastes much better than any other long cigarette. It's the best. Says Mr. James S. Winterhalter of Detroit, where Fatima smokers have increased 348%. I like the flavor, and Fatima is mild. It's the best long cigarette. That's the statement of Mrs. Mary C. Werdeman of Los Angeles, where Fatima has increased its smokers 545%. Yes, More and more long cigarette smokers every day agree. A change to Fatima is a change to the best. Enjoy Fatima yourself. Best of long cigarettes. Eight a.m. Monday, November seventh. Mrs. Renard was released from custody. We questioned her husband, Frank Renard, briefly. He could tell us nothing more than we already knew. Brennan and Wiseman were called back on the case, and together the four of us started over again from the beginning. We had a dead body, two pieces of physical evidence to work with, no idea how to fit them together, and no suspects. We went back to the Chavez Road neighborhood where the murdered woman lived and started pushing doorbells. We canvassed the neighborhood for three days, and we uncovered one slim lead. He was selling magazines, officer. Went door to door, right up the street here. Young fellow. Could you describe the man for us, please? Nothing to talk about. Pasty face, pimply complexion, blonde hair. 
5.30 p.m. Wednesday, November the 9th. Ben and I met with Brennan and Wiseman and had Backstrand's office to compare notes. Together, we had more than a dozen reports of the magazine salesman's presence in the neighborhood just prior to the murder of Mrs. Renard's mother-in-law. The various descriptions of the man which we obtained from the people in the neighborhood tallied closely. About six feet, 170 pounds, pimply complexion, blonde hair, fast talking. About 25 years old. As far as we know, Skipper, he was the only stranger in the neighborhood last Saturday morning. Only one that people remember, anyway. How close did you trace him to the Renard house? You got your list there, Brennan? Yeah. There you are. Thanks. Let's see. Well, he picked up his tracks down on Floresta Street, sold a couple of descriptions there, then he headed up Landers Avenue onto Chavez Road. Yeah. The Renards live at 2280 Chavez Road. That salesman talked to the woman at 2274 Chavez. That's three doors away from the Renards. Uh, when was he seen then? Oh, let me see. Where is that, Brennan? Oh, on the 15-7 sheet, Joe. Didn't have enough room on the report. Oh, yeah. Here it is. Mrs. John Rico, 2274 Chavez. The guy was there about 11.45 Saturday morning. Yeah, that puts him in the running. First time he ever showed in that neighborhood? First time, Skipper. Fresh kid, not a very good salesman. Here's the name of the company he's working for, the Harrison News Distributors. You check with them? Well, they're closed for the night. We'll call them the first thing tomorrow. Good. Here's something else for you. I had a call from Frank Renard this afternoon. What'd he have to say? Seems in the excitement just after the murder, Mrs. Renard overlooked a couple of things. What's that? Well, they're missing a yellow table model radio. Radio. It's in the bedroom where the old lady was killed. Yeah, well, that ties in with a robbery motive. Huh? And they're missing a ring, too. Belonged to Mrs. Renard. Topaz ring. It's supposed to be worth a little money. But she didn't notice it was gone until today. That's right. You got the serial number on the radio? Yeah, right here. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, Ben, here we are. It's an Emerson model 511-180,000, A lot of small radios in town. There's only one with that serial number on it. Track it down. <laughs> A complete description of the topaz ring and the serial numbers and description of the yellow table model radio were sent to the pawn shop detail. The information was then placed on the stolen property list and relayed to every pawn shop operator in the city. The next morning, Ben and I interviewed the manager of the Harrison News Distributing Company. There, the suspect had given his name as Sam Bricker. We checked out his home address. Turned out to be a gas station in North Hollywood. We took the suspect's job application blank with a specimen of his handwriting, and then we drove back to the office. Sam Bricker... We were unable to get a make on the name from the record bureau. We checked the cards and every known criminal who was cataloged in the oddity file as having a pimply complexion. None of them matched. That night, we got out an APB and a radiogram. The suspect's trail led from one salesman's job to the next. On his last job, he gave his name as Albert Berry. His address is 1430 Palo Alto Drive. It was in the Echo Lake District. Ben and I drove out to check it. 1428. 1430. There it is, Joe. Yeah. At least it's not a gas station, huh? Come on. Tiresome, huh? Yeah, I could stand a change. Yes, what is it? We're looking for an Albert Barry, ma'am. Does he live here? Mr. Barry, I'm sorry. He and his wife moved four days ago. We identified ourselves as police officers and had the landlady, a Mrs. Catherine Hoffman, show us the apartment which Barry and his wife had occupied. It was still vacant. In one of the closets in the apartment, we found a cheap overnight bag. The lock on it was broken and one of the seams had ripped. I forgot about that old bag and Mr. Barry told me I could throw it away. Take a look. I'm in. Yeah. How long has Barry been married? Do you know, Mrs. Hoffman? No, I don't. But the way they acted, lovey-dovey all the time, I don't think they've been together long. Hey, Joe. Hmm? Look, some kind of an identification tag. Yeah, let me see. Put it up here. It's a tool disc, it looks like. Then. Jameson Larrabee, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You're not after Mr. Barry, are you, officer? Yes, yes. ma'am, we are. Did he leave a forwarding address? I wish he did. I'm holding three letters for Mrs. Barry in my apartment right now. May we see them, please? Certainly. Would you step this way, please? My apartment's just across the hall. Yes, ma'am. Would you like a bottle of beer or something? No, ma'am, thanks. Let's see. I thought I... Yes, here they are. Three of them, Sergeant. From her folks, I think. Mrs. Barry's from Fresno. Oh, that's good. You want to copy down this return address, ma'am? Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead. Okay. That's C.K. Ulrich, U-L-R-I-C-K. Mm. 525 North Lamona. Fresno. Yeah, got it. Where you are, Miss Hoffman. By the way, did the Berry say they'd call for their mail? Mrs. Berry did. That's why I'm holding on to it. All right. Just one more question. Do you remember if Mr. and Mrs. Berry had a radio? Yes, they did. A small one. Do you remember what brand it was? No, I don't. It had a yellow case. That's all I remember. 
Before we left, we called Ed Backstrand, and he had an immediate stakeout placed at the apartment house in case the Berries returned to pick up their mail. Ben and I went back to the office and placed a call to the Pittsburgh Police Department. We gave them the description and the number of the tool disc which we'd found in Barry's old suitcase. They said they'd check with the Jameson Larrabee Company in the morning and then they'd call us back. That night, Ben and I drove to Fresno and checked in at the police station up there. Two officers were assigned to stake out the Ulrich home. We interviewed Mr. Ulrich, who identified himself as Albert Barry's father-in-law. He told us his daughter had married the murder suspect eight months before and he gave us pictures of Barry taken at the wedding. Ulrich told us that he'd catch a Santa Fe train out of Fresno the next morning. He wanted to be in Los Angeles to take his daughter home when Barry was apprehended. It was almost 2 a.m. when Ben and I left Fresno and started back for Los Angeles. We checked in at the office at 10 minutes past 8 the next morning. At 8.35, the call came through from the Pittsburgh Police Department. What did they say, Joe? It was a tool disc, all right. Jameson Larrabee Company, issued 18 months ago to one of their workers. Can I give a name? Albert Barry. <laughs> 11 a.m. Monday, December the 5th. One month to the day since the 62-year-old woman had been beaten to death. The pictures of Barry and his wife, which had been taken at their wedding, were printed up in wholesale lots and distributed to all points. Mr. Ulrich, Barry's father-in-law, arrived in town and got himself a hotel room. We waited. There was no report from the stakeout at the apartment house. We checked back in at the office at five minutes to one. I'll get it. Homicide, Friday. This is Mr. Ulrich, Sergeant. I just got a call from my wife in Fresno. I thought you'd want to know. What's that? The wife got a letter from Norma. They're living in South Pasadena, an apartment. You got the address there? Yes, sir. That's what the wife called about. It's 134 Norway Terrace. When was the letter mailed, do you know? Wife said it was postmarked December 3rd, day before yesterday. Get your coat on, Ulrich. We'll be right over. Ben and I picked up Mr. Ulrich at his hotel and drove to the South Pasadena address. Barry and his wife had the apartment on the top floor. Neither of them were at home. The landlord let us in with a pass key. In the bedroom, we found a small yellow radio. We checked the serial numbers. They matched. It was the same radio stolen from the Renard house. In the bedroom closet, we found two suitcases. We checked through them. Nothing in this one, Joe. Here we are. Look at these. What are they, Sergeant? A pair of plastic gun butts. Let's see, Joe. One of them's been chipped, see? Sergeant, hmm? somebody coming up the stairs. All right, let's get in the living room. Be quiet. Men. What are you doing here? Who are these men? Police, Norma. They want Albert. He killed a woman. I'm dead. I'm dead. <laughs> It's all right, Norma. It'll be all right. Did you know your husband killed a woman, Miss Berry? He just told me last Saturday. We've been running away for a month now. Moving all the time. I wanted to know why. So he told me. He said I was in it as much as he was. And I'm tired of running. <laughs> Why did he kill her? Did he tell you that? He said he broke in the house. He didn't know anyone was home. The old woman was in the bedroom. She started to cry out. He had a gun. He hit her with it. Where's your husband now? I don't know. He said he'd come home for dinner. About five. About the groceries. What time you got, Ben? Uh, half past three. Um, that ring you're wearing, Miss Barry. Did your husband give you that? Yes, why? What kind of a stone is that? Topaz. Britt gave it to me. Why? Nothing. We'll wait. Five o'clock came and went. Barry failed to show. 5.30. Ulrich started to get nervous. Six o'clock. 6.30. No sign of Barry. I went to the window and kept an eye on the street below. At 6.45, a light green Nash sedan pulled to a stop in front of the apartment house. A man got out and went into the main floor entrance. It's Bert. I'll let him in. All right. How long have you had the new car? A couple of days. Bert got it for credit. What do you want me to do now? Does he have a key to the apartment here? He lost it. Okay. When he rings, let him in. Just act natural. Ben? Yeah, yeah. You cover me. I'll get the cuffs on him. Right. Oh, 
time, Bert. Look out, Joe! All right, drop it, Barry. Okay, Ben. Yeah, he's fast with a gun. Nice look he is, me, Sergeant. I'd never think he'd kill anybody. Come on, let's take him in. I love him. I still love him. <laughs> but you're a cop, you wouldn't understand. That's right, I wouldn't understand. I'm a cop. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On February 16th, 1947, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 82, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Earlier tonight, you heard the reports of amazing increases in Fatima smokers from New York to Los Angeles. Yes, all over the country, Fatima is doubling and redoubling its sales. And here's reason one. Fatima is the long cigarette that contains an essential ingredient of all the very popular cigarettes, Turkish tobacco. Reason two, Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Reason three, to millions of smokers, the name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Smoke Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. <laughs> Albert Ralph Berry was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. His wife, Norma Berry, was found innocent of the charge that she harbored a criminal. She was returned home with her father. Berry was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of acting chief of police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Private Hubert W. Estes of the District of Columbia Metropolitan Police Department, who on the night of May 16, 1947, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. <laughs> Fatima Cigarettes, best of long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portion transcribed from Los Angeles. Be sure to hear songs by Morton Downey tonight on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. <laughs> You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to juvenile bureau. A rash of crimes has broken out in your city. Suspicion points to an organized gang of juveniles. Your job, stop them. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. It's the long cigarette that contains an essential ingredient of all the very popular cigarettes, Turkish tobacco. That's why you see the turkey symbols on the attractive gold and yellow Fatima package. That's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima doubles and redoubles its smokers. Yes, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Sunday, March 27th. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working a night watch out of Georgia Street Juvenile Bureau. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, Chief of Detectives. My name's Friday. 
I was on the way up from the juvenile bureau, and it was 11.25 p.m. when I got to the receiving hospital, room five, the treatment room. Everything happens on Sunday nights, huh, Joe? Yeah. How's the kid making out, Doc? The one arm is cut up badly. Nothing fatal, though. How'd it happen? That's what I'd like to find out. Can I talk to him? If you want, don't press him, though. He's had a bad shot. All right. <laughs> Officer here to talk to you, son. I can't. Tell him I can't talk, please. Just a few routine questions, son. We're going to have to answer them sooner or later. Please, can't you see what's happened already? I can't tell you anything. Jack Monroe, is that your real name? Yeah. How old are you? I'll be 16 next July. Where do you live? I can't tell you. You know that. Now, let me alone, will you? Let me alone. You've been running around with that gang of kids on Spring Street, haven't you? The big timers, isn't that what they call themselves? I don't know anything about it. Believe me, I can't talk. You tipped us off about the burglary they were going to pull tonight. Is that where they knifed you? Look, will you believe me? I can't tell you anything, not anything. <laughs> He's still shaky, Joe. All right, Doc. Well, Jack, we'll talk about it later when you feel better. You see what they've done to me already? They said next time they'd kill me. Juvenile Bureau, Friday. Yeah. Yeah, okay, friend. Goodbye. How'd you make out, Joe? Not very good, Ben. Captain Bowling, come in yet? You checked in while you were gone. Wants to see us. Okay. Did the kid tell you who knifed him? No, I scared him good. He wouldn't tell me a thing. You got a line on the boy's parents, Friday? I got a hold of his father. He's on his way in. How's the boy? Bad knife wounds. Nothing fatal. You know the boy? Not till this afternoon, Captain. He tipped us off about a burglary a gang of young kids were supposed to pull tonight. Go through? No, but two hours ago, this Monroe kid was found in a vacant lot down on Olympic, cut up pretty bad. The gang must have paid him. How long is it going to take you to break that up? Well, we're just starting to get a line on him, Bob. Must be nearly a hundred in that gang. And every one of them working hard. Take a look at the pin map over here. This spot here, look. All the jobs pulled during the last month, huh? The last five weeks up to date. Red tabs for burglary, must be more than 100. The robberies, green pens, count them, at least 50. And there's five more orange ones I added for the weekend, auto thefts. You bet those kids are working hard. we have got a lead on them. That's more than we had last week. You have to push it harder. Here's the big reason. This uh, line of pins, count them black. Purse snatching. Purse snatching and rape, 26 of them in the past five weeks. They're pretty well concentrated in one area here. That's right. Now, what's the lead you're working on? Right there on the pen map, Captain. Huh? Well, these two blocks here, Bob, where Franco Alley intersects Spring Street. Well, what about it? Well, it's the only clear area for a dozen blocks around. There's not a colored pin on it, you see? Yeah. Now, all the rest of the pins, the robberies, burglaries, attacks, they all seem to branch out from this same spot right here in definite patterns, Franco Alley and Spring Street. You figure that's the focal point for the gang? Well, it's got all the mark. For instance? Well, we've been checking that neighborhood for a week. We got it narrowed down to one place. Right on the corner of Franco and Spring. What is it? It's a soda fountain. It's pretty typical. Only it stays open all night and it gets a pretty good play from kids. A regular hangout, Captain. Pretty tough youngsters. None of them over 18. Who runs the place? Guy named Eddie Ramsey, small-time con man. Had a run-in with him when we worked bunco detail. I remember the name. Smart mouth. Tried to give us trouble when we talked to some kids in there last night. He's got a place set up for him in the back of the store, kind of a club room. It sounds like a good lead. What are you doing about it? Well, just a minute. Captain Bowling. Yeah? Who? Yeah, we'll be right down. The Monroe kid, his father's downstairs, cursing every one of us. What's his problem? Can't understand how his boy got in trouble. Come on, Ben, let's tell him. What kind of a city do we have when we can't allow our children out on the street without being stabbed or shot? What's our great police force doing when this is going on? I'd like an answer. If you got one, I demand an answer. We got an answer for you, Mr. Monroe. Will you sit down? My boy's lying in there in that hospital bed, cut to pieces. What did you do to prevent it? Tell me. You tell us, Mr. Monroe. What did you do to prevent it? I'm no cop. That's your job. I pay my taxes and I help pay your salary. We look out for your kids, but we don't raise them. What are you talking about? Just a minute, Mr. Monroe. Answer me this. How old is your son, Jack? He's 16, I think. Why? 
You know what he does with his spare time, where he spends his nights? Of course I do. He's at home. Some nights he goes to the library. Then you don't know much about your son, Mr. Monroe. For the past month, four nights out of five, he's been hanging around with a gang down on the soda fountain on Spring Street. He's down there as late as 2 a.m. He says he goes to the library. How do I know? I'm a busy man. Did you know that your son is mixed up with that gang? He's not mixed up with a gang. A bunch of small-time thieves, but they're growing. They started with purse snatching, breaking in parked cars, burglarizing candy stores. You don't know what you're talking about. Wait a minute, about. please. Then they took up robbery, stealing cars, beating up girls, women, attacking them. You're crazy. Jack's not that kind. He's part of that gang, and right now we hold all of them responsible. My boy wouldn't do anything like that. He's a member of that gang, he told us. They're the ones that knifed him tonight. That's a lie. Jack's not mixed up with anything like that. You believe anything you want, Mr. Monroe. We're going to protect your boy as much as we can, but don't expect us to raise him for you. Now, you better take a free piece of advice. You keep your advice. Jack's not in this. You can't prove he is. We're not out to prove anything right now. But you catch up with that boy of yours. Keep him off the streets before it's too late. Are you threatening me? No, sir, advising you. Next time we might meet at the morgue. <laughs> 1 a.m. Monday, March 28th. A detail of 50 officers from Juvenile Bureau and Metropolitan Division were deployed for 16 blocks along Figueroa Street. At five minutes past one, they started to move south over an appointed area. In the space of half an hour, 18 young kids... None of them over 17 years old were picked up off the streets and brought to the second floor at 1335 Georgia Street, the Juvenile Bureau. Four of the youngsters were girls. At 1.45 a.m., Ben and I checked the soda fountain on the corner of Franco Alley and Spring Street. Same bunch, Joe. Business as usual. Yeah, come on. Hey, Teddy! The folks! They're back again. Same guys. Go back and tell Eddie. Hey, look, why do you guys have to keep tracking us, huh? You think we were crooks or something. You were here the last time we checked in, Teddy. You ever go home? Sure, when I'm tired. I ain't tired. Uh, what's the matter? That's your money on the table there? Sure, it's my money. You want to borrow a buck? <laughs> $28. That's a lot of money for a boy your age. You keep pretty late hours, son. You have to go to school in the morning? Maybe. I can sit here, can't I? It's free country. I'm drinking coffee. You gonna make me on that? Hmm? <laughs> You've been drinking more than coffee. Where's your driver's license? Oh, every time the same thing. <laughs> there. March 10th, 1933, 16 years old. Hey, giving you trouble, Ted? Eddie's on his way out. What's your name? Jones. Clyde Jones. Huh, Ted? <laughs> sure. He's got money, too. Rich family. <laughs> you can save the smart talk, boys. Any of your pals in the back room? Uh, what's the trouble now, Sergeant? How many times a week do we get a check? Go ahead, Eddie. Read them off. We told you the last time, Ramsey. Clean up your place here, or we'll ride your back till you do. I told you the last time, Sergeant. There's nothing wrong with my place. It's almost 2 o'clock in the morning. You got a dozen underage kids hanging around here doing nothing. Some of them have been drinking. Schoolboys. Better to have them in here than hanging around outside in the street. I keep an eye on them. You're not the guardian, Ramsey. This time of night, they've got no business in here or on the street alone. That's your opinion, huh? That's the law, Ramsey. Now, either you shut down that back room and keep these kids out of here late at night, or we'll go after your license. You don't scare me, Sergeant. <laughs> you can't prove a thing. A couple of these kids have juvenile records. They're on probation. We can tag you for contributing. You still don't scare me. Now, why don't you leave the kids alone? That's right, Eddie. Read them off. Ben, get Benson and Bell. Right, Joe. If you won't clean up your place, Ramsey, we'll do it for you. Yeah? What are you going to do? We're pulling these boys in, all of them. Two twenty-five a.m. Monday, March twenty-eighth. The dragnet operation had netted thirty juveniles, twenty-six boys, four girls. Twenty-four of the children were between the ages of sixteen and seventeen. They were lodged in the assembly room at the Georgia Street Juvenile Bureau. The other half dozen were thirteen and fifteen-year-olds. They were taken to the juvenile hall at thirteen sixty-nine Henry Street. At two forty-three a.m., we met with Captain Bowling. All checked in. Thirty of them. All right. In the morning, we filed petitions to have every one of these cases brought to the attention of the juvenile court. Make a note of it. Okay, Bob. For the kids with records, ask for detention from the probation department. Right. We'll call their parents in the morning. Call them now. They've got some explaining to do. By 6 a.m., all but three of the children's parents had shown up. To most of them, it was nothing new. Their kids had been there before. They'd be there again. They took the lecture from the juvenile officers calmly. As long as it didn't mean trouble for them, they wouldn't worry. When they got their children home, they would reprimand them. Not for running the streets, but for being picked up by the police. Ben and I had seen the cycle of the young criminals start before, a hundred times over. It had a lot of different endings. Most of them sour. 
During the next week that followed, we booked an average of a dozen juvenile delinquents every night. The clampdown continued, so did the crime wave. Ten burglaries, four robberies, eight car thefts, six purse snatchings, three assaults on women. One week's work. Picked up a new angle on Ramsey today, Captain. He might be fencing for the game. Who gave you the tip-off? One of our informants. Ramsey's brother lives out in the valley. He's supposed to be pushing the stuff. You check him out? Yeah, I couldn't get a thing on him. Well, it might explain what attracts the kids to that soda fountain. It explains those $20 bills the kids are flashing. They steal and rob, and then they sell the loot to Ramsey for nothing. Another thing. Ramsey keeps his place open all night, and there's no reason to. He doesn't get that much trade. It's only from the young gang that hangs around there. Are you question the kids? How do they account for having all that money? Well, most of them say Ramsey lends it to them. They say they pay him back a little at a time. I think he's fencing for the kids. You tried to get his license? No luck, Captain. We can't prove a thing against him. Then we'll do it the hard way. Sweat it out. That night, we drove out to Ramsey Soda Fountain and asked him again to clean up his place, to keep the young kids out after 10 o'clock at night, to stop lending them money. He refused. There was nothing we could do. His business was a public place. He could not be held responsible for any of his patrons. In the next 10 days that followed, Ben and I haunted the sidewalk outside the soda fountain. We questioned every youngster as they entered and left. We made more than a dozen arrests. Many of the kids had been drinking heavily. We found some of them under the influence of narcotics. But Ramsey was still in the clear. The crime wave continued sporadically. Ben and I waited for our chance. It was a long time coming. Thursday, April 14th, we had dinner at Johnny Coken's place, and it was 10.35 p.m. when we checked back in at the office. Hot shot. Grab it, Joe. Yeah. A terminal on Market Street, a 459 and shooting. A terminal on Market Street, a 459. Let's go. He was approximately five feet four inches tall, 125 pounds, brown hair, brown eyes, slight build, fair complexion. He was wearing blue jeans and a corduroy jacket. We found him between a row of packing cases at the rear of the warehouse at Terminal and Market Streets. There was a single bullet hole on his forehead just above the left eye. There was a 38 revolver near his right hand. The watchman told us how it happened. She broke in the back of the warehouse, Sergeant. She wanted to shoot it out with me. Here's his ID card. Fell out of his pocket. Teddy Cameron, age 15. Dear God, a kid. I didn't know, Sergeant. He didn't either. He thought he was grown up. You are listening to Dragnet for the solution to an actual case from official police files. Now, here's the solution to many of your Christmas shopping problems. If your friends smoke a long cigarette, give the best of long cigarettes. Give Fatima and all is well. Fatima. The long cigarette that contains an essential ingredient of all the very popular cigarettes, Turkish tobacco. Give Fatima and all is well. The cigarette that has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Give Fatima and all is well. Fatima. The cigarette that has doubled and redoubled in popularity. Here are the authentic reports. New York Division. Fatima sales up 132%. Chicago Division. Fatima sales up 453%. Los Angeles Division. Fatima sales up. 545%. More and more smokers agree Fatima is the best of long cigarettes. So enjoy Fatima yourself and give Fatima for Christmas in the attractive golden yellow carton. Everyone who smokes Fatima says that this great new long cigarette is the best of all long cigarettes. Los Angeles Police Department, Form 311, dead body report. Type, gunshot. DR number, 437-695. Victim, Theodore Cameron. Residence address, 960 Charter Street. Date and time of death, Thursday, April 14th, 
10.35 p.m. Place, Terminal and Market Streets, South State Warehouse. Cause of death, gunshot. Motive or reason, attempted burglary. Time discovered, 10.40 p.m. Removed to County Morgue. Discovered by Carl Hyber, night watchman. Identified by Barbara Cameron, sister. Description of victim, male, Caucasian, age 15. Height, weight, so on and so on. Occupation, student, descent, English. And so on and so on. Witness, yeah. Signed, Joe Friday, serial number 2288, age 15. Ready, Joe? Hmm? And Cameron Boy's sister, she's waiting no. in the next room. Yeah, yeah, let's go. She taking it hard? Yeah. Morning, Miss Cameron. Good morning. We won't keep you long. Just a few routine questions. Yes, all right. Miss Cameron, how many are there in your family? There were three of us. Teddy, Mike, and me. Mother and father are dead. I work. Teddy and Mike go to school. I mean, Mike does. How old is your brother Mike, Miss Cameron? He's 14. You're the sole support of your two brothers? Yes. Do you have any idea who the boys were your brother Ted used to run around with? I don't know them by name. I remember seeing a couple of them once or twice. Mike would know, I think. He and Ted were pretty close, brothers. Do you know if Ted mixed with a gang of kids down on Spring Street? Maybe Mike would know that. Sergeant Teddy wasn't a bad boy. He wasn't a bum. None of us are. I tried to raise the boys like Mike told me. It was easy. We made out. Yes, I understand, Miss Cameron. Our salary didn't have too much, but we got by. Yeah. I figured on getting married. I'm 31. It'd be good for the boy, especially Teddy. He's dead, isn't he? Yeah. I couldn't be in two places at once. Hold a job and watch the kids. But that's why I thought maybe a husband... I'm sorry to press, Miss Cameron. Do you think your brother Mike can tell us about that Spring Street gang? Now, Mike could know. Where can we find him? Staying at a friend's house. I got the address in my bag. Here. That's 2514. I don't write numbers too well. Thank you, Miss Cameron. You've been very helpful. I'll get somebody to drive you home. Oh, do I have to go? Would it be all right if I just sit here for a while? That's all right. I'm tired. Real tired. 2514 West Serrano Street. That was the address Barbara Cameron had given us. It was the home of Mr. and Mrs. Jean Brewer, high school friends of the dead boy's sister. We talked to Mike Cameron. He told us that his brother Teddy had been running around with a gang down on Spring Street. He identified Ramsey Soda Fountain as the hangout. It was 2.25 p.m. when we got back to Georgia Street Juvenile Bureau. Hi, guy. Juvenile Bureau, Romero. Yeah, hold on, I'll call him. You, Joe. Thanks. Friday. Joe, this is Canfield in burglary. Yeah, Homer. You're working that Cameron case, aren't you? Yeah. I just got a report on one you might be interested in out of the same neighborhood. Distillery prowl. What do you got on it? Looks like a juvenile M.O. They got away with seven cases of scotch whiskey. Expensive stuff. Okay, we'll hop on it. Bubeck Warehouse, Crocker at 7th. <laughs> Miss Elizabeth Rice was the auditor in charge at the Bubeck Warehouse. We located her on the mezzanine office row. It was her job to keep a running inventory on all incoming and outgoing liquor stock. She knew her job well. As you know, Sergeant Friday, each and every bottle of distilled spirits carries a United States Internal Revenue stamp. Yes, ma'am. Each stamp carries a serial number together with the name of the firm to whom the stamps are issued. Well, Miss Rice, and the stuff is missing. The stamp on each bottle carries the case number. Is that right? That's right. Now, what did I tell you? Oh, yes, I have it right here. Seven cases of high-grade blended scotch whiskey. Now, I have a bottle identical to those in the missing cases. Yes, I see. Now, if you'll just look here. Yes, ma'am. 
The number on this stamp here, 36A227-9956, followed by the firm name. Uh, could you give us the numbers of the stolen cases? Now, I have them typed out for you right here. Seven cases, 12 bottles to the case, Canada Dry Incorporated, four of the red label and three of the black label, Johnny Walker. All right, thank you very much, Miss Wright. And you think that this might be a juvenile case, Sergeant? Yes, ma'am, we do. Seven cases, that's close to $600, isn't it? We've lost a great deal more than that, Sergeant. The insurance company makes up for the liquor loss. Yes, ma'am. Those youngsters, who makes up for them? Ben and I left the Bubeck warehouse with a list of serial numbers of the seven cases of stolen liquor. We headed back for the juvenile bureau. We figured that there was a strong possibility that the Spring Street gang was responsible for the warehouse liquor theft. How were they disposing of the stolen property? That was the key question we had to answer. Ben and I had a hunch and a tip from an informant that the young gang was operating under the guidance of a fence, a man or woman whose job it is to dispose of stolen property. The gang members were close to Ramsey at the soda fountain. Ramsey was the logical suspect. All right, now suppose they did steal the liquor. Suppose Ramsey's a fence. What's he done with the stuff? I don't think he's turned it this fast, if he's turned it at all. He wouldn't keep it at the soda fountain, no liquor license. And we've been around too much. He wouldn't keep it in his house. He lives in the rear of the fountain. That's too hot. Only leaves one other location that we know about. His brother's place in the valley. It was five minutes to ten when we turned left off Ventura Boulevard onto Sepulveda. Ramsey's brother had a small farm about a mile and a half off the highway. It was a modest white frame house planted squarely in the center of an acre of ground. An unpaved driveway led off to the left of the house to the garage. Pull up here, huh? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it looks kind of quiet, no lights. Let's go. Mud sticks to everything. Now, where's the doorbell? Oh, here it is. You got your flashlight? Yeah, what? There's a note somebody left. Oh, it's on the bum again. Here, I'll strike a match. Okay. Can you hold it a little closer? Can you read it? Yeah. Harry, wife and I have gone to the drive-in theater. Before you put the truck away, get three... Can you hold that match closer? Sam? Oh, no, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get three cases out of the garage and take them into town. Ed is waiting. Please try to make it by 11.30 tonight. Let's see, it's signed George. The address is here. And there's a the garage. Yeah, come on. Three cases. Could be eggs, Joe. If it is, we wasted a trip. Oh, I'm out of matches, Joe. All right, here, use mine. What was that? Checking. Come on. See anything? No. There goes the light. Just a minute. I'll strike another one. You can save your matches. We found it. We found five cases of scotch whiskey on the floor of the garage. We checked the serial numbers against the warehouse list. They matched. We went back to the car and called communications. We had an immediate stakeout placed on George Ramsey's place, and then we headed back to the city. It was 11.20 p.m. when we got to the address we found on the note. Oh, it's about time, Harry. Hello, Ramsey. We can do without the music. What's your problem this time? Hey, you're almost out of scotch, Ramsey. Serial numbers check out, Joe. Sorry I can't offer you a drink. We're too old to drink here, yeah, aren't we, Ramsey? Where's your phone? You want to invite somebody? You can see we're out of booze. You got a phone? In the hall. Ben, call the office. Yeah. All right, what's it all about? We've been out to your brother's place. What happened to the other two cases? You drink them here? I gave it to the kids. Are you looking at me like that for, Sergeant? Anything wrong, Eddie? Party's over, kid. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 5th, 1949, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 74, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Earlier tonight, you heard the reports of amazing increases in Fatima smokers from New York to Los Angeles. Yes, all over the country, Fatima is doubling and redoubling its sales. 
And here's reason one. Fatima is the long cigarette that contains an essential ingredient of all the very popular cigarettes, Turkish tobacco. Reason two. Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Reason three. To millions of smokers, the name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Smoke Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. Edward and George Ramsey were tried and convicted in Superior Court of receiving stolen property. After serving their terms as prescribed by law in the state penitentiary... They will be returned to the county jail where they will serve a one-year term for contributing to the delinquency of minors. You have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the Office of Acting Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Honoring the city of Greenwich, state of Connecticut, and the men who make up the Greenwich Police Department another of America's great law enforcement agencies. One of these men, Chief John M. Gleason, FBI National Police Academy graduate, who dedicates his life to making yours more secure. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. This Christmas, give the gift that makes every pipe smoker happy. A Christmas humidor of Mellow Granger. Granger is made just for pipes by the tried and true Wellman method. Rough cut to smoke mild and cool. And humidor packed to stay ever fresh. Yes, make this Christmas a Merry Christmas for all the pipe smokers on your list. Give them each a Christmas humidor of Mellow Granger. Listen to Dragnet next week and be sure to hear Morton Downey tonight on NBC. gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. $8,000 worth of Chinese jade has been stolen. The criminal is vicious. His weapon, a handful of buckshot in a handkerchief. Your job, get him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima is doubling and redoubling its smokers. So, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, December 1st. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 7.15 p.m. when we got to the police academy, the banquet room. Where do we sit, Joe? Lee Jones is holding a couple seats for us someplace. You see him? Oh, yeah, yeah. There he is up there. Look at him. Everybody's here. Yeah, ought to be. Hi, fellas. A couple of ringside seats. Thanks, Lee. Did you get it? Yeah, right here. Mind if I take a look at it? No, go ahead. How come you didn't get it wrapped as a gift? No time. A gift box would have been nice. No cotton, even? 
Beautiful watch. Radium dial? Yeah. Universal Geneva. Fine movement. He'll like it. Look on the back. Let's see. For Chief Ed Backstrand, a good cop, detective bureau. Not very good engraving. No time. I didn't think the old man really meant it. 26 years. You get tired after 26 years. You've been at it 25, Lee. Oh, don't look at me like that. I got a book to finish. 23 chapters. How many chapters you got finished? Two. How long you been writing it? Two years. Well, at that rate, we'll be stuck with you for another 21 years. If you're lucky. Excuse me, fellas. Gotta make a speech. All right, Lee. To get the proceedings underway here before we introduce the man of the hour, I'd like to pass along a little story you might get a kick out of. <laughs> I was driving down from Utah last year, stopped off at a hotel in Elko, Nevada. When I went up the register for my room, there was an Indian ahead of me. The clerk asked his Indian fellow to sign his name, and the clerk handed him a pen. The Indian made a mess on the book. The clerk looked at him for a minute and said, Say, aren't you Chief Deerskin? Haven't I seen you in the movies? The Indian nodded his head and looked a little upset. Oh, he said. Oh, he make a lot of movies in Hollywood. <laughs> the clerk smiled and said, A lot of people in Elko here like to get your autograph, Chief. And the Indian grabbed the pen up again and he said, Me no like a autograph, hunters. Me no want to be bothered. Then he drew a circle around the axe he made. The clerk said, why you do that, Chief? The Indian said, me no use the right name. Oh, <laughs> oh hey, Joe. Yeah, there's Roger there for his motion to wear. Oh, yeah, excuse me about that. Chief was retiring tonight. But he's been using his right name for 26 years, and he's proud of it. And we're proud to have been associated. You want me, Rogers? A phone for you, Joe. You can take it on the extension. Thanks, Pete. He's retiring from the Los Angeles Police Department. We're going to miss it. Gentlemen, a fine officer, Chief Ed Backstrand. Where's the phone? I'd rather be here. Thanks. Friday. Joe, this is Gonzalez. Yeah, Jeff. Sorry to bother you, but Power said I should call you. Yeah? I need some leg work. Something big? Pretty big, yeah. Too many loose ends. Penny and I can't pull them all in. When do you want us? As soon as you can get down here. That important, huh? A man may die, Joe. Hi, Jess. Got here as soon as we could. Sorry to pull you away. Hello, Romero. Gonzalez, what's up? Come on in here. All right. Here's a report. Not complete yet. Uh -huh. Chinese fellow. Name's George Kwan. He's a jeweler, gem cutter. Yeah. Jade expert. Knows as much about jade as anybody on the coast. Uh huh. Says it happened at 5.30 today on Alvarado near the park. Mm hmm. They weren't kidding, were they? They almost killed him. Yeah. Any idea what the weapon was, Jess? I'm not sure. Looks like some sort of blackjack, something homemade. Yeah. When they picked up Kwan, they found several buckshot pellets lying around and a man's handkerchief. Ray Pinker has the stuff over in the crime lab now. Where's Quan? Have you talked to him? Got in a couple of questions down at Georgia Street while the doc was giving him sedatives. Little guy's a mess, Joe. Gonna be all right? 50-50 chance when I called you out of the academy. Well, why did they beat him? Did he resist? I don't have it all yet, but from what he said, he was jumped from behind, didn't have a chance to fight. Whoever it was kept beating him long after he was unconscious. Well, what'd they take him for? A couple of pieces of jade, large ones. Very rare. Mm hmm You got anything else? Yeah, we got a star witness, just one. Did you talk to him yet? Just did, for an hour and a half. You want to crack at it? Are you having trouble with him? Yeah, a little. All right, Pena. Send him in again. Yes, sir. You want to talk some more? Six years old, Joe. His name was Norman Eugene Fisher. He was six years of age last April. Like all young boys his age, his imagination ran away with him. What would be only a minor detail to an adult witness assumed tremendous proportions in Norman's young mind. He told us his story three times. Each time he elaborated a little more until what he claimed was the truth could only have been figments of a small child's imagination. Ben and I, together with Gonzalez and Pena, talked with the boy for another hour. 
We were getting tired, but Norman enjoyed his position as star witness. Once more, Norman, please, try to remember it as it really happened. It was just like I said. Let me try, Jess. Go ahead, Romero. Um, you did see it happen this afternoon, didn't you, Norman? Yes, sir, I did. Good. Now, you were on your way home from the store. Oh, no, sir. I was running away from a man. He was chasing me. But you just told us, Norman, that you were on your way home from the store. Oh, no, sir. That was yesterday. But you told us. Listen, minute, Ben. Norman, how old are you? That's right. I'm going to be 21. No, that's not right. 21, that's older than I am. Well, when I am 21, I'm going to get a hot rod. Fastest car in the world. 10,000 miles an hour. Sure you will. But how old are you now? Six, but I'm born in... But I'm going to be 21 soon. Well, I remember when I was six years old, Norman. A lot of things I wanted. Electric train. I got one. Well, it must be something you'd like to have. One thing that maybe now that you don't have. Huh? Will you give it to me? Well, if I can. What do you want? I'd like your gun. Well, what do you want a gun for? I want to put people in jail like you guys do. Well, sometimes it takes more than a gun, Norman. What do you mean? Just because you've got a gun doesn't mean you're a cop. Well, what does? Just a minute, son. Here you go, Norman. A good cop uses this more than a gun. Gee. It's a real police badge. It's mine. Official? Official. Can I hold it? Go ahead. It's yours. When I wear this, I'm a real detective. Well, that's part of it. The other part is to tell us what you really saw today. Now, how about it, huh? There were four men, like I said, and they all had machines. No, no, wait a minute, Norman. I thought you said you were a detective now. I am. Well, a good detective has to remember exactly what he sees, not something he makes up. It's not very scary that way. No, it's no use, Joe. He can't get his story straight. Oh, yes, I can. I'm a detective now, and I know what happened. All right, Norman, you tell us, huh? I was on my way home from the stall. I saw this truck stop down the street. What did the truck look like? I don't know. It was a funny kind of truck. Had a wood back. You mean like a dump truck? Kind of, but it was a small truck. Old kind of car, like he took out the back part and put wood bars like a truck. You mean whoever owned the truck cut the back end out and made it look like a truck, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's the way it looked. Anyway, this truck stopped by this Chinese man, and the man got out, and the man started to hit this man. And the man fell on the sidewalk, and the man kept hitting him and hitting him as hard as anything. Well, what was he hitting him with? With his handkerchief. There he goes again. No, I don't know. How about that, Jess? Good tie-in. Go on, Norman. Well, that's all I saw. No, no, I mean after the man hit him, what'd he do? Oh, well, he grabbed a bunch of stuff from this man's pocket, and he went into the truck and he speeded away. Norman, you're a good detective. I want you to think real hard now. Do you know what a license number is? Yeah. Good. Do you think you could remember the numbers on that truck? If I, if I knew what they were, I could. In school, we're just having numbers. Now, I only know up to seven, but there were two sevens in it. You're getting all this, Jess? Yeah, keep them. Norman, you've helped us a lot. Can you remember what the man on the truck looked like? He had a big head and he looked mean. All right, just one more thing now. Can you remember the color of that truck? It looked black, but the back part had black and white stripes. I don't know how you did it, Joe. Well, what do you think? I'll buy it. Me too. All right, Norman. Your mother's waiting outside for you. You can go home now. You're a real detective. Can I wear my badge now? You bet you can. Okay. Say. Yes, sir? As soon as I arrest somebody, will you put him in jail? With the help of an outdated police badge, no longer official, we had the statement of a six-year-old boy with a healthy imagination. We had an idea he was telling us the truth, but we had no way of being certain. Since he was the only witness, we had to accept his word and hope that he was putting us on the right track. The quickest way to make sure was to see if some of the details on little Norman Fisher's story would check out. Jess Gonzalez and Manuel Pena took the job of trying to locate a homemade pickup truck with two sevens in the license number. They started by checking all the late 3.8 forms for vehicle theft and impound reports. The next morning, Ben and I called the general hospital and talked with Dr. Sebastian. He told us that the victim, George Kwan, had improved sufficiently to allow a brief interview. It was 10.14 a.m. when we got to Ward C, General Hospital. Doctor tells us you're a little better this morning, Mr. Kwan. Yes, sir. I shall be all right. Although it is quite painful at times. We're sorry to bother you, Mr. Kwan, but we've got to have a little more information on the robbery. 
Oh, I will tell you all I can, sir. I should like to recover the missing jade pieces. It is a great loss to me. Did you get any kind of a look at the man who hit you? Oh, he attacked me from behind, knocked me to the pavement. I made an attempt to get to my feet, but he struck me again and again, here at the base of my neck. You didn't see him at all, then? No, sir, I did not. Do you have any idea who could have done this? Unfortunately, no, I... I cannot think of anyone. Well, what was stolen from you? We know it was Jade, but can you give us a more detailed description? Well, sir, I lost two thumb rings, very rare, collector's items. Thumb rings? How much were they worth, would you say? Well, I paid 8000 for the two rings. I wonder if you could describe them to us. Well, both rings were relics of the time when the Chinese archer drew his hunting bow with a special thumb ring. Uh -huh. Any particular identifying marks on them? Oh, uh, they both have linings of fine gold to fit them to the fingers of the new owners. Who were the new owners? I had just purchased them yesterday before I was robbed. I was on my way to San Francisco to show them to prospective buyers. Who did you buy the rings from, Mr. Corn? Mrs. Inez Curtis, a very reputable dealer. We have done business for many years. I wonder if we could have her business address, huh? Oh, she has her office at her home. It is uh, uh, 1957 Harper Annex off Sunset Boulevard in Beverly Hills. Uh, how many people knew that you had the jade on you at that particular time yesterday? Oh, let me see. Um, there were only two other buyers present beside Mrs. Curtis. I do not recall their names. They were new to me. Mrs. Curtis would know. Mr. Quan, we know that you're tired. We have just one more question. Certainly. Uh, I wonder if I might trouble you to hand me that tumbler of water with a glass straw. Surely. There you are. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now, those thumb rings, Mr. Kwan, would there be any practical disposition of them other than selling them as they are? Well, hardly, Sergeant. Uh, to anyone who really knows the value of jade... It would be unheard of to change them in any way. I see. Well, thank you, Mr. Kwan. We'll do our best. You know, Sergeant, we Chinese place a great sentimental value on our jade. We'll do everything we can to recover it. Thank you. Uh, may I tell you my favorite quotation on jade? Yes, sir. It is from the writings of Tong Jung Tso. He wrote, The magic powers of heaven and earth always combine to form perfect result. So the pure essences of healing water become solidified in precious jade. Ben and I drove out to 1957 Harper Annex, the residence of Mrs. Inez Curtis. There was no one at home. We left one of our cars. It was 12.22 p.m. when we got back to Central Division. Here's a phone message for you, Joe. What's it say? Call Jess Gonzalez. He's at the Wilshire Division. Okay, thanks, Ben. Wilshire Detectives, Dillion. Hi, Harry. Gonzalez around? Just a minute. Take on three, Jess. Gonzalez. Friday, Jess. We got the truck and we got the driver. We'll be right out. Something else, Joe? Yeah. The kid was right. There were two sevens in the license number. You are listening to Dragnet for the solution to an actual case from official police files. Now, here is a real solution to many of your Christmas shopping problems. If your friends smoke a long cigarette, give the best of long cigarettes. Fatima. Give Fatima for quality. The name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Give Fatima for flavor. Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Give Fatima. They're extra mild. Yes, Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos blended to make Fatima extra mild. Yes, extra mild. So give Fatima for Christmas in the attractive golden yellow carton. It's the long cigarette that has doubled and redoubled its smokers. More and more smokers every day agree 
Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Wilbur Rasmussen, white, male American, age 31, 5 feet 10 inches, 190 pounds, black hair, brown eyes. He was the driver of the truck. Gonzalez and Pena began by checking through all of the reports of trucks impounded during the past 24 hours. There were 23. Out of those 23, they narrowed it down to four possibilities. The third vehicle that they checked fitted the young witness's description of the holdup truck. We still could not be absolutely certain that the impounded truck was the one we were looking for. The same could be said of the driver, Wilbur Rasmussen. The net result of checking impound reports doesn't always result in the apprehension of a suspect, but in this case, we were lucky. The driver had been picked up for drunk driving. It was 1.30 p.m. when we checked in at the Wilshire Division. Hi, Jim. Where is he? You're a little late. What do you mean? He's gone, released on bail. Who furnished the bail? The woman he works for, Mrs. Inez Curtis. Well, that doesn't figure, Jess, or does it? Why not? How many people knew Quan had the jade? No, that's not my guess. Quan vouches for He's been doing business with her for years. What do you think, Joe? It's your show. I'm just tagging along. Well, one thing's sure. Just a minute. Where's your detectives, Gonzalez? Uh, yeah, Pena. He did? No, meet me back here. Hmm? Friday and Romero are here. Right. The Fisher kid just identified Rasmussen's picture. The identification of Wilbur Rasmussen by six-year-old Norman Fisher was far from sufficient to take the case to court. We had to have evidence, lots of it. Rasmussen had been given a thorough shakedown, his apartment and the truck. There was no sign of the stolen jade rings. Gonzalez told us that the truck had come from the U-Drive truck rental on Figueroa Street. We checked with Mr. Crockett at U-Drive. Uh, let me have another look at that picture, boys. Yeah, here you are. Uh, what did you say his name was? Rasmussen. Wilbur Rasmussen. You want to know if he rented a truck from Miss Wayne? Yesterday, maybe the day before. No, not this fellow. Never seen him. Before we left U-Drive, we checked over the rental contract on the truck in question. The deposit check for the truck was signed by Mrs. Inez Curtis. The truck was checked out at 6 a.m. The rental contract, the actual release form showing to whom the vehicle had been rented, was signed by a Harry Wilson. Rasmussen's name did not appear on any of the usual rental forms. The manager of U-Drive was positive that he had not rented a truck to Rasmussen. We drove out to 1957 Harper Annex. This time we found Mrs. Inez Curtis at home. I'm terribly sorry about Mr. Kwan. Does he have everything he needs in the hospital? Yes, ma'am. How long did you say this Harry Wilson had been working for you? Oh, six or eight weeks. But I'm sure you're wrong about him. We're not accusing him of anything, Miss Curtis. We just won't talk to him. He certainly came to me well recommended. He was a nice man. When was the last time you saw him? Day before yesterday. He asked for his check, said he was quitting. I told him I was sorry to see him go. I'm anxious to get that guest house finished. How about Rasmussen, Miss Curtis? How long has he been with you? Well, Wilbur's been with me for about seven months. Good worker, but he drinks too much. I feel sorry for him. You've rented trucks from the new drive company right along? Oh, yes, from Mr. Crockett. We had to have a truck to haul our building supplies. I'm saving an awful lot of money contracting this myself. It's a great saving. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the deposit on his last rental, did you give that check to Wilson or to Rasmussen? I sent both of them down to pick it up. Like I say, Wilby's been drinking rather heavily lately, and I think Harry's the better driver of the two. Do you know which one of those men was driving the truck about 5.30 in the afternoon, day before yesterday? Well, how would I know that, Sergeant? All I know is that I sent both of them down... I told Harry to drive. Yeah, I see. Miss Curtis, were either of those men present the day you sold the jade rings to Mr. Kwan? No. They have nothing to do with my gym business, whatever. Did either of these men know about Mr. Kwan's purchase? Well, that's possible. They knew he was here. I'm sure they saw him come in. It's entirely possible that they might have overheard something. When did Mr. Kwan leave your house? About five o'clock. What time did the two men go after the truck? Oh, they picked that up early in the morning. Mr. Crockett down at U-Drive says that only Harry Wilson checked out the truck. Says he's never seen Rasmussen before. That's entirely possible. Like I say, they might well have made other arrangements. Were there any other people present when Mr. Kwan bought that jade? Yes, there were. Two other buyers. They were bidding for the thumb rings, too. Mr. Kwan had the high bid, so I sold them to him. What if we could have their names? Certainly, I'll write them down for you. 
Miss Curtis, do you have any idea where we might locate Harry Wilson? Well, he told me he was going to Mexico. Said he had friends down there. Well, thank you, Miss Curtis. You've been very helpful. Are you sure there isn't anything Mr. Kwan needs? Yes, ma'am. Two jade rings. <laughs> Mrs. Inez Curtis gave us a detailed description of Harry Wilson. She also gave us the names and addresses of the two other buyers who were present when Mr. George Kwan made his purchase. We checked them out and found them to be equally as reputable as Mrs. Curtis. They could tell us nothing of the robbery. We went back to the office and got out an APB and a radiogram on Harry Wilson from the description given us by Mrs. Curtis. Stakeouts were maintained at Wilbur Rasmussen's apartment and at the home of Mrs. Inez Curtis. It was 4.30 p.m. when we got to the second floor of the old city jail building, the crime lab. Lee Jones had the evidence laid out for us. Anything about the handkerchief, boys? What's that, Lee? The bloodstains. Old ones along with the new ones. How does that figure? We know how the new ones were made when the handkerchief was filled with buckshot and used on Quan. The old ones, hard to tell. How old would you say they were? Well, the handkerchief has been through the laundry a few times. Stains didn't come out. Laundry marks right here. I don't see them. Man used peerless laundry. Infrared marking system. Let me show you. Infrared lamp, Lee? Yeah. There's your marking. Can you trace it down? Who's it belong to? Man used the name of Harry Wilson. <laughs> There was nothing to do now but wait for some word on Harry Wilson. The stakeouts continued. We requestioned Wilbur Rasmussen, and we talked again with Mrs. Curtis and George Kwan. It was Tuesday, December the 8th. We checked in for work at 8 a.m. Morning, Jess. Hi, Joe. Where's Ben? Communications, getting a mail. Any word on the new chief of detectives? No, nothing. What's your guess? Oh, I think Thad Brown. A good man. Maybe. Sloan's a good man, too. When you come in here? Not yet. Why? Maybe he'd like to take a little airplane trip. What do you got? Cheyenne, Wyoming. They picked up Harry Wilson. Two days later, Thursday, December the 10th, Harry Wilson was returned to the Los Angeles County Jail and booked on suspicion of robbery. We checked with Lieutenant Frank Cunningham in the record bureau. From Wilson's fingerprints, he ran a make on him. Harry Wilson was an alias. We found out that he had lengthy records of arrests and jail terms for robbery, burglary, and grand larceny. Mr. Crockett at U-Drive identified Wilson's picture. He was a two-time loser. It's up to you, Wilson. It can go hard for you or easy. I'm in a spot, huh? You're in a spot. Lay it out for him, Jess. It's all stacked against you, Wilson. We know you rented the truck. You knew Quan was at Mrs. Curtis' house. Your handkerchief was found at the scene of the crime. You wouldn't believe me if I said I didn't do it? With that kind of evidence, how can we? I didn't. I don't know if I can prove it, but I didn't. If you didn't, we'll help you prove it. First, you gotta believe me. You know why. Yeah. I've had it twice. Once more, and I'm in for life. All right, you got it figured. Now what do you got to say? Rasmussen did it. He knocked Quan over. Where were you? Buying my ticket for Cheyenne. I didn't want any part of it. How do you account for that handkerchief? It was mine, but Rasmussen had it. He got his finger one day in the job. I loaned it to him. Well, that checks. Old blood stains, new one. All right, let's pick up Rasmussen. Oh, you're at it. Pick up the Curtis stain. She planned it. <laughs> Wilbur Rasmussen was picked up and brought in. After intense cross-questioning, we confronted him with Harry Wilson's statement. In the face of this testimony, he broke completely. He gave us a full confession implicating Mrs. Inez Curtis. He admitted beating George Kwan and taking the jade thumb rings. He said he received $200 from Mrs. Curtis for the job. He requested that he be allowed to turn state's evidence. Mrs. Inez Curtis was brought to the interrogation room. Of course, you gentlemen have proof to substantiate all these accusations. Yes, ma'am, we have. It better be good. I have a fine lawyer. We've got signed and recorded confessions of Wilson and Rasmussen, the two men who worked for you. Here we play the recordings for you? That won't be necessary. Miss Curtis, you got $8,000 for those rings. Wasn't that enough? Not when I could make 16, no. Where are the rings now? I'm not going to get life for this, you know. No. Jade doesn't spoil. It'll still be good when I get out. Yeah, but you'll be too old to appreciate it, Miss Curtis. Okay, Penny. Ah, that was a funny one. Sure was. How about it? Did you figure it this way, Joe? You don't expect me to answer that, do you? The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 2nd, 1949, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 82, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial.
Now, here are authentic reports from all over the country that tell the story of Fatima's sensational increase in popularity. New York Division. Fatima sales up 132%. Chicago Division. Fatima sales up 453%. Los Angeles Division. Fatima sales up 545%. Yes, more and more smokers agree Fatima is the best of long cigarettes. So enjoy Fatima yourself. And give extra mild Fatimas for Christmas in the attractive golden yellow carton. Everyone who smokes Fatima says that this great new long cigarette is the best of all long cigarettes. Mrs. Inez Curtis was tried and convicted of robbery and conspiracy. She received the maximum sentence as prescribed by law. In consideration for turning state's evidence, Wilbur Rasmussen received a minimum term. You have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Acting Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Dragnet honors the city of Knoxville, state of Tennessee, and the men who make up the Knoxville Police Department, another of America's great law enforcement agencies. One of these men, Sergeant Joe H. Roberts, director of the Knoxville City School Safety Patrols, who dedicates his life to making yours more secure. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portion transcribed from Los Angeles. Let that merry tune remind you to get him the big Christmas humidor of smooth, sure-fresh, velvet pipe and cigarette tobacco. It's a double pleasure to any smoker when you give this generous humidor of velvet. It smokes cool and sweet in both pipe and cigarette. In every way, the gift for him is a Christmas humidor of velvet, America's smoothest smoke. Be sure to listen to Dragnet next week. You're tuned for the stars on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you're about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed. To protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. A young woman has been murdered. The body was discovered behind locked doors. The assassin is still at large. Your job, find him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima is doubling and redoubling its smokers. So, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment... Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, January 9th. It was stormy in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Ben Romero. My name's Friday. I was on the way to work, and it was 6.45 a.m. when I got to the steps of the city hall, the main street entrance. Hey, Joe, wait up. Morning, Ben. When did they call you? 5 a.m. Donahoe called you. Yeah. Miserable out, isn't it? It's pretty wet. My feet are soaking wet. See the clamps for earlier? Yeah. New chief of detective? Mm-hmm. Wait a minute, I want to get some gum. Pack of spearmint. 
Yeah. You know, I heard about the new chief. Thad Brown. Good man. Please come. Mm, thanks. Um, I wish I'd make up the minds about our ship. Work days, they call you back night. Work nights, they call you back days. Once you put in for a desk job. You may never have to call you back. You're here all the time. No, you're just hard to please. Here we are. Thanks, Egan. Gentlemen, good night. Is this a great way to start off as your new chief? Call you back on a rotten morning like this? I'm glad you got the job, Thad. Yeah, congratulations, Chief. It's hard to follow a man like Ed Backstrand. Gonna need your help. You got it. Here's why I called you back. Laura Barclay, mm-hmm. the dead body report, nightclub entertainer. Landlady yeah. found the body an hour ago. Who's covering? Burton and Anderson, they're out there now. Strangled, huh? Well, the lamp cord's still trying to figure out how the guy got in the house. Doors and windows all locked. Yeah. The tech. Is that the motive? For now, yeah. I just came from there. I think there's more. Any reason? Her room wasn't prowled. Yeah? Just a hunch. Play it for me. Ben and I left Thad Brown's office, picked up Lieutenant Lee Jones at the crime lab, and drove to the West Adams District, number 16 Imperial Place, where the body of Laura Barkley had been found. It was an ornate frame structure done in Victorian style, at least 30 to 40 years old. Number 16 was on the ground floor. We went in. A narrow hallway led to the bedroom in the rear of the house. Two gas jet fixtures, which had been converted to electricity, were the only illumination. Uh, this place has seen better days. Anybody else coming out, Lee? I see flash bulbs down there. They must be here already. Lieutenant, Friday, down this way. Hi, Burton. Hi. Photographer's covering the body position. Peterson's dusting for prints. Fred, shoot a couple of overheads. Don't make them all angle shots. Get up high, then move in close. Yeah, Chief was right. Room's in pretty good order. Did you talk to anybody, Burton? Landlady lives upstairs. Only two people living in the building. Mm-hmm. Did she tell you anything? Said the Barkley girl paid her rent on time. Good tenant. Plays the organ at the Blue Fox. Cocktail line. Hmm. Any idea how the murderer got in here? Not yet. Every door and window in the place is locked. Anything else? That's it so far. We'll give you 15.7 on what we got. Okay, yeah. Lord. You and Anderson have another detail? Yeah, I'm working on that Westwood thing. Two uniform men outside if you want anything. Right, thanks. Looks like a tough one, Joe. Whoever did it must have come in through the keyhole. I'll see you later. So long, Lord. Andy. Peterson is dusting for prints. Nothing yet. Only piece of physical evidence so far, the lamp cord she was strangled with. I'll run it through downtown. Not a sign of a struggle. Maybe she wanted to die. Check the bathroom, will you, Ben? Yeah. I'll look around the kitchen. Hey, Pete, have you dusted the lamps? Yeah. Not there. Not this one. Ben, come here a minute, will you? Ben. Yeah? Come in the kitchen, will you? Got a pencil? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, here you are. Okay. Take a look at this garbage chute here. Mm, let me see. Hmm. About eight feet to the ground. Yeah, big enough for a man to get through. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no problem. Lee. I'll be right there. That could be the answer, Joe. Well, he either got in this way or he was in the house when she came home. Well, what do you got? Garbage chute here. What do you think? Could be... Let me grab a kit. Let's see. Aluminum powder. There it is. No. No, nothing on the outside of the lid. Looked pretty clean. Must have just been scrubbed. Abrasions here. Got a pencil? Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Hold it up there, will you? Yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah, there we go. Large prints. Unusually large. Big hands. Can I look inside the chute a minute, Lee? Go ahead. Watch that lid. Yeah, I will. Uh, looks like it's blocked off upstairs. This thing hasn't been used for garbage for some time. Most of them were condemned a few years back. I'll get Fred to shoot these. Let's go in the living room. 
That desk been dusted, Lee? Yeah, it's clean. Go ahead. Take a look, Joe. Yeah. Photographs. Hmm. Hundreds of them. All men. Yeah, all different. Lee Jones and the crime lab crew finished up and went back to Central Division. Two uniformed officers remained on duty at the scene of the crime. Thad Brown had men sent out to canvas the neighborhood. Ben and I went upstairs and talked with the landlady, a Mrs. Emma Smith. Yes? Police officers. You, Miss Smith? Yes. You're not the same officers I've talked with before. No, ma'am. I wonder if we could ask you a few questions. I told the other officers everything I knew. We have to double-check, Miss Smith. Who was the girl who lived in the apartment below, number 16? Laura Barclay. Is that the name she used? The mail she received? Was it addressed that way? Yes, it was. Oh, she was a very good tenant, Laura. No trouble with her at all. When did she move here? Oh, about four or five years ago. I have the rent receipts. I always save receipts. Did she always live by herself? Oh, yes. That apartment rents to one person only. Did she have many visitors, friends dropping in? None that I ever saw. Pretty much to herself, Laura. The men came yesterday and took away. What's that, ma'am? The organ. Electric one. Laura rented it from a big downtown firm. Used to practice all the time. My, it was beautiful. Yeah. In the gloaming. She used to play that for me. Mrs. Smith, when did the men come and take the organ away? Yesterday, in the afternoon, about 4.30. Was Miss Barclay at home when they came? No, she wasn't. She left me a note to let them in, so I let them in. I never allow anyone in the apartment without a note. You know the name of the company where she rented the organ? Brazier's, it was called, down on South Spring. Well, didn't you think it was unusual that Miss Barclay didn't have any friends? Now, officer, I didn't say Laura didn't have any friends. What I said was that she didn't have any friends who came to see her here. She moved here from a hotel for women. That's the reference she gave me. I see. I wonder if you could give us the address of that hotel, please. I'll write it down for you. Thank you. Uh, Miss Smith, did you hear any unusual sounds in Miss Barclay's flat last night? Anything out of the ordinary? If I had, I would have called the police and we'd have saved a girl's life. Well, thank you very much, Miss Smith. Here's a call. If there's anything you think of after it's gone, don't hesitate to call us. Thank you, I will. I hope you get the dirty men who killed Laura. We didn't say it was men, Miss Smith. Well, isn't it always a man? Before we left Mrs. Emma Smith, we asked her about the garbage chute. She said it had not been in use for the last four years. We showed her the stack of photos. She could identify none of them. We drove back to Central Division. We checked Brazier's music store. The two men who moved the organ were checked out and cleared. We went to the Wynn Hotel for young ladies. They could tell us nothing. Laura Barclay's references were all good. We went back to the office and met with Chief of Detectives Thad Brown. You think he got in through the garbage chute? That's where it looks, Chief. Went all over the apartment. If there's another way, we haven't found it. All right, you know how he got in. Who is he? We got out an APB on his M.O., latent fingerprints, and making a run on those prints we found. You got an idea about these pictures here. Most of them theatrical still, show people. Hmm. Frank Latour and his canine circus. To Laura, all my love, Frank. Tell you what you do. Here's a guy I checked with this morning. Bernard Caribbean, theatrical booking agent, huh? Yeah, Barney's office is down in the Orpheum building, Hayton Hill. He booked her into the Blue Fox. See what he can tell you. All right. I'll grab the picture, Ben, huh? Oh, yeah. Well, you got more than you started with. Yeah, those fingerprints. We get a make on them, we'll be close to the guy. So was the Barclay girl. But he got away. I wonder if we could see Mr. Carubian. Who's calling, please? Sergeant Romero and Sergeant Friday, police officers. One moment, please. Yeah, please. Two police officers to see you, Mr. Carubian. Sergeant Friday and Sergeant Romero, is that right? Yes, ma'am. Send them in. Go right in. Thank you. All right, let's go. When them rosy roses bust through the snow, I'll be coming home on the road again. When them General Sherman tanks 
are covered with ice. I'll be home for good. And won't that be nuts? Oh, no, this guy stuck his corn. Oh, sit down, fellas. Thank you. Can I help you? I understand that you booked Laura Barkley. Yeah, that's right. I spoke with a... Got his name right here. Chief Fad Brown? Oh, that's right. He asked me about Laura. Too bad about that. Any clues? We're working on it, Mr. Caribbean. What makes a person pull a stunt like that? Laura didn't have no enemies. She had one. Well, I don't know much about her, except I've been booking her for about four years. Good organist. Pretty fair voice, too. Got some pictures here. I wonder if you'd take a look at them. Yeah, sure. Quite a stack. Yeah, old Frankie Latour and the dogs. Great act. I book them. Ricky Rogan, King of the Tap. Gus Sorinoco and that singing seal of his. Yeah, yeah, I know all these people. I book them all. Did Laura Barkley work with all these people? One time or another, yeah. During the war, USO camp shows, you know. Do you know whether she was close to any of them? Well, come to think of it, she was. That Frankie Latour, crazy about them dogs of his. No, I mean the men themselves. Anybody that she seemed particularly interested in? Never heard her mention anybody. Pretty girl. Did you know her very well, Mr. Groovy? Only when she came in and out of town on an engagement. I'm a married man. Well, then you don't think there's anything to these pictures here of hers, huh? Well, I wouldn't say so. When you're on the road, you always collect photos of the people you work with. Souvenirs. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Caribbean. Here's our card. You betcha. Yeah, I sure hope you catch the guy. wonder why you picked on Laura. Sometimes they don't have a reason. When we left Bernard Caribbean's office, we checked by the Blue Fox cocktail lounge. It was still early. The sign said open 5 p.m. It was 3.15. We went to the morgue in the basement of the Hall of Justice and looked at the coroner's report. The autopsy report stated that the cause of death for Laura Barclay was strangulation. We went to the second floor of the old city jail building, the crime lab. Nothing on the lamp cord. Standard URL 110 line. Bite anywhere. No prints. How about the chute, Lee? Went back there and rechecked. You were right. The guy got in through the garbage chute. Found more of the same prints along with some cloth impressions in the dust. Tell you anything? The guy was wearing some kind of tweed, Donegal, 15 to the inch. How about the size of a man, Lee? How big could he be to clear that chute? It had a 20-inch diameter. Almost any man could squeeze through that. Check the ground level of the chute. Cement, no footprints. Mm. You don't have too much for it. I got one thing for you. What's that? I think I found your motive. And not the one listed on the report. Yeah? Here are the blow-ups of the body. This 36 by 54 here. Hold that in, will you, Ben? No, I haven't. Look through this magnifying glass here. The right hand. Yeah. See where I'm pointing? Uh, ring finger, yeah. Look like ring marks. That's right. Pretty wide. Must have been good side rings. Well, I might still be in that room. I called Thad Brown. He had the room rechecked. No sign. And you think we got a burglary motive on our hands? That's my guess. Thad had the boys check with the landlady. She didn't know anything about any rings the Barclay girl might have had. That doesn't help. I think I got something else here. Oh, library book. Huh? Her card's in one of the pockets inside, checked out from the L.A. Public Library main branch. Mm-hmm. I think these might be a lead on the missing rings. A librarian sees a person's hands every time they check out a book. That makes sense, Lee. We'll play it that way. What department were the books checked out of? The music room. Well, that's it. I think you've got your motive now and a good set of prints. You're close. Thanks a lot, Lee. Well, let's go to the library, Ben. I'll get it. Crime lab. No, this is Friday. Oh. Thanks, Frank. Well, all we got's a motive. How do you mean? No make on those fingerprints. Nothing. You are listening to Dragnet for the solution to an actual case from official police files. Now, here is a real solution to many of your Christmas shopping problems. If your friends smoke a long cigarette... Give the best of all long cigarettes, Fatima. Give Fatima for quality. The name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Give Fatima for flavor. Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Give Fatima. They're extra mild. Yes, Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. Yes, extra mild. So give Fatima for Christmas. 
in the attractive golden yellow carton. It's the long cigarette that has doubled and redoubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day agree Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Four thirty p.m. Tuesday, January 9th. Heavy rain. Laura Barclay's murderer was still a free man. Ben and I were sure that whoever left their fingerprints on the inside of that garbage chute was the same man who murdered the Barclay girl. He had no previous record. His first crime, as far as we knew, was a killing, and the odds were all in his favor. The fingerprints gave us nothing. All we had left to lead us to the killer were three library books and a stack of old theatrical photos. The solution of most crimes for the working detective is method and persistence. When you have clues, you work with them. When you don't, you work your way to a logical conclusion as best you can. We went to the Los Angeles Public Library, the main branch. The librarians in the music room handle thousands of readers every week. None of them remembered Laura Barclay. We drove over to the Blue Fox Cocktail Lounge. We interviewed the manager, and he knew nothing of her personal life. We talked to Harry Schumann, the organist who had taken Laura Barclay's place. What would you like to hear, fellas? Police officers. I'd like to talk to you, man. About Laura, huh? Yeah, that's right. All right, if I keep on playing, the manager wants full 15-minute sets. Yeah, go ahead. That's all right. What can I tell you? How long have you known Miss Barclay? Oh, four or five years. It's a terrible thing. You got to get to whoever did it. Yeah, we're going to try. Can you think of anybody that might have killed her? I know you ask that question of everybody. I don't know. Does anybody ever know for sure? Sometimes. Well, I don't know. When you think of a person, you never think who might murder him. Maybe you might know a few things about her that you could fill us in on. I'll try. She go in for jewelry much? Rings, things like that? Funny you should ask that. She was nuts for it. Good things. Rings? Had a couple of beauties. Diamonds they were, big stones. Cost 4000 I know she used to put most of her money into those rings. She buy them on time? Yeah. I remember one night she was overjoyed. The night she paid them off. Cost a lot of dough. Can you describe those rings for us? Not too good. I can give you the name of the jeweler she bought them from. That'll do. Do you know anybody else that we might talk to? I don't know any of her friends. She was an only child. No living relatives that I know of. How about her landlady? Yeah. I guess that's it, Harry. Thank you. For what? I wish I could help more. If everybody had your attitude, we'd be out of a job. Before we left the Blue Fox, Harry Schumann gave us the address of Laura Barclay's jeweler. The next morning, we checked with the manager of the store, and he gave us a complete description of the two diamond rings which the dead girl had purchased. They were valued at $4,000. He gave us detailed drawings of the rings. We went back to the office, gave the information to burglary detail. An all-points bulletin was put out describing them. Pawn shops throughout the city and state were alerted to watch for the stolen rings. We had lunch with Chief Thad Brown at Costa's Cafe. Never mind, O'Mara. I'll get it. Oh, thank you, Chief. I'll get the tip. The stew was good. Mm-hmm. Did I have some change for the cigarette machine? Thanks. Need any cigarettes, Joe? No, no thanks, thanks. Let's go. What do you think, Sam? The description of the rings and the M.O. should help. If you haven't turned up, good chance he's holding on to them. Could be his first job, probably scared. Anybody check back over the neighborhood there? This is the afternoon and this morning. A lot of door-to-door salesmen through that district. All been checked out. It's a dead end. Now where? Only those prints are checked out. Well, they didn't. Got a kickback from Brerich in Sacramento on his M.O. No make. We'll have to get him with what we've got. Here's the car. Sure you picked up all the loose ends? Oh, we've been back over the course three times. Go over it again. Keep going over it until something breaks. For the next ten days, we retraced our steps from the room where the crime was committed throughout the neighborhood to the place where she worked, back to the same dead end. Ben and I checked and double-checked each other to make certain that neither of us had overlooked even the smallest detail of the investigation. We got no place. It was 8 a.m., January 19th. Homicide, Friday. This is Rubles in burglary, Joe. Yeah, Dick. Got something for you. Job pulled last night. 
couple of watches, a strand of pearls. How do we figure in it? His M.O. Yeah? Guy got in through the garbage chute. Besides fingerprints and photographs, one other mark by which the unknown criminal is identified is by his method of operation, his M.O. Once a thief finds a successful means of operation, he seldom changes it. In our search for Laura Barkley's murderer, we had checked our files and found no criminals at large whose practice it was to gain entrance through a garbage chute. It was reasonably safe to assume that this was the same man. It was 2 p.m. January 23rd. I was on my way back from the record bureau. Just had a call, Joe. Elmer Radcliffe. Informant? Yeah. It says two days ago he heard about some guy who was making the rounds trying to peddle a couple of diamond rings. Same ones? He's not sure. Doesn't know what the guy looked like. Any idea where the guy is now? Hasn't been around since. Told Elmer to keep his eyes open. That's good. Come in here, you two. What do you got, Thad? This report just came down from burglary. Pawn shop down in North Main took in a watch and a strand of pearls last night. Yeah? Same stuff that Rubles called you about. Yeah, I remember. Where's it tying? Same guy tried to peddle a couple of diamond rings. 10 a.m., January 25th. Thad Brown arranged to have all pawn shop detail calls concerning the suspect put through to us on extension 2521, homicide. Five days passed. No further word. Homicide, Friday. This is George Rose. I run the Harbor Pawn Shop, second in Maine. Yeah, what's the matter? Man in here, trying to turn those diamond rings. The ones on the stolen property list. I can't talk now. Stolen, we'll be right down. Come on, Ben, move it. Yeah? The next corner. There it is. Just up the block. Pull up. All right, let's go. Hell. Here we are. Say, fella, look out, Joe. He's got a gun. You all right, Joe? Yeah. Out the back way. Let's get him. There he goes, up alley. Can you hit him? Didn't stop him. Watch it. Come on, Joe. He's turning on the spring. He ran into that cafeteria up the street. Come on, let's run. Where'd he go? See him? Yeah, there he goes. He's headed for the kitchen. Come on. Stop that man. Stop him. Out the back door into the alley. There he goes. Duck Ben. All right, Joe, stop. He's not stopping. Stay clear. He's down. All right, come on. All right, get his guns. Yeah. He got him in the leg, Joe. Hit his head when he fell. All right, snap him on. Huh. Look on the little finger of his right hand. Two diamond rings. Yeah. Doesn't make sense, does it? What's that? Four thousand dollars worth of diamonds, and he's lying on a pile of garbage. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On April 2nd, 1947, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 81, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here are authentic reports from all over the country that tell the story of Fatima's sensational increase in popularity. New Orleans Division. Fatima sales up 300%. Detroit Division. Fatima sales up 348%. Los Angeles Division. Fatima sales up 545%. More and more smokers agree Fatima is the best of long cigarettes. So enjoy Fatima yourself. And give extra mild Fatimas for Christmas in the attractive golden yellow carton. Everyone who smokes Fatima says that this great new long cigarette is the best of all long cigarettes. Lola Barclay's murderer was identified as Martin Eric Swanson. He was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. His case was fought through the Supreme Court of California and in the United States Supreme Court. In both instances, his conviction was upheld. Last Friday morning, after a delay of five years, Martin Eric Swanson was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. 
You have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Acting Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Dragnet honors the city of Youngstown, state of Ohio, and the men who make up the Youngstown Police Department, another of America's great law enforcement agencies. One of these men, Chief of Police Edward J. Allen, honored as Policeman of the Year, who dedicates his life so that yours might be more secure. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. This Christmas, give the gift that makes every pipe smoker happy. A Christmas humidor of Mellow Granger. Granger is made just for pipes by the tried and true Wellman method. Rough cut to smoke mild and cool, and humidor packed to stay ever fresh. Yes, make this Christmas a Merry Christmas for all the pipe smokers on your list. Give them each a Christmas humidor of Mellow Granger. Listen to Dragnet next week, and be sure to hear Morton Downey tonight on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. A small boy is reported missing from his home. His age, nine years. Foul play is suspected. Your job, find him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima is doubling and redoubling its smokers. So, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnets, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, December 22nd. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way into work, and it was 3.55 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Hi, Joe. Ben, what you doing? Oh, pretty quiet. How's your mother? Oh, that cold still hanging on. Bad cough. Doc says it's nothing serious. My kid's got the same thing. Must be some kind of a virus going around. Yeah. Is that a new suit you got on? Oh, yeah. Ma figured I needed one. Let me see. Oh, yeah, that's a nice shade of blue. Where'd you get it? Quincy's down in South Fig. Look okay? Turn around. Right. Oh, yeah, that's a good fit. Uh, did you get all the reports on the Webster case yet? Yeah, all taken care of. Let me get it. Homicide, Friday. Well, this is Levinson, Unit 113J. Got something for you. Yeah, Harry, what's doing? Doherty and I are out here on Collis Avenue, 4656. Trying to track down a nine-year-old boy. What's the story? The kid's missing. Suspicion of foul play. How long has he been gone? About two hours. Looks like a job for homicide. How do you figure? The kid was last seen playing in the backyard of his home. Yeah? We checked over the yard. Find anything? Blood stains, lots of them. They look new. Ben and I left a message for Chief of Detectives Thad Brown. Then we went over to the crime lab, picked up Lieutenant Lee Jones, and drove out the Arroyo Seco Freeway to Collis Avenue. It was an average neighborhood. Number 4656 was a one-story green stucco residence situated on the corner of Collis Avenue and Harrison Drive. Beyond the backyard was a tract of undeveloped land covered with scrub oak. Harry Levinson from Highland Park Juvenile was waiting for us in front of the house. Back this way, fellas. I'm coming, Lee. Wait till I get my back. Okay. 
Who notified you that the boy was missing, Harry? The mother. Said she went out to do some Christmas shopping about 11 this morning, left the boy home. She came back about 2 this afternoon, he was gone. What's the name? Johnstone. Kid's name is Stanley, nine years old. Mm -hmm. Was this gate open like this when you got here? Oh, yeah, I haven't touched a thing. Uh, here are the stains over here, Lieutenant Jones, uh, along the edge of the walk, see? Yeah. Let me see. Mm. Quite a few stains, huh? Looks like it might be blood. I'll try some benzidine on these spots here. Yeah, there we are. See what happens? Where's the kid's mother now, Harry? In the house. Doherty's talking to her. Did you talk to any of the neighbors? People next door. Uh, one's on this side. They couldn't tell us anything. There it is, fellas. Yelly. These spots are covered with benzidine. They're trending blue. Blood stains, all right. Can't say definitely whether it's human or animal blood. Mm -hmm. You have to go back to the lab to run it through. Yeah, biological precipitant test. Hand me one of those glass vials from my bag, will you? Yeah. Okay, here you are. Hey, thanks. Scrape some of these flakes off for a test. There we are. How soon can you tap the blood for us, Lee? Precipitant test won't run more than 20 minutes. It'll take three or four hours to run a blood grouping, though. That's it. Anything else you want to check? Levinson, anything else? Oh, uh, right here, my handkerchief. Empty shell. That marker over there by the rose bush, that's where I found it. Mm, from a 22, huh? Yeah, might tie in, might not. Mark it and dump it in this envelope, will you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, shell. There you go. Did you get out a missing broadcast in the boy here? A uh, darty did about a half hour ago. Oh, here's a description here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mother know about the blood stain? No, we didn't tell her. She's worried enough already. And she has no idea what might have happened to her boy. No more than we do. She checked all her friends, relatives. We're covering the neighborhood. No trace so far. Not much to go on. Blood stains, empty cartridge. Could mean a hundred things. Mm. Any ideas, Franny? Yeah, just one, and I don't like it. <laughs> Four thirty p.m. Thursday, December twenty-second. The neighborhood search for nine-year-old Stanley Johnstone continued. Lee Jones went back to the crime lab to start the precipitant test and the blood grouping. Levinson and his partner Doherty from Highland Juvenile stood by. We called Chief of Detectives Thad Brown, and he ordered up a special detail to aid in the search for the missing boy. Ben and I questioned the boy's mother, Mrs. Ruth Johnstone, a woman in her early forties. She seemed fairly calm under the circumstances. Miss Johnstone. Um... Is your boy staying in the habit of wandering off without telling you where he's going? No, he's not in the habit of wandering off, but he has done it before. Well, when was the last time, Miss Johnstone? You don't have any children, do you, Sergeant Friday? No, I'm not married. Well, there comes that time in every young boy's life when he feels that it's time to leave home, to go out on his own. It usually happens somewhere around 8 to 10. I think I know what you mean. I've got a boy. Well, then you know how it is. My husband and I scolded Stanley one day after school. He was quite put out about it. He thought George and I were unfair. Packed a few of his things and left. How long was he gone? Oh, no time at all. About two hours. I was worried about him, but my husband said to leave him alone. Said every boy had to go through that stage. Well, then you think he's run away from home again this time? Yes, I think so. He's been gone about four hours now, and I have a funny feeling about it. Did you and his father have some misunderstanding with the boy recently? Well, that's just it. We haven't. I don't mind telling you now that we're talking about it, I'm, I am getting worried. Any place around that he might like to visit? Hobby shop, playground, where he might be? Yeah, there's um, Jensen's model shop and little Shanna Burroughs, but I've already called him and he hasn't been seen all day. I called all his friends they have no idea where he is either. We'd like a list of all his friends and the places that he was known to frequent. Oh, yeah, all right, I'll give them to you. Where do you suppose he is? Where's your husband now, Miss Johnstone? Oh, he's at work. George works for the city. He's a fireman. What house is he stationed at? Engine Company 12. He's working the A platoon. He'll be home tomorrow morning. I haven't told him that Sonny's gone. Was there any chance that the boy might be down at the firehouse with his father? No. No, he seldom goes down there anymore. No, I don't think he's there. I'm awfully worried. May I call my husband? Certainly. Go right ahead. I know George will be worried... Stanley's been gone too long. Hello? May I speak with George Johnstone? This is Mrs. Johnstone. Thank you. I hate to call George at his work. Yes, ma'am. Does your husband own a gun? Yes, he does. What caliber? Do you know? Well, it's a forty-five automatic. He got his... George? This is Ruth. George, is Stanley down there with you by any chance? Oh. 
No, I can't find him anywhere. He hasn't been here when I came home from my shopping. Uh, there are two policemen here. No, I said there are two policemen here. Oh, no, dear. I'll call you if we don't find him soon. All right, dear. Yes, you too. Goodbye. Uh, I didn't think he'd be with George. That forty-five is that the only gun in the household? Well, yes. Why are you asking about guns? Is, has anything happened that you're not telling me about? No, ma'am. Just routine checking. We'll have to take a look at that forty-five off, if you don't mind. Maybe I should tell you. We we do have another gun in the house, but it, it's all wrapped up. George bought it for Stanley's Christmas present. May we see it, please? Well, yes. Will, will you have to unwrap it? Yes, I'm afraid so. I think I can reach it. We we had to hide it. So let me see. Oh, here's the paper it was wrapped in. Stanley must have found it. It's gone. See, here's the gift card in the box the gun came in. The rifle. Can I look at that box, ma'am? Thank you. How about it, Joe? Twenty-two caliber. <laughs> Thursday, December twenty-second, five fifteen p.m. It was getting dark. The search for the missing boy continued. We checked the list of Stanley Johnstone's friends. None of them or their parents had any idea of his whereabouts. We talked with Levinson again. He had been in touch with the detail combing the neighborhood. They had found nothing. We went down to Collis Avenue and 10th Street, service station on the corner. One nickel, Joe? No, I got one. You watch for that, huh? Yeah. Thank you. Two six six seven, please. Two six six seven. Crime lab, killed. Hi, Lee. Joe Friday. Yeah, Joe. Any sign of the Johnson kid? No, not yet. How are you coming? Finished the precipitant test. It's human blood. Yeah. Working in the blood group now. Do you know what type the Johnson boy has? Well, we didn't want to upset his mother. I thought we'd wait till the last thing. We're still in the neighborhood. I check with the family physician. That way you won't disturb him. Yeah, we figured on that. Oh, just a minute, Lee. Good. Yeah, Ben. Boss just pulled up. Okay. Uh, Thad Brown's out here now. I'll check you later, Lee, huh? Right, All right, goodbye. Well, gentlemen, how's it going? Just checked with Lee Jones. Yeah, I know. It's human blood. What do you think? We talked with the boy's mother, Miss Johnston. Found a gun, Mason. Yeah. Caliber's the same as the empty casing that Levinson found. 22. You said the gun was missing. Yeah, the Johnstones were going to give it to the boy as a Christmas present. They had it hidden, but it's gone now. Any idea who took it? Well, they left the Christmas wrapping behind. I think it was the kid. 22 rifle, huh? Nine-year-old boy. When are they going to learn? First, it's carbide cannons on the 4th of July. The city issued ordinance after ordinance, but a few thousand kids around the country had to lose their eyes, fingers, hands before the parents gives us their full cooperation to outlaw them. I don't know what you mean. Sure you do. Even every other cop in the country became the heaviest trying to clamp down on them. It's always the same story. This time it's guns for Christmas. I know what you're thinking, but we're not sure yet. Listen, Friday, there's a city ordinance against giving a gun to a kid. You know that. Yes, I know that. There's a missing boy and a missing gun. There's blood on the ground and an empty shell. That's enough for me. I'm going to stay with it. Something's got to break. Yeah. I hope it's not the hearts of that kid's parents. Oh, hi, Chief. I've been looking for you, Friday. What do you got, Harry? Found the gun. New twenty-two rifle. Strong smell of cordite. I'd say it's been recently fired. Where'd you find it, Levinson? Uh, back up there in that scrub oak. Up behind the Johnston house. Mrs. Johnstone identified it. Buckley took it down to the crime lab. Thanks, Harry. Uh, is Miss Johnston okay? Mm, pretty sick now. Killaby came up with something else. What's that? There's another one missing. An eight-year-old boy. 6.30 p.m. We talked with Officer Killaby about the other missing boy. He told us that his name was Stephen Morheim, eight years old. His family had just moved into the neighborhood. It seemed that no one besides the Morheim family knew that the boys played together. Mrs. Morheim told us that Stephen told her that he was going out to play and that he'd be home by 6 o'clock for dinner. She told us that he was an unusually prompt boy and almost never overstayed his playtime. We got a description of the Morheim boy and put out a missing broadcast. We called the John Stone's family doctor. He told us that Stanley's blood was type O. At 7 p.m., we talked again with Mrs. John Morheim. Are you sure Mrs. Johnstone doesn't know where the boys are? She has no idea, Miss Morhan. It's terrible. It's just awful. I feel there's more to this thing. Something you're not telling me. Well, there's no use to upset you until we know a few things for sure. Then you are holding back something. Now, please try not to worry, Miss Morhan. There are certain questions we'll have to ask, routine questions in any kind of investigation. 
Is there anything else you want to know? Yes, ma'am. What is your boy's blood type? That's a funny question. Do you think anything's happened to him? Have you found him and you're not telling me? No, ma'am, we haven't found him. We don't think anything's happened to him. His blood type? Yes, ma'am. I think I have it written down in Stevie's baby book. Yes, here it is. Type O. Thank you. What if I might use your phone, please? Yes, of course. It's in the hall. Be right back, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Two six six seven, please. Two six six seven. Randall Hello, Ray. This is Friday. Lee there. Uh, just a minute, Joe. Take two, Lee. John speaking. Checking back, Lee. Uh, did you get the blood types on the two missing boys? Yeah, both boys type O. So are the stains, Joe. Type O. You are listening to Dragnet for the solution to an actual case from official police files. Now, here's a real solution to many of your Christmas shopping problems. If your friends smoke a long cigarette, give the best of long cigarettes, Fatima. Give Fatima for quality. The name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Give Fatima for flavor. Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Give Fatima. They're extra mild. Yes, Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. Yes, extra mild. So give Fatima for Christmas in the attractive golden yellow carton. It's the long cigarette that has doubled and redoubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day agree. Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Eight p.m. Thursday, December twenty-second. Still no sign of either of the missing boys. Chief of Detectives Thad Brown went back to headquarters to direct the search from there. He dispatched another detail of fifty men to aid in the hunt for the missing youngsters. Eight thirty p.m. It was getting colder. The citrus growers were warned to expect a freeze. We went up the block to see Mrs. Johnstone. Her husband had quit work early and returned home. We talked with him. He could tell us nothing more than we already knew. We still had not informed either of the families about the blood stains and the empty cartridge casing which had been discovered in the backyard of the Johnstone home. It was more than possible that they had a right to know about our findings, but Ben and I felt that there was no cause to add the, to the distress of the two families at this time. If the two missing boys were found alive and well, then the blood stains and the cartridge case would be of no concern to the relieved parents. At 8.40 p.m., Ben and I left the Johnstone house and went to the home of Mr. and Mrs. John Morheim. Ms. Morheim, you said your husband worked at a market? Yes. He telephoned about 15 minutes ago and said he was closing up right away. He'll be here any minute. I don't wish Stevie would call or come home. It's so cold out tonight. All he had on was a thin cotton jacket. Please try not to worry. We're doing everything we can. It's going to be all right. Stevie's father's such a sensitive man. He and the boy are so close. I know he's terribly upset. No, well, you're sure there's no place you might have forgotten? Some place where the boy might be? No, no place. No. Anything happened to the boy, will just kill you. No, no. You sit still. I'll get it, Miss Morgan. Joe. Hi, Harry. The Johnstone kid. He's been found. Oh, he's home, Sergeant. He's come home. Thank God he's all right. Well, where's he been? Did he tell you? No. No, he didn't. He, his clothes were all dirty and he's acting strange. I've never seen him like this. How do you mean, Miss Johnson? Well, he just came in the front door and said, Hello, Mom. And then he sat down in the chair and stared at the floor. He won't talk to his father or me. Do you mind if I talk to him? No, go ahead. I asked him about the little Moorheim boy and he wouldn't tell me a thing. Where is he now? In the living room. Looks all right. Yes. Son. Son, this is a police officer. He he wants to talk to you. 
No, don't be afraid, dear. He only wants to ask you some questions. Son. You see, Sergeant? Stanley, come on, look at me, son. Get your head up, youngster. Come on, now that's better. I had your mother pretty worried, you know that? You want to tell us where you've been? I wish you'd try to get him to eat a little something. You hear that, son? Want something to eat? Stanley, there's another little boy up the street who hasn't come home. Do you know where he is? His father and mother are worried about him, too, just like your folks were. You've got to help us find him, son. I... I killed him. I killed Steve with the twenty-two. We were only playing... <laughs> But I killed him. How do you know you killed him? Maybe he's only hurt. Now, isn't that it? <laughs> no, he's dead. I know he's dead. The gun went off. We forgot we put bullets in there. Where is he, Stanley? I hid him. I was scared. I didn't want anybody to find him. Where did you hide him, son? In a cave up on the hill. I didn't mean it. It was my pal. Do you want to show us where, son? Yes, I'll show you. Please don't send me to jail. 9.15 p.m., Thursday, December 22nd. Nine-year-old Stanley Johnstone led the way up the hill behind the backyard of his home. He showed us the wagon he moved the body in. His father came along with us. About 50 feet from the crest of the hill, the boy pointed to a thicket of scrub oak. There we found a small cave holding the body of Stephen Morheim. There was a single bullet wound in his chest just below his heart. He was dead. We covered the body. Stanley. Stanley, how did it happen? I knew my folks were going to give me the gun for Christmas. I knew where it was, and I got it. There was a box of bullets with it. Were you pointing the gun at Stephen? No, sir. No, sir, I wasn't. It was Steve's turn to play with it. I was chasing him. He tripped over the stump there in our backyard and fell. The gun hit him in the stomach. <laughs> And it went off. Why do you think you killed him if you're telling us the truth? I'm telling the truth, honest. That's the truth. All right, I believe you, son. But why do you think you killed him? It was my gun. Steve would still be alive if I didn't go and get it. I should have waited till Christmas. It's all my fault. Where have you been all this time? In the cave with Steve. What were you doing in there, son? I was praying. I was praying for God to make him alive again. After a thorough investigation, Ben and I were convinced that the shooting of Stephen Morheim was accidental. Lieutenant Lee Jones' findings substantiated the Johnstone boy's story even to the smallest detail. We put in a call to the coroner's office and acquainted him with the facts. He designated a local mortuary to handle the body pending autopsy and granted us permission to remove the body to the Morheim home. Mrs. Morheim collapsed. The family doctor was called. Ben and I sat in the living room to wait for John Morheim, the dead boy's father. Edith! Edith! Mr. Morheim? Yes. You the police? Yes, sir. Where's Edith? Where's my wife? Has my boy come home? Have you found him? Yes, sir. Oh, where is he? St Steve! Stevie! Where's Steve? He's hurt, isn't he? Yes, sir. Oh, where is he? I want to see him. He's hurt bad, Mr. Morheim. Oh, where is he? I want to see him. He's in his room. <laughs> How bad? Pretty bad. He's... He's dead. All right, if I go in. If you want to. Will you go with me? Sure. Don't make it any harder on yourself, Mr. Morheim. I want to see my boy. <laughs> Mr. Morheim. Stevie, Stevie, Stevie. Listen to me, son. We've got you a lot of nice things for Christmas. Everything you wanted. I, I got you the three new cars for the train. The, the one with the search lights. 
really works. <laughs> Son, you... You got that new switch you wanted to do it. A lot more track. <laughs> You can have a big payout. <laughs> you know that, that new baseball bit you saw? Well, we got it for you. <laughs> the cowboy outfit you wanted, I got you too. <laughs> Me. Stanley Johnston. It was an accident. <laughs> Mr. Morheim, where are you going? I want to see that boy. We had no idea what the dead boy's father had in mind. We didn't feel that we should try to restrain him. We went along with him up the street to the Johnstone home. Hi, Stevie's father. Where's your boy? I'm sorry. Where's your boy? He's right here. Won't you come in? It's all right, Mrs. Johnston. You... You're the boy that was with Stevie? Yes, sir. What's your name? Stanley. Stanley. I know it wasn't your fault, Stanley. I wonder if you'd do something for me. Yes, sir. I've got a lot of nice presents for Stevie. I know he wants you to have them. I want to give them to you. Christmas Eve. Mom... I I think that would be a fine idea, son. Come on, Ben. Well, what does it all prove, Joe? You don't give a kid a gun for Christmas. <laughs> The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 24th, 1948, a coroner's inquest was held in the county morgue, city and county of Los Angeles, state of California. In a moment, the results of that inquest. Now, here are authentic reports from all over the country that tell the story of Fatima's sensational increase in popularity. New York Division. Fatima sales up. 132%. Chicago Division. Fatima sales up 453%. Los Angeles Division. Fatima sales up 545%. More and more smokers agree Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. So enjoy Fatima yourself and give extra mild Fatimas for Christmas in the attractive golden yellow carton. Everyone who smokes Fatima says that this great new long cigarette is the best of all long cigarettes. At the coroner's inquest, it was officially recorded that Stephen Morheim's death was the result of an accident. Stanley Johnstone, age nine, was absolved of any legal responsibility for his friend's death. You have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of acting chief of police, W.A. Wharton, 
Los Angeles Police Department. Dragnet honors Hennepin County, Minneapolis, state of Minnesota, and the men of the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office, another of America's great law enforcement agencies. One of these men, Sheriff Ed Ryan, veteran police officer and department administrator who dedicates his life to making yours more secure. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portion transcribed from Los Angeles. Be sure to hear songs by Morton Downey tonight on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, for a more authentic presentation, portions of the program you are about to hear were actually recorded on the scene. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. A gang of holdup men have been running loose in your city. They've committed more than a dozen robberies. They're heavily armed, quick to shoot. Your job, stop them. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima is doubling and redoubling its smokers. So, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Saturday, July 21st. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the record bureau, and it was 6.55 p.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery detail. Hi, Joe. You ready? Let's go. Where do I dump this top coat? There. It's too hot out tonight for that. Yeah. The rest of the guys take off already? Yeah, we better hustle. How many men are working this thing tonight? Must be at least 50, covering every drugstore in the South Central area. Mm -hmm. Which one did we draw? They own me in South Alameda, Rex Pharmacy. Yeah. Parking lot across the street, we can cover the pharmacy from there. Well, we better check out a Thompson from the business office first, huh? It's a good idea. We might as well be ready. They are. Who got the tip the gang was moving into the south end of town? It's Johnny Powers, one of his informants. Okay, here we are. Business office, clear. Yeah, I'll take care of it. Thanks. Hey, Blair, do you want to check out a Thompson for us? Okay, Friday. Have you done it? Yeah, kind of. There's a sign-out book. Thank you. Yeah, you might as well give us a shotgun while you're at it, Blair. Okay. Check these out for an hour. Okay. Yeah, sounds like a busy night for you fellas. <laughs> Maybe. Thompson's okay. So the shotgun. Want to sign up for the shotgun too, Joe? Yeah. Okay. One Thompson. Submachine gun. One shotgun. You got those serial numbers there, Blair? Yeah. Uh, Thompson 67811. 67811. Yeah. Shotgun 655-228. Uh -huh. two, two, eight. Okay. Signed. 
Joe Brady, serial number 2288. Ben Romero. What's your serial number, Ben? 2633. Oh, yeah. 3633. Six okay. shells for the shotgun, 50 shells for the Thompson, okay? All right, I'll sign for him. Okay. Gang's pretty rough, I understand. Gun heavy. Yeah, that's what they tell us. Okay, here's the book, all signed. Okay, here you go. A lot of firepower there. Yeah, hope you don't have to clean them when we bring them back. We went down to the basement of the city hall, picked up our car, 80K, and drove out to Naomi and South Alameda Streets. We located the parking lot and pulled in. There were four other cars parked in the lot so we wouldn't be conspicuous. Ben and I got in the back seat out of the light. From our vantage point, we had a clear view of the entrance to the Rex Pharmacy across the street. We had the shotgun and the submachine gun on the seat beside us. We listened to the calls come in on the radio, and we waited. Interference. Thirteen, Jerry, stand by. There's no cooler here than it is in the office. Yeah. Hot and sticky, huh? Yeah. Paper says it's going to be worse tomorrow. Roll down your window, will you, and get some air in here? Yeah, uh-huh. The pharmacy isn't doing much business. Not more than a dozen people in there in the last hour. No soda fountain, I guess. Mm, sure is hot. You have to talk about it, huh? Oh, hell. What time you got? Ten minutes to ten. No smoke? No, thanks. Yeah, I'll get it. That gang's gonna show up here. We should get it over with. Flowers might have got a bum tip. Well, the gang hasn't missed a weekend for two months. Mm. I wonder how much time the average cop spends waiting. I don't know. Put it all together, it'd make a fine vacation. Mm -hmm. What do we do, sit this out till the pharmacy closes? Yeah, 2 a.m. No, it's hot. Yeah. Midnight came and passed. The traffic on South Alameda thinned out. Only an occasional customer entered the pharmacy across the street. Ben kept complaining about the heat. We waited. Well, that's it, Joe. There go the lights. Drugstore's closing. Yeah, the guy's locking the doors. There he goes. We might as well shove off, too. Yeah. Let's get in the front seat. There's not much call for this shotgun tonight. Uh, no use checking it in. Same duty to mine, eh? Mm hmm. Attention, all units. All units in the vicinity of 8th and Hill on the corner of Hill and Geneva Alley. A 211 and shooting. Code 3. Hit the light. Yeah, come on. Let's roll. Sunday, July 22nd, 2.15 a.m., Ben and I pulled up at the Merchant Security Trust Company on the corner of South Hill and Geneva Alley. Two patrol cars were already on the scene, and four uniformed officers were trying to keep back a crowd of people who had gathered at the top of a flight of marble stairs, which led off the street, down one flight to the bank's night depository. At the bottom of the stairs, an elderly man was sprawled out, face down, his right arm twisted under him. The man was dead. Ben counted five bullet wounds in the victim's back. We interviewed the only witness, a young sailor. My name's Basie, Sergeant. Uh, Don Basie, quartermaster, second class. Here's my ID card. You saw the shooting, Basie? I was about a half a block away. I, I just came out of the bar down the street there, the top hat. Yeah? Had a couple of beers, and I left, and I started walking back to the hotel. When was that? Oh, about uh, five after two. Mm-hmm. Go on. Well, before I got to the corner, I saw this man ahead of me. He uh, crossed the street and headed over for the bank. Then this car pulled up, and some guys got out. They ran over to the man, and it looked like they were frisking him. Yeah? All of a sudden, I heard shots. A man ran for the stairs here, and then it looked like he stumbled and fell. A bunch of guys jumped back in the car and drove away. What'd you do then? Well, I ran up to see what I could do for the old man. He was lying down there where he is now. Nothing I could do for him. I yelled for a cop. Did you get a look at the man in that car? No, I just saw him from a distance. Uh, four of them, maybe five. What about the car? Did you see the license number? The last couple of numbers, that's all. Six, nine, nine. Couldn't see the rest. Mm-hmm. What was it, a coupe or a sedan? A sedan, maroon color. It was a Pontiac, either a 1940 or 41. You sure about that? I used to own one back in Delaware, 1940 model. I sold it to my brother when I went in the Navy. I'm sure all right. And you're sure about the number of men in the car? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, four or five. No more. I see. Thanks. Well, will you drive back to the office with us and give us a full statement? Sure, Sergeant. Anything you say. You can wait in the car, Vasey. We won't be long. Sure. Well, what do you think? Oh, I don't know. Drugstore gang? Said there were four guys. Could be. No description. Maroon car. Three numbers off the license plate. Pretty thin. Yeah. Looks like a hard summer. 
We completed our preliminary investigation. The coroner arrived and the body was taken to the county morgue in the basement of the Hall of Justice. The victim was identified as Walter Conroy, the proprietor of the Flowerland Dance Hall on South Hill Street. Together with officers Fremont and Hearst from Homicide, Ben and I spent most of Sunday tracking down employees of the dance hall and interviewing them. We sent a rush teletype to the Department of Motor Vehicles in Sacramento containing the partial license number, plus our scan information on the car, which the suspects drove. Early Monday afternoon, Ben and I, along with Captain Ed Walker of Robbery Detail, met with Chief of Detective Stad Brown. What kind of a motive are you working on? Robbery. The dance hall manager, Conroy, was on his way to the bank tonight depository when this bunch caught up with him. He had the night's receipts with him from the dance hall. How much did he get, Walker? Uh, $350. They missed over 1000 Conroy had in an inside pocket. No idea who uh, pulled the stick up? Could have been that drugstore gang. Why them? We haven't missed working a weekend night for two months. There's no sign of any other job that they might have pulled Saturday. Just a hunch, Chief. Nothing to go on. We'll have to guess our way for a while. Uh, Sacramento checking the description of the car, the uh, numbers off the license plate? Yeah, ought to have an answer this afternoon. Uh, any leads on the drugstore gang at all? Plenty. None of them good. Suspects are loaded down with guns, that's all we know. Excuse me. Brown speaking. Uh, just a moment. Friday for you. Okay, thanks. We'll reach it over here. Friday. Yeah, Ralph. How many? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, I got an answer from DMV Sacramento about the holdup car. What did they say, Joe? Well, they looked up the possible combinations of 1940 or 41 Pontiac sedans with the numbers 699 in the license plate. Yeah? 123 possibles to check. Not much choice. No car of that description on the hot list. The killer might be the legal owners. 123. Well, even after we check them, we still might not have the right party. That's right. If we got a better lead, we'll work on it. Nope. Well, then ride this till it falls apart. For the next 13 days, Ben and I, Fremont and Hearst from Homicide, plus a half a dozen other men, hacked away at the list of 123 car registrations, any one of which could have been issued to the hold-up car. The color of the sedan didn't help us much to start with, since California vehicle registrations do not include the colors of the cars. After 14 days of gradual elimination of possibles, the field was narrowed to six, then four, and then two. August 6th, Monday, 5.30 p.m., Ben and I were called to Thad Brown's office. Gentlemen, you uh, check out that last possible yet? About 20 minutes ago. It didn't pan out. What about Hearst and Fremont? They had one left. Right here. This could be the answer. Yeah. 1940 Pontiac Sedan, license number 4XA699. Last registration, San Diego. Sounds good. We teletyped the San Diego police. They say the car's been sold to a woman out in Santa Monica. Uh-huh. Anyone checked her? Well, that's what I want you two for. San Diego and Santa Monica. Well, it's in the right area. Can't afford to miss now. I hope it's the right one. Well, it's got to be. Check it. Ben and I checked the woman in Santa Monica, Mrs. Fielding. She told us that she had sold the car six months before to a friend who lived in Bakersfield. We contacted her friend. He told us the car had been traded in by him to an auto dealer in Pasadena. We checked the dealer. He said the car had been sold off his used car lot two months before. The new buyer had given his name as Emil Thurston. Two names were given as reference, Lloyd Newton and John Lacombe. We ran a routine check through the record bureau. Ran them through, fellas. It's the packages. Get a make for him? On all three. What'd you find on Thurston? Uh, let's see. Thurston, two time losers, second time up to Q on five counts of armed robbery. On parole from Quentin now. How about the other two? Well, they're calm. Let's see. Preston Reformatory, two terms, went up three years ago, violation of the Dyer Act. He's on parole, too. What about Newton? Did you make him? Uh, two terms in Oklahoma. They're looking for him now at John Parole. Can I look at that just a minute, Frank? Well, sure. No, I have all three of them. Take a look, Ben. Each one of the mama sheets on these three guys. Yeah. I'm like right here under General M.O. See? Mm-hmm. Thurston, heavily armed at time of arrest. Yeah. This one, Lacombe. Huh? 
Heavily armed. This one on Newton? Same thing. Gun happy. Yeah. Come on. At the time he purchased the car, suspect Emil first enlisted his home address as 1517 North Hoover Avenue. Previous robbery victims positively identified Thurston and his companions. At 1517 North Hoover, the landlady also identified Thurston and his companions as tenants. She told us they drove a red sedan and they parked the car at a Temple Street garage. An immediate stakeout was placed on the apartment house and we started the canvas of Temple Street garages from Hoover Avenue down to Rampart Boulevard. At 4 p.m., Ben spotted the car in Donnelly's garage on Temple Street near Michigan Drive. The garage attendant told us that the owner of the car had given his name as Emil Thurston. We showed him the mug shots. Yeah, used to park his car in here a while back. Then he came in yesterday morning with these two guys and said he wanted a paint job. Hmm. Doesn't look like he needs a paint job to me. They offered me 20 bucks extra if I do it in a hurry. He wants the car painted green. When's he going to call for the car? About 10 o'clock tonight. These jobs take time. He's not going to like it if the car's not finished. He won't like it if it is. Come on, Ben. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. Now, here is an authentic report from Fatima Cigarettes. In 1949, Fatima doubled, tripled, and quadrupled its smokers. In 1950, enjoy Fatima yourself. You'll find Fatima extra mild. Because Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobacco superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. You'll find Fatima tastes much better. Fatima's superb blend gives you a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. You'll find Fatima tops in cigarette quality. Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. For a new year of greater smoking enjoyment, buy Fatima in the appealing golden yellow package. You'll agree, Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Seven p.m. Tuesday, August seventh. Chief of Detectives Thad Brown and Captain Ed Walker swung the entire robbery detail into action. The stakeout at the apartment house on North Hoover continued. An additional detail of men was stationed in a vacant store on Temple Street, directly opposite Donnelly's Garage. Donnelly's Garage was a small family outfit, and the only spot from which we could cover it thoroughly without being seen was from a large paint locker set up against the right wall. The garage man cleared enough room so that Ben and I could fit into the locker in a half-stooped position. Two small latches were rigged up so that we could pull the doors closed from the inside. Four ventilation holes at the top and bottom of the doors provided us with peepholes. At 8 o'clock that night, Ben and I took our places inside the locker. The trap was set. We waited. <clears throat> Can you see all right, Joe? Yeah. It's hot in here. Mm, stale air. It's a tight fit. I'm getting a cramp in my shoulder. Yeah. What time did that garage man say he closed? 11 o'clock. Oh, it's lousy paint smells. <coughs> Stop it. Mm. Hey, that car pulling in. Can you see the driver? Wait a minute. Uh, it's nothing. Somebody getting gas. Mm. I hope they show up. I wouldn't want this to go on another night. Oh, don't count on it. What's oh, going to sleep? Why don't you stand still? What time you got? Let me see. Get the light on in here. Ten minutes to nine. Thanks. The popular conception of the working detective rarely includes a glimpse of his everyday run-of-the-mill duties. Filling out forms, conducting interviews, or waiting long, monotonous hours parked in a car or standing half-crouched in a garage paint locker. It's slow, dull, and tedious, and it's 95% of the police officer's job. By 10 o'clock that night, there was still no sign of Thurston and his friends. The cramped locker got more cramped with the passing minutes. The air was thick with paint fumes. We waited. At 10.55, a taxi pulled to a stop in front of the garage. Three men got out. 
Can you see him, Joe? Wait till he step into the light. Yeah. There's another guy still in the cab. Here they come. Uh, There's the first guy. Yeah, it's Thurston. Fourth guy's getting out of the cab. That looks like Newton, man. That's him. Yeah, it's Lacombe right behind. Fat guy. Here they come. They sure do look the floor. All right. Unlatch your door, but don't open it. Yeah. <laughs> Quiet, Ben. What's the matter? That match is stuck. Wait a minute. Did you get it? No, no it's really stuck. All right, tap it with your gun stock. Yeah, well, Come on, easy. Yeah, well. There. There it is. It's loose. Good. Can you see where they are now? Yeah. Talking to the garage man. Not looking this way. No, they just stay that way, huh? You ready? Okay. Don't tip them off till we're right on top of them. Let them get away from that garage man, huh? Right. All right. Let's go. Approximately 25 or 30 yards separated us from the suspects. I glanced across Temple Street at the vacant store where Thad Brown and the other men were staked out. 25 yards is a long way to walk when you're approaching a murderer and you know that he won't hesitate to kill you in order to escape. Ben flipped the safety off the machine gun. We were almost halfway across the garage, 15 yards away. Thurston turned and saw us. Look out, Joe! on him. All right, you two, hold it. Here comes Chief. Yeah, I'll get these guns together here. Lacombe, he's not much of a fighter. Not without a gun. The suspects were booked at different divisions to keep them separated. Emil Thurston and Lloyd Newton were taken to Hollenbeck Park and booked on suspicion of armed robbery and murder. John Lacombe was booked at Highland Park Jail on the same charges. The other suspect, who had been wounded in the escape attempt, was identified as Harold Steves, 19 years old. He was treated for a leg wound at Georgia Street Receiving Hospital and then transferred to the prison ward at the county hospital. During the next two days, each of the suspects was questioned individually. Thurston, Lacombe, Newton would admit nothing. The 19-year-old Steves broke down and agreed to turn state's evidence. We took his statement to Chief of Detectives Thad Brown. Gentlemen. What did the boy tell you? Just about everything, boss. They pulled the drugstore holdups and they killed that dance hall owner, Walter Conroy. Which one of them? Well, the kid says Thurston shot him. He says Thurston's the gang leader. Good. You finally got a count on those guns you took off them? Yeah, 12 of them. Each one of them was ready to go, bullet in every chamber. Did you get a complaint from the DA's office yet? They were arraigned. Preliminary hearing set for Monday. Fine. You got them in jail, I'll put them in prison. <laughs> The apprehension of the criminal doesn't mean the end of a case for a police officer. He spends just as much time helping to convict the criminal after he's caught. Evidence must be gathered and authenticated and presented to the district attorney's office. If confessions are possible, they must be obtained and put in order. The officer must also help out in formulating the case and in testifying at the trial of a suspect. On October 30th, almost three months after the Thurston gang was apprehended, they were brought to trial in Superior Court. It was a routine affair. Harold Steves took the stand and told the story of the gang's activity. The victims identified the suspects and testified to the robberies. Both Ben and I took the stand and testified to the arrest and possession of guns by the defendant. We received no cross-examination. On the morning of March 2nd, the case went to the jury. Ben and I had lunch with Lieutenant Rombo from robbery in the city hall cafeteria, and it was five minutes past one when we got back to the office. 
Oh, it sure was good soup today. Yeah, it was a nice lunch. You want to check the mail? I didn't, Jan. Yeah. I'll get it. Robbery Friday. Yeah? When? Right. Lacombe and Thurston. They just broke jail. Within seven minutes, a dragnet for the escaped criminals had been thrown around the entire city. Chief of Detective Stad Brown directed the operation. At 14 minutes past one, he called us to the photocopy room. The machines were turning out duplicate mug shots of Thurston and Lacombe for distribution at the rate of one every four seconds. You want us to stand by, Chief? Uh, for the moment, yeah. We got all the help we need on the street. How'd they pull the break, anyway? Slugged the deputy when he brought in their lunch. Used a steel leg from one of the benches in the prisoner's tank. Yeah? And they beat the deputy right into the ground, but he held on to Newton. He didn't get away. Well, how'd Thurston and Lacombe ever get out of the building? It's a real freak. They slugged the elevator man and got down to the basement. Uh -huh. Right then, an ambulance crew was wheeling a body in the morgue. The attendant left the ignition keys in the ambulance. Shouldn't be too rough to track them if they're in an ambulance. You're tougher than you think. How are those copies coming, Frank? Fast as we can make them, Chief. I have another batch for you in a minute. You had any reports at all yet, boss? A couple. They're moving fast. Frank, you want to get that? I can't see in this dark room. Yeah, I'll get it. Yeah? Chief Brown in there? Yeah, come on in. Now, Walker, what do you got? Uh, kill that dry one. Oh, yeah. Now, what do you got? Gas station out on Sunset. Lacombe and Thurston just held it up. We picked up our car in the city hall garage and drove out to the service station on the corner of Sunset Boulevard and Lorraine Drive. Detectives Ruiz and Stromwall from robbery were already on the scene. The two escapees had abandoned the ambulance there, robbed the station of $56 in currency, and stolen a 1938 gray Packard coupe. License number 7 Robert 6336. We left the station and started to cruise the area. It was 1.55 p.m. Attention all units. Attention all units. Get it up, Joe. Yeah. 6380 North Sunset, a 211 in progress. 6380 North Sunset, a 211 in progress. Code 3. This is the 61 Yeah, come on. 6380 North Sunset. Yes, look, maybe. Push it. Hey, that car pulling out up ahead there. The gray coupe. Wait a minute. 7 Robert, that's them. Lights changing, they can't make it. They're going through, they're skidding. They hit the lamppost, broke it off. All right, pull up. Come on. Right. All right, let's go. <clears throat> Lucky if they live through this one? Yeah. All right, come on, help me with this door. Yeah, all, all right. Pull. All right. All right. All right. All right. Like, can you take him? Yeah. I'll get Lacombe. You look okay? Yeah. No. Get Thurston out of here. All right. Come on, you. Come on. Come on. Yeah. All right, Lacombe, come on. I'll give you a shot, I'll kill you. Oh, sure you will. Come on. All right, don't try to walk. How's Thurston, Ben? Seems okay, a couple of scratches. All right, sit down over there. Cold, slug the guard. funny. They don't look very tough. They can't play their part. They haven't got their guns. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 3, 1947, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 91, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to Fatima. Here are the actual figures. New York Division. Fatima sales up 132%. Chicago Division. Fatima sales up 453%. Los Angeles Division. Fatima sales up 545%. Yes, in 1949, more and more smokers discovered that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. They found Fatima extra mild. They found Fatima has a much different, much better flavor. They found the name Fatima means the best in cigarette quality. In 1950... Enjoy Fatima yourself. Best of all long cigarettes. Emil Thurston, John Lacombe, and Lloyd Newton were convicted of first-degree murder and robbery and sentenced to life terms. For turning state's evidence, 
19-year-old Harold Steves received special consideration. As a result of the jailbreak, Thurston and Lacombe were convicted of assault and escape. They are now serving life terms in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Acting Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Dragnet honors the city of Pasadena, state of California, and the men who make up the Pasadena Police Force, another of America's great law enforcement agencies. One of these men, Chief of Police Clarence H. Morris, traffic specialist and veteran police administrator, dedicates his life to making yours more secure. <laughs> Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portion transcribed from Los Angeles. Be sure to hear songs by Morton Downey tonight on NBC. gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. Two armed bandits have robbed a large jewelry store in your city. One of the suspects escapes. One is apprehended. He's identified as a friend of yours. Your job, send him to prison. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima is doubling and redoubling its smokers. So, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, February 8th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way over from the city hall, and it was 8.35 p.m. when I got to the second floor of the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital treatment room. Joe, oh, hi. Hi, Doc. Ben, how's it going? Okay. It hurt for a while. Doc gave me an injection. Six of a grain of morphine, Novocaine injection. The bullet's still on your shoulder? Doc's about ready to take it out. As soon as I get the wound cleaned, here's the soap and water nurse. Alcohol sponge, please. How's it look, Doctor? Well, there's the X-ray, shallow penetrating wound in the deltoid area, mm. slugs, larger than the soft tissue right here. Oh yeah. No bone involvement. Okay, the bullet was spent. That's good. Feel okay? Sure. Nurse, methylate applicators, please. Thanks. Let's see now. Where'd you leave Tyler, Joe? Interrogation room. Reynolds and Thompson are with him. Let me have the probe, nurse. Yeah. Feel anything, Romero? No. That's it. You hear that? Hear what? Located the slug with a probe. Oh. Nice. Cross it. Thanks. There we go. Oh, it's steady. You call your wife? No, uh, she don't know where I... There it is, boys. On the market for evidence? Yeah, give it to me with the eye well. Nice sterile saline solution. Here, get the wound. 
No sign of Tyler's partner, huh, Joe? Guy got me? No, not yet, no. Still dressings, please. How long did okay. you know this, Tyler? Before he went wrong, I mean. I met him in the Army, helped him line up a job when he got out. It's too bad. Sure is funny. Making a friend of yours pull an armed robbery. Must have surprised you, huh? Yeah, kind of. You want me to drive you home when the doc's finished, Jim? Let's go back to the office and talk to Tyler first. Okay. Is that all right, Doc? No. You're staying right here, Romero, till tomorrow morning. If you haven't got a temperature by then, I might release it. Oh, it's only a flesh wound, Doc. I feel all right. I'm not taking any chances with gunshot wounds. If infection set in and you were laid up, I'd have the pension committee to answer to. You're staying here. Sounds like an order. It is. You can pick him up in the PNF ward tomorrow morning. Okay. You gonna need anything, Ben? Yeah. A phone to tell my wife I won't be home for dinner. His name was Max Tyler, white, male American, age 32. Dark hair, brown eyes, medium build, married, father of twin boys. He was a friend of mine. We served together in the Army overseas, and when the war finished, I came back to my job on the force, and Max went back to his old job. It didn't fit him anymore. He stopped working and started drinking. His wife didn't help much. Max started with small trouble, but it grew fast. On the afternoon of February the 8th, Tuesday, Ben and I surprised two men holding up a Main Street jewelry shop. Shots were exchanged, and Ben received a flesh wound in the shoulder. One of the hold-up men escaped. The other one was apprehended. His name was Max Tyler. Hi, Larry. Hi, Joe. Glad you got here. Tyler says he won't talk to anybody but you. Okay, boy. Thanks for standing by. Sure. I'll be outside in the end. Max? Joe? You're in deep this time. You shot a cop. I didn't. This guy was with me. I didn't fire once. You were in on the job. Yeah. Then don't expect presents. I don't expect anything, Joe. Glad you came back. I, I don't want to talk to those other cops. I work in the same department they do, same job. Well, it's easier to talk to you. What's your story? I was crazy to try it. No alibis, Joe, but I, I didn't know what I was doing. Believe me, I, I just didn't realize... I won't buy it, Max. You told me the same thing 14 months ago when they picked you up for those bum checks you were passing. Sure, I hung some paper, but I'm no hood, Joe. You know that. I, I was drinking. I needed dough for Dorothy and the kids. You gotta believe me. I need a break. You said that before, too. I went to bat for you, got off with six months and three years probation. Now you turn up with another caper. I know, Joe, I know. I'm sorry. You're sorry once, Max, and it works, but one free ride's enough for anybody. Now, that's it. Did I say I wanted that kind of a break? I'll, I'll serve my time, Joe. I'll serve every day I owe. I mean, what can you tell me you couldn't have told the other cops? I want to ask you a favor. Yeah? I know you're going to hook me on this. So while I'm doing my time... Dorothy and the kids are staying with relatives out in Inglewood. If you're... Well, just keep an eye on them, you know, Joe. I, I don't mean Doe. Dorothy can work with... Kind of watch out for them, huh? Give them a break, Joe. It's not their fault. Will you do it, Joe? Yeah. Sure, I'll take care of it. Now, you do something for me. Anything you want, guy. Let's have the straight story. Who was the guy with you on that holdup this afternoon? Cresta, George Cresta, you know him. Out of Folsom, short guy, black hair? Yeah, yeah, he's got a room above the Red Owl Bar down on East 3rd near Broadway. That's where he hangs out. Where can we find Cresta now? Oh, maybe there, I don't know. I'll give you a list of the places he goes. Some of his friends I've met. He sure wrote me in. Said there wasn't going to be any rough stuff. You were carrying an S&W 38? Sure, sure. When they got outside the jewelry shop, Cresta jammed the gun in my hand. I had to put it away, get it out of sight. Believe me, Joe, he roped me into this. It sounds like an alibi. No, This but is your could... second time around, Max. It sounds like one. Okay, I got nothing coming. Don't forget about Dorothy and the kids. Huh? I promised you. Now, you want to give me a full statement on the holdup now? Anything you say, Joe. I'll call for a stenographer. Joe. Yeah. I'm sorry. I am. I believe you. We got the feeling too late, that's all. <laughs> Max Tyler was arraigned in municipal court two days later. Bail was set at $10,000. Three days after that came his preliminary hearing in municipal court. At his arraignment in superior court, five weeks after he'd been apprehended, Tyler entered a plea of not guilty. A date was set for his trial in superior court. Meantime, the hunt for George Cresta, Max's accomplice, went on. There wasn't a sign of him. Our informants had no lead on him, and the all-points bulletin containing all the information we had on Cresta brought in nothing. 
On Monday, March 22nd, the trial of Max Tyler was held in Superior Court. Ben and I were subpoenaed to appear. The victim of the holdup, the jewelry store manager, was the first to testify. He was questioned by both the prosecutor and the counsel for the defense. He left the stand at 11.25 a.m. If it please, Your Honor. Counsel for the defense. Before the next witness testifies, I'd like permission to approach the bench. Motion granted. Counsel for the prosecution may also approach the bench. I wonder what that's all about, Joe. Something's up. Hello. Judge is shaking his head. Public defender's going back to the counsel's table. Uh, counsel for the defense. Your Honor, it's my client's desire to change his plea to guilty. Oh. Defendant rise and face the court. Max Tyler, is that your true name? Yes, Your Honor. On the 12th day of March of this year, in Superior Court, Department 83, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California, you have heretofore been arraigned on the charge of robbery in the first degree. At that time, you pled not guilty to the charge in question. Is it now your desire to change that plea? Yes, sir, it is. You've reached this decision of your own free will? Yes, I have. There's been no force employed, no promise of gratuity or reward to reduce you to reach this decision? No, sir. Counsel for the prosecution. Yes, Your Honor. <coughs> Max Tyler, on the 12th day of March of this year in Superior Court, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California, you were arraigned on the charge of robbery in the first degree. At <coughs> that time, you entered a plea as set forth in this information. How do you now plead? Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Is it stipulated that at the time of the commission of the robbery, the defendant was armed with a deadly weapon to wit a revolver? So stipulated. Court can fix the degree of robbery, robbery the first degree. Your Honor, in the interest of justice, the people moved to dismiss count two, assault with a deadly weapon. At this time, Your Honor, the defendant waives time for sentencing and asks that he be sentenced immediately. Just a moment. <coughs> Max Tyler, it's the judgment of this court that on the eighth day of February of this year, you did enter the premises at 23108 East Main Street in the city. <clears throat> and there, in attempt the felonious taking of personal property in the possession of another from his person and immediate presence and against his will. Further, said attempt was made while you were armed with a dangerous and deadly weapon. Now, Mr. Tyler, this court finds you guilty of robbery in the first degree. Count two is dismissed. Does it, Joe? Decision of this court is to be returned to the county jail. The sheriff will transfer you to the state penitentiary where you will serve the sentence as prescribed by law. Court possessed for the team. Hey, Joe. Miss Tyler over there. She's taking it pretty hard. Yeah, come on, we better go see her. Hello, Dorothy. I love him, Joe. What am I going to do without him? Children. I'll give it to you straight, Dorothy. You didn't do much to keep Max out of this. You drank right along with him. You don't Joe, deserve those kids. That's my opinion. Please, I know it. Don't make it any harder. I'll do anything I can for the kids, Dorothy. That's all. What am I going to do without him? I can't be all alone without Max. It's not right. It's not right. Neither is armed robbery. Goodbye, Dorothy. Before the end of March, Max Tyler was delivered to San Quentin State Penitentiary where he started serving his term. His wife, Dorothy Tyler, got a job as a telephone operator. She and her children continued living with their relatives down in Inglewood. I helped them out whenever I could. Six months went by. Every two weeks, faithfully, Tyler wrote me a letter from prison. I answered most of them. While Ben and I worked on other jobs, the search for George Preston went on. We failed to uncover a single lead. Ten months passed. Tuesday, January 16th, 1949, 4 p.m. I checked in for work as usual. Hi, right, Joe. Cold out, huh? Yeah. Did you pick up the mail? Mm-hmm. There's a letter in your box from San Quentin. Tyler, huh? How's he doing, anyway? Good. Clean record. Got himself a pretty fair job in the prison library. Yeah. I talked to the warden up there. Says Tyler ought to be eligible for parole in about a year if he keeps his nose clean. You going to bat for Tyler again? I don't know. See what happens. How can you see anything in that guy? He's giving you nothing but trouble. Oh, a lot of people are giving him the same. Maybe that explains it. Not for me, it doesn't. I wouldn't trust him with dirty laundry. I get it. <coughs> Robbery Friday. Oh, Joe. It's Dorothy Tyler. I got to talk to you. Yeah, Dorothy. What's the matter? What? George Crestus. I know where he is. I saw him downtown. I followed him to his place. You sure it was him? I'm positive. He's staying at 134 Jesse Street. It's a rooming house, just off Alameda. 
134 Jesse. Got it. Thanks, Dorothy. Come on, Ben. Eight minutes later, Ben and I were interviewing the landlord at 134 Jesse Street, a cheap rooming house down on the south end of the city. The landlord's name was Peterson. We showed him Cresta's mug shot, and he told us he was in room 11. We went up a dark, narrow stairway to the second floor. And here we are, number 11. All right, stand clear. I'll try the door. Mm -hmm. It's open. Yeah. Joe, have a look. He's asleep. He's passed out. Come on, slip the cuffs on him. That was easy. Yeah. All right, I got his gun. He's been drinking, all right. He'll have a big hangover. He'll have a long time to get over it. George Cresta was booked at county jail on suspicion of robbery. Two months and three weeks later in Superior Court, he was tried and convicted of assault with a deadly weapon and first-degree robbery and sentenced to the state penitentiary. The day after Cresta was sentenced, I was called to the office of Chief of Detectives Thad Brown. Friday, this Max Tyler is coming up for parole in a couple of months. He's a friend of yours, isn't he? That's right, in a way. You've been writing letters to the warden. You've talked to the parole board about him. Understand you're helping on his kids. A few presents. They haven't had much of a break. They're just youngsters. Mm, you're working hard to get Tyler's parole. You think he's worth it? Well, I was off both him and his wife, and, and then she gave us that tip about Cresta, and Tyler's got such a good record up at Q, I figured they'd earned another chance. You're sticking your chin out, Joe, helping a con to get a parole. I think you'll realize that. Well, I believe he's a good risk now, Chief. He's pretty weak in some things. He needs direction, that's all. His wife's getting better. She might help more than she did. I hope both of them are worth it. If anything happens, I know I'm going to get it from all sides. You really think some men deserve another chance, don't you? Yes, sir, I do. I wouldn't want you working for me if you didn't. Two more weeks went by. Tuesday, April 19th. Ben came down with a bad cold and had to lay off work. At the same time, a new gang started a hold-up campaign among the liquor stores out in the Wilshire district. A new rash of armed robberies broke out in the central area. It was an attempted bank robbery. It was a bad week. Ben got back to work on Saturday. Rough time, huh, Joe? Busy, yeah. Did you beat that cold all right? Sure, I feel much better. Doctor gave me some new medicine. Works good. That's fine. Maybe I'll knock off early tonight if nothing's doing. That's a good idea. Shouldn't be Joe, too much tonight. Tell the type for you. Just came in. Oh, thanks, Larry. Sure. Money, Joe. What is it? Max Tyler. He broke out of prison this morning. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. And now, here's an authentic report from Fatima Cigarettes. In 1949, Fatima doubled, tripled, and quadrupled its smokers. In 1950, enjoy Fatima yourself. You'll find Fatima extra mild. Because Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobacco superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. You'll find Fatima tastes much better. Fatima's superb blend gives you a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. You'll find Fatima tops in cigarette quality. Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. For a new year of great smoking enjoyment, buy Fatima in the appealing golden yellow package. You'll agree, Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. <laughs> In the course of his career, the police officer is afforded two diverse views of the criminal. At first, the rookie cop is taught to distrust the criminal at every turn, without exception. He's schooled in the thousand and one ways in which the criminal operates, his psychology, his mode of operation. Then, when he's thoroughly acquainted with the methods of the criminal and how best to detect them, the police officer starts to learn the most difficult lesson of all, how to distinguish between the confirmed criminal and the lawbreaker, in whom there is hope of rehabilitation. After nine and a half years of police work, my first experiment in this field was with Max Tyler. I'd given him two chances to prove himself, and he'd lost on both of them. So did I. Two months before his parole hearing, which might have given him his freedom, Max Tyler had suddenly decided to escape. How he figured it, I didn't know, but it was my job to find him. 
At 5 o'clock that afternoon, Ben and I met in the chief of detectives' office. Two officers, Holland and Grayson, from the state adult authority, escape detail over there. How did Tyler manage his escape, Grayson? Same old story. They figured they could trust him up there. He had a good job on the prison farm, and they trusted him. When did they find out he was gone? On the early morning count. Have you checked his relatives out in Inglewood yet? Yeah, we have. We've got the home staked out. We're covering all the places we figure he might go. How about Mrs. Tyler? You get in touch with her Friday? Her relatives told us that she's on a weekend vacation with the two kids, staying with friends down at Laguna Beach. We've got a call in to them. Should be hearing from them soon. I understand Tyler's a friend of yours Friday. He was ready for parole. Yeah. I was trying to help it along. I thought the guy deserved a break. He didn't need you, Joe. He made his own. Well, he was feeling bad. You weren't the only one fooled Friday. He had the prison officials buffaloed, too. Yeah, I know. I helped convince them. You got any leads on Tyler at all, Grayson? I mean, from the time he broke prison? Pretty strange. They traced him as far as Stockton, and then they lost the trail completely. The Stockton police in on the search? Yeah, sure. Funny. The guy has no money, no car we know of, no change of clothes. You figure he's getting help from somebody? Could be. Excuse me a minute. Brown speaking. Uh, just a moment. See you Friday. Oh, well, thank you. Friday. Yeah. When? Uh, where? Uh, just a minute. Will you hold on, please? It's the Tyler's friends down at Laguna Beach. Mrs. Tyler there? No, she called them last night about 7 o'clock. Told them she'd changed her plan. She wasn't coming. She told them where she was going? She wanted to know which highway would take her to Stockton. We told the Tyler's friends in Laguna Beach to contact us immediately if they heard from either Mr. or Mrs. Tyler. We got out an APB on Dorothy Tyler, and then we drove out to interview her relatives in Inglewood. They told us that Mrs. Tyler had the two children with her. She had left their house at 6 p.m. the night before by taxi. As far as they knew, she didn't own a car. We talked with some of her friends in the neighborhood. The only thing they could tell us was that she had not borrowed a car from any of them. We drove down to the telephone exchange where she was employed as an operator, and we spoke with a manager, Mr. Ralph Cartwright. I'm sorry, gentlemen. This is Mrs. Tyler's night off. Is there something I can help you with? When is Miss Tyler due back to work, Mr. Cartwright? Well, she's working the uh, 10 to 7 starting tomorrow, doing at 10 a.m. Uh -huh. We understand that she's on a weekend vacation. Huh? Yes, you see, today was payday, so she asked me if she could have her check ahead of time. Said she had to have the money for the weekend. Did you give her the check? Oh, my, no, I couldn't give her the check ahead of time. But I did do her a favor, just to help her over the weekend. What was that? I loaned her my car. <laughs> We got a complete description of the car together with a license number and called the office. The information was broadcast to all units throughout the city and teletyped to all points in the state. Chief of Detectives Thad Brown ordered an immediate stakeout on the telephone exchange where Mrs. Tyler was employed. The stakeout at the home of Inglewood continued. Another day passed. We checked with the bank where Mrs. Tyler maintained her account. It was 10.25 a.m. when we got back to robbery detail. Gentlemen, what'd you find out? Miss Tyler closed her account three days ago, withdrew all her savings, $46.55. And they're not going to go far on that. Any word about that car she borrowed? Teletype came in about an hour ago. They found it just outside Santa Barbara, abandoned. Anyone see the Tylers? No reports. I wonder how those poor kids are making out. He must be crazy, and his wife, too. If she was going to help him pull an escape, why'd she have to drag the kids along? It's the way some parents figure, Friday. They owe their children nothing. The children owe them everything. Call for you, Friday. Say it in two. Oh, thanks, Larry. Friday. This is Hopkins, Friday, on the stakeout the phone exchange. Yeah, Bert. Tyler woman came for a check. We got her. Dorothy Tyler was brought into the city hall, where there was one of her children. He was delivered to the juvenile authorities for the time being. Mrs. Tyler was brought to the interrogation room. She refused to admit anything to the officers from the adult authority. She said she wanted to talk to me. I went in. She threw her arms around me and started crying. Joe! Joe, you won't let him get Max with you. You won't let him. I'm after him as much as they are, maybe more. Where is he? I can't tell you. Why'd you do it, Dorothy? Why? Oh, you know why, Joe. You know why. I had to see him. I had to be with Max. It's a bum deal. You traded days for years. I can't get it. If I don't tell him where he is, they won't find him. They'll find him. He's got to eat, so do you and the kids. He has to go to work, and working with a gun is all he knows. He'll leave a trail. We'll find him. Jimmy, what have they done to the children? Where's Jimmy? They've taken care of him. That's more than you did. Where's your other boy, Vance? With Max. Max has him. Oh, that's fine. You and Max ought to be real proud of yourselves. 
I had to see him. You know that. I had to see Mac. Has he got a gun? Has he? Yes. Has he used it? No. He just thought he might need it. He hasn't hurt anyone. I swear it. You helped him escape. Is that right? You helped him. He needed help. I met him at San Rafael. We drove all night. He didn't hurt anyone, Joe. He hasn't hurt anyone. Where is he now? Where is he? All right, Dorothy, we'll find him. So, if I tell you, if I tell you, will you go alone? I can show you the way. Will you go alone? Yeah. All right. I'll take you to him, Joe. I trust you. Yeah, I trusted him once, too. 5 p.m., Monday, April 25th. Dorothy Tyler, Ben, and I got in the car and headed north to the coast town of Santa Maria. Acting under orders of Chief of Detectives Thad Brown, Larry Thompson from Robbery Detail followed in another car. Holland and Grayson from the State Adult Authority were with him. It was 10 minutes past 8 when we drove through the town of Santa Maria. Just outside the city, Dorothy Tyler directed us to turn off onto a dirt road. We drove about two miles. She told us to pull up. Across that field. Shacked by those trees. Alone they are here. I'll go with you, Joe. Maybe Max won't understand. No, you stay here. Joe, that car. Can I stop to you? It's cops, Dorothy. It had to be. They won't shoot unless Max does. But you promised. You said you'd go alone. I'll go alone. Friday? Hello, Grayson. Where is he? She tell you? That shack over there across the field by that clump of trees. He's got one of the kids with him, that right? Yeah. He won't be in any trouble. He's armed. The con's up at Quentin. Say he won't be taken alive. They say he'll shoot it out. They talk a lot. You better let us take him. You're not getting paid to do for this one. I'll take him alone. I made a promise. That guy in the shack's in the habit of breaking promises. I keep mine. Keep an eye on Miss Tyler, will you, Ben? Thompson's watching her. I'm coming with you. I told her I'd go alone. Two doors, front and back. Which one are you going in? Front. I'll be around back. Careful, Joe. Yeah. I'll be right back, Grayson. I started to cross the field. Shack was about 100 yards from the road. The field was uncultivated, and I wasn't sure of my footing. I stumbled over a tree stump. Halfway across the field, the lights in the shack went out. Who's that? Who is it? It's me, Max. Joe Friday. Max? Come on, open up. All right, Max. Why the gun, Joe? I never thought you'd take me with a gun. I never thought I'd have to kick down a door to get you. You've changed a lot, Max. How'd you find me, Dorothy, tell you? Where is she? Outside. Your boy over there, Vance. He's sleeping. He's okay. Put out your hands. Put out your hands. Oh. I'm sorry, Joe. Yeah. You, you've been good to us. I won't try to explain. Neither will I, Max. Come on. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 2nd, trial was held in Superior Court, city and county of Marin, state of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to Fatima. Here are the actual figures. New York Division. Fatima sales up 132%. Los Angeles Division. Fatima sales up 545%. St. Louis Division. Fatima sales up 548%. Yes, in 1949, more and more smokers discovered that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. They found Fatima extra mild. They found Fatima has a much different, much better flavor. They found the name Fatima means the best in cigarette quality. 
In 1950, enjoy Fatima yourself. Best of all long cigarettes. Max Tyler pleaded guilty to the charge of escape and was sentenced to the term as prescribed by law. He was returned to San Quentin and then transferred to Folsom Penitentiary, where he is now serving his sentence. You have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of our acting chief of police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Dragnet honors the state of California and the men of the California Highway Patrol, another of America's outstanding law enforcement agencies. One of these men, Highway Patrol Commissioner Clifford E. Peterson, outstanding administrator and educator in the field of law enforcement, dedicates his life to making yours more secure. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Be sure to hear Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman in the Halls of Ivy starting tomorrow on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes. Best of all long cigarettes brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to Narcotics Bureau. A vicious criminal has resumed operations in your city. His profession, dealer in narcotics. You know his name. You know he's guilty. Your job, prove it. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers, coast to coast. So, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, From crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, January 21st. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of Narcotics Bureau. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back into work, and it was 3.49 p.m. when I got to the main lobby of the city hall, the public phone booth. Hello? Oh, Ma, this is Joe. Joseph, you said you were going to be home at 4 o'clock. Oh, I couldn't help it, Ma. They changed the schedule. I, I got my stuff all right. Thanks for packing it. Yeah, I got them. Got them off the clothesline right after you called. They were quite dry, or I would have packed them for you. I got them all right. Listen, Ma, I'll call you whenever I get the chance, and I don't worry. How long are you going to be gone? I haven't any idea. Maybe a month. All depends. How can I get in touch with you? You can't. Call Ben. He'll get the message to me somehow. Where is it you're going, Joseph? Well, I'm not going anyplace, Ma. I'll be right here in the city, but I just won't be able to come home for a little while. It's a special job. No, like the last time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you be careful now. Watch what you order when you're eating out in those awful restaurants yes. and get your rest. Yes, you ma'am. You need plenty of rest. Yeah, okay, ma. I'll be all right. I wish 
shopping today. I bought a nice loin roast for dinner tomorrow night. Now you won't be here. Well, why don't you invite the neighbors over? The Newtons? That'd be good company for you. Well, maybe I'll ask your Aunt Elizabeth over. Yeah. Now, don't worry. If you want to get in touch with me, you deliver the message to Ben, okay? Yes. All right. What kind of work you be doing? Is it going to be dangerous? Oh, it's just another job, Ma. It'll work out. I'll call you when I can. All right, Joseph. Be careful now. Take care of yourself. Yeah, you too. Goodbye, Ma. Bye, I left the phone booth and started down the corridor. I went up a short flight of stairs and turned left. The afternoon crowd in the city hall seemed heavier than usual. I walked past the elevators and turned right down another corridor. It was 3.58 p.m. And I got to room 24, Narcotics Bureau. Captain White. Hi, Joe. You want to take these? Yeah, sure. My badge. Okay. There's all my identification and my gun. Right. I'll take care of them for you. These uh, clothes look all right? Just a minute. Now, let's see. Yeah. I don't like that tie. Romero. Yes, Gibber? Let's see your tie. Yeah, swap with Friday, will you, Ben? Oh, Christmas tie is pretty loud. Mine's not. That's the idea. Here. Here's some stuff to carry in your pocket. Social security card, ID card, all made out to Joe Kyber. Mm -hmm. uh, some book matches from St. Louis, a couple from Reno, Nevada. Okay. You pick up another gun? I loaned him my 25 automatic. It's small. It's easy to carry. Suit yourself. I don't have to tell you to be careful. No. It's a chance we've been waiting for, Joe. A lot depends on you. I'll do what I can. Just one thing I want to tell you. Take your time. Take all the time you need. Don't push it. I understand. No time limit. Your time's up when they find out who you are. Captain Lynn White and I left the Narcotics Bureau together with Ben and Johnny Bingham. We went down the hall to the office of Chief of Detectives Thad Brown. As in most major narcotic cases, the plan involved the coordinated work of all three offices, the federal, state, and our own local bureau. The operation involved a great many men and a lot of time. When we got to the chief of detectives' office, two men were with him. Bill Craig, the agent in charge of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics for the Southern California area, and Inspector Virgil Beckner, head of the State Narcotics Bureau for our district. All of us had one common goal, the apprehension and conviction of two men, Arthur Belmont and Ralph Costello. The first man on the list, Ralph Costello. Chief Brown outlined the overall plan. Craig, your federal men have been tracking Costello off and on for three years now. Beck's of your state agents. Same for our men. This time we can't afford to miss. You figure an undercover man working locally? Is that right, Chief? Yeah, Greg. You start right from the bottom, work up the line till he gets to Costello if he gets there. Beck, where are you going to start? Uh, Kevin White, would you lay it out to Beck and Greg? Yeah. Friday here is going to handle the job. He's got his full instructions. Joe, you want to fill him in? All right. I'll make my first contact tonight. I'll meet in a bar down on South Pico with another one of our undercover men, Benny Arredondo. He'll introduce me as Joe Kyber to one of his informants. The informant is supposed to help get me into the Flats gang. The same bunch running on the south end of town? Yeah, small-time peddlers. Be curious. A little bit of everything. Go on, Friday. When I get in the gang, I run with them until I find out where and how they make their buys. And after you get a contact, you make buys all the way up the line and get as close as you can to the top. Yeah, that's right. You worked out your contact with us? He knows that under no conditions will he be seen around the department here. It's been set up that... I have a hotel room lined up down on the east side. Romero here and Captain White will be my only contact with the office. I'll be using the name Joe Kyber. Sounds all right to me. How about you, Craig? How about that informant, Friday? Can you count on him? Arredondo thinks a lot of him. He says he's a good man. He's the first rung on the ladder. He's got to be solid. Well, if he's not, we won't have far to fall. Depends on how you look at it. You can kill yourself in the bathtub. 8 p.m. Thursday, January 21st. I checked in at the Casino Hotel on Terminal Street. I registered as Joe Kyber, Omaha, Nebraska. I was given the key for room five. The rent was $7 a week. I unpacked a few things I had in my bag, went down the hall and took a shower. I went down to the lunchroom on the corner. I had an egg sandwich and a cup of coffee. It was 11.18 p.m. when I walked into Blue Wright's Bar and Grill. I ordered a beer and sat down. I watched the missing persons program on the television set above the bar. Hello, somebody, Kyber? Hello, Benny. Been here long? I just got here. Where's your boy? Sitting over there with that fellow in the blue suit. 
Name's Gene. Who is the guy in the blue suit? More of the flash gang. Hmm. Gene's lining up your introduction now. The guy's name is Ludwig. I call him Lud. He knows me as Steve. Right. What do we do? Sit tight till Gene gives us the word. The tie yours looks like it's on fire. It'd look all right? I wouldn't wear it. Lud would. Get in the hotel, okay? Yeah, all set. Room five. Gene wants us. Let's go. Okay. Hi, Steve. See so your boy got here. Yeah. Gene, meet Joe Kyber. Hi. This is Lud. Joe Kyber? Lud. Sit down. You like the fights, Kyber? Yeah. They got nothing out here in that line. I used to go to the garden when I was east. I got some fine cards at the Legion. Where? Hollywood Legion, Friday night. Some classy-looking fighters out there. Where is that? Out in Hollywood. Nice little stadium. Yeah. I'd like to go with you sometime. Tomorrow? I got a date. Maybe next week. Bring her along. A lot of women go. Not this one. Okay. Are you guys hungry? I could eat. Yeah. Joe? Sure. How about here? Nobody eats here. Well, steam table over there. This stuff smells pretty good. So does garbage if the wind's blowing the other way. Let's get a fresh dip sandwich, huh? How about Galbraith over on Sotelo? Okay. How about you guys? Sure. Well, let's go. All right. You from the east, Kyber? Omaha, Memphis, all around. Yeah. You don't talk very much. You do. You talk tough. Are you tough? Sometimes. This place we're going to go eat, sometimes the meat's tough, too. Yeah? Just like a piece of tough meat, you can always cut it down to size. The following week at the fights, I met some of the other members of the Flats gang. They were a typical group of hoodlums. Unlike fiction writers have portrayed them, generally gangs of this type do not operate under a gang leader. Each member considers himself the best of the lot. For all practical purposes, they didn't need a leader. But as in any group, some men are more dominant than others. Ludd was one of these. Because of his tough manner, I observed that the gang members placed confidence in Ludd. It was then that I decided that I had to be tougher than he was if the gang was going to accept me. Five weeks went by, March 7th. There was still no mention by any of them that they were either using or dealing in narcotics. Come on in, Kyber. Sit down. Ludd? Kyber, meet Jerry Phil. Hi. I picked up the tickets for the basketball game tonight. Good seats? Yeah, they look okay. You got an extra, Doki? Maybe I tag along. Yeah, we got four. You look kind of sad, Cap. He always looks that way. First he was tough, now he's sad. Well, you and that mouth, you know it all, don't you? No offense, you look a little low. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, Cap, but I'm a little on the par. I'm going to have myself a pop. You interested? No, I don't use it. Why don't you try it? You might get a kick out of it. I have. It's all right going up, but it's nothing coming down. That's where you make a mistake. Stay up. Don't come down. Hell up. You heard what he said, Jerry. You don't like it. How does he know? He never stayed up long enough. Take your pop and shut up. You talk about Kyber trying to be tough, you think you're the big wheel around here. That's enough. But quit giving orders, Lud. You know better than the rest. Look, little man, knock off that kind of talk and keep us both happy. Sure, sure. The boss, man. You know, I got one positive way to shut you. Well, why don't you two quit? This huh? concerns me and Phil. You keep your mouth shut. Well, don't get mad at me. I only wanted to save an argument. Canada, I said. Now, look, big mouth, you can push Phil around, but not me. Now you're playing the tough guy again, ain't you? Why don't you go over there and sit down, huh? You sit me down, punk. <coughs> All right, now listen to me, both of you. I'm tired of being talked down to like a junior member of the firm. You either treat me equal or leave me alone. You understand? <laughs> you had it coming, Lord. <laughs> Yeah. I'll put that bottle down, Lud. Where'd you get that gun? You carry that thing right along? Right along. Put it down, Lud. Okay. I'm long on memory, Cabot. Remember that. Yeah, and I'm real short on patience with you. Well, I still ain't had my pop. <laughs> Better hurry. I don't want to miss the game. You got good seats, sir, Cabot. They're not too low. I can't see nothing if they're too low. Don't worry. You'll be high enough. <laughs> Two months went by. By playing the tough guy, I gained a great deal of prestige in the eyes of the other gang members. Jerry Fell made sure that all the members heard about that episode up in Ludd's room. Dealers and users of narcotics rarely carry guns. The members of the Flats gang were small-time peddlers and users. They're referred to as mules or small fry. When they found that I carried a gun at all times, they were impressed. They considered me one of them. Since the very beginning of my undercover work, I met weekly with Ben Romero and Captain Lynn White of the Narcotics Bureau. 
I would be picked up at a different location each time, making sure that I wasn't followed, and we would remain in the car and drive around in a remote section of the city, discussing my progress with the gang. During this first three-month period, under the pretext that I had clients to furnish, I made two small narcotics buys, one for $13 and one for $8. As soon as the purchases were made, I would mark them for identification, contact Ben, and then turn the narcotics over to him to be booked as evidence by the property clerk at Central Division. Another month went by. Thursday, June 5th, 11 p.m. We had just returned from the midget auto races and we were sitting around in Lud's room. You mentioned something out at the races, Carbon. Now what's on your mind? I told you, Lud, I need a half a dozen caps right away. I got people putting the bite on me. Old customers. How old can they be? You've only been out here five months, remember? When they're hooked, they get to be old customers in a month. I fixed up two buys with Morse for you. Tony says he can't handle anymore. Hasn't got enough around. You got on board late, you know. All of us are ahead of you. Tony can get more. Who's his source? A couple of guys. I know him. How about an office to win them? You deal with Tony. You said he hasn't got enough. That's right, I did. Okay. How much do you want? They're your customers. What's it worth? They'll pay. What's the guy's name? Costello's one of them. He'll have enough for you. Who's the other guy? He'll deal with Costello for now. Where can I meet him? Morse will set it up for you. I got to meet him in an hour. Come in. Police officers, shake it down, down the hall. What's the trouble? Checking for a robbery suspect. Find anything, George? Rose clean. We don't know anything about a heist. You'll have to come downtown and answer a few questions. What's the matter with you, fellow? You look like we spoiled your party. Yeah, you spoiled it. are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. Now, here's an authentic report from Fatima Cigarettes. In 1949, Fatima more than doubled its smokers from coast to coast. In 1950, enjoy Fatima yourself. You'll find Fatima extra mild. Because Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. You'll find Fatima tastes much better. Fatima's superb blend gives you a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. You'll find Fatima best in cigarette quality. Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. For a new year of greater smoking enjoyment, buy Fatima in the appealing golden yellow package. You'll agree, Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. The chance of my being picked up while working on an undercover assignment was one which all of us had considered. Since only a handful of men out of some 5,000 working police officers in the department knew anything about our narcotics investigation, we knew that such an occurrence was not impossible. It's one of the chances we had to take. In this instance, we lost, and the critical meeting with one of the men we were after was forestalled. How long our detention at police headquarters would delay my meeting with Ralph Costello was anybody's guess. Could mean weeks or maybe months. I was booked on suspicion of 211 PC, Robert. So was Lud. The next afternoon, I was taken from cell block 10D2 to the interrogation room. Come on in and sit down, Kyber. How are you, Friday? It's a tight squeeze. The booking number's been canceled, Joe. Prince been stopped. Those two men from robbery who pulled me in, Wynn and Donahoe, well, I thought I was in trouble for a minute. They had no idea you were in that room. Once they got up there, they had to follow through. Well, they played it right. They remembered their etiquette. If either one of them had said hello before you did, you might have been in big trouble. Well, I'm in big trouble anyway. I had a meet all set with Costello. Almost set, anyway. It's just a case of bad timing in that pickup, hmm? Well, if they'd have got there two hours later, it might have been different. Well, how do you stand now? How close are you to Costello? I need some more money. I got to pay off Lud. And he'll take you to Costello if you pay the right price? Yeah. Lud's working through Morris. You know about him. Remember, Friday, if there's any questions when you get back to that gang, you were booked for CCW. You're out on bail. Yeah. I got, I got you another gun, Joe. 32 automatic. Okay? Yeah, thanks. I couldn't go back with the same one. Uh, what about the federal and state men? How are they doing? Pretty good. Federal men picked up Costello in Fresno. He was connected with the sale of six cans of H. Mm-hmm. Not much heroin up there. No wonder Lud can afford to hold me up. He knows there's a shortage down here. Case isn't too strong against him. When it looked definite that we had him, they were going to call you off. He's out on bail. Costello's back down here now. Yeah. 
Seems like we get our hands on the guy, but we can't hold him. Narcotics in their possession are under their control. That's what the book says. That's the way we got to get him. We'll get him that way. It's up to you now, Friday. Stay with it and keep your chin covered. Well, if you need anything, Joe, call. Your mother's been over at the house for dinner a few times. She's okay. Thanks. Tell her I'm all right, will you? Sure. She worries a lot about you, Joe. Anything happened to you, and just about kill her. That makes two of us. I'll see you. Before I left the city hall, Captain White drew out some more money from the Secret Service Fund. This fund is for the sole purpose of undercover work. This latest amount was for the narcotics buy that I hoped to make with Ralph Costello. An hour before I left, Ludd was released on a writ that he had arranged for. Saturday, June 7th, 9 a.m., I checked back into my room at the casino hotel. During the three weeks that followed, I kept asking Ludd to arrange a meeting for me with Tony Morse, the next man on the ladder on the way up to Costello. Ludd kept stalling me. Another week went by. Captain Lynn White, Ben, and I held our regular weekly meetings. On July 6th, Ludd told me that a meeting with Morse had finally been arranged for 8 p.m. that night. I called Ben and told him I'd meet him and the captain immediately after I talked with Morse. At 8 p.m., following the instructions Ludd had given me, I was in the downstairs waiting room at the subway terminal at 5th and Hill. I was told to wait for the apple vending machine. Excuse me, mister. Oh, yeah, sure. Kyber? Yeah, you Morse? That's right. Want an apple? No, no thanks. Come on, sit down. All right. Now, what'd you have in mind? I got a couple of hundred bucks to spend. Can you handle it? Who sent you? You know who sent me. Sure I do. I just want to hear you say it. Ludd. We can handle it. What'd you have in mind? I said $200 worth. That's 40 caps. We got it. None of that Mexican junk. I want European stuff. You bought before. You'll take what we got. That last buy I made through Ludd, the junk was cut to nothing. You can only use so much milk or sugar, you know. By the time it got to you, it was probably cut pretty thin. So was the price you paid for it. I'm not looking for bargains. I pushed to good people. I want good stuff. You'll do better this time. You're not dealing with Ludd. Sure, we cut it. No more than anybody else. Not as much as Ludd. When can I get it? You got some sick people? Couple. Have it for you in an hour. Where's the meat? Got a watch? Yeah. What time you got? Twelve minutes after eight. Add a minute. Make it thirteen after. Okay. An hour from now. Nine thirteen. Meet Ludd at Macy in Brooklyn on the corner. He'll tell you what to do. Will Ludd have it? Meet Ludd at nine thirteen. See you later, Kimer. Oh, wait a minute. How do I know you're leveling? How do we know you are? <laughs> I went out the front of the subway terminal building. I took a cab down to 7th and Main. I got off and walked into Pop Sherman's bar. I called the office and set up a meeting with Ben and the captain. I ordered a beer, paid for it, left my change in the bar, asked the bartender to watch it, told him I'd be right back. I went out the back way, crossed the alley, and got down to Los Angeles Street. I walked up to 9th and picked up a cab to take me to Fulton and Covina Avenue. I got out and walked two blocks. It was 8.41. Joe? Hi. You meet Morse? Yeah. Sure nobody tailed you? I took all the precautions. What's the set up? I'm not sure, and I don't have much time. I'm going to make the bye tonight. When? 9.13. You don't have much time. Kind of rushing it, aren't they? I figured I'd better play along. Who's the meet with? Morse told me to meet Ludd at Macy in Brooklyn. Said that he'd carry it from there. Costello in on it? I don't know. You got it all. All right. We'll start picking up the flats, gang. Everyone but Ludd. What do you think? Well, the way I got it figured, Morse is Costello's runner. He checked me out, and as far as I could tell, he thinks I'm okay. Yeah. I got a hunch Ludd's going to take me to either Morse again or Costello or possibly both. I don't know where the actual meet's going to be. That means a tail job. We'll have to pick you up at Macy in Brooklyn and stick with you until after Ludd leaves, if he does, and follow through with you. Figure it wide, Skipper. Don't worry. I know we're close. What time you got, Romero? Mm, ten minutes to nine. Turn down the next block. Right. Pull up here, Ben. Here you go, Friday. Keep your chin covered. Yep. <laughs> Hey. Hello, Phil. Friends of yours in the car? Why? I know them. They ain't friends of mine. I didn't say I knew them. I don't know the guy driving, but the other guy, I seen him lots. Just about four weeks ago, we all seen him. Huh? That fuzz, white, a narcotics man. Oh, yeah. Well, they've been riding me since they picked me up with a gun. Won't do, cop. Narcotics men ain't got nothing on you. That was robbery, remember? They got a make on me from Nebraska. Eh? They've been on me ever since I got here. That figures. You're one of them. 
All right, look, Jerry. I'll argue with you later. I'm in a hurry. I got to meet Lud. I tag along. I want to see Lud, too. You going to spill the Lud about what you think? Maybe. I think I owe it to him. I know him a lot longer than you. I know he ain't no cop. And you're sure that I am? I know you are. Let's see what Lud thinks. Yeah. All right, come on. On your feet. Get out. I looked at my watch. It was two minutes to nine. In 15 minutes, I had to meet Lud. I had to hit Jerry Fell. I couldn't take the chance of him getting to Lud before I did. I couldn't leave him. I couldn't take him with me. I pulled him to his feet and half dragged and half carried him two blocks before I spotted a patrolman. Hey, officer. Officer, over here. Yeah, what's the trouble? I'm Friday, Central Narcotics. Yeah. Take this man and get him downtown. Contact Chief Brown. He'll identify me. Serial number 2288. Friday, Narcotics. The suspect's name here is Jerry Fell. You got it? Yeah, you got some kind of identification? No, I haven't. Not a thing. It's a special duty. I'm sorry. I don't know you. I have to hold you till I call in. All right, but hurry, huh? Call box right here. This is Carlson, box 117. Check on a matter with uh, Chief of Detectives Brown, will you? Yeah, that's right. I have a man here who identifies himself as Friday. Uh, what's your first name? Joe, Joe Friday. Tell him to hurry. Yeah. Joe Friday, Central Narcotics, serial number 2288. Says he's in a hurry, holding a suspect, Jerry Fell. I'll hold on. You might watch this five after nine. What time you got? Mm, I got uh, six minutes after. It might be a little fast. Any cab stands around here? Four blocks up the street. Which way? That way. Yeah. Okay, I will. Thank you. Okay, Sergeant. Sorry to hold you up. Need any help? No, you just hang on to this guy. Don't let him go. I started to run. Macy in Brooklyn. Six blocks away, and I had eight minutes to make it. A narcotics buy is one date you're not late for. Either you're there at the specified time, or there's no deal. The veteran narcotics peddler knows that that's the only safe way for him to operate. A minute, one way or the other, could mean an arrest. I ran. Out of breath, Kyber. Anything wrong? No, the cab broke down. I didn't want to be late. Yeah, you got 40 seconds. That's cutting it pretty thin, but it'll do. Come on. All right. Right here. By this lamppost? I'd sit right in front of it. Don't move to the left or right. Stay put. They'll handle the rest. So long. Get in, Kyber. Got the money? Right here. Mm. Yeah, 200. Here's your package. Okay. That's it. Joe Kyber, meet Ralph Costello. Hi. Hello. Out this side, Kyber. Okay. I'll see you. Did you make the buy Friday? Yeah, take him. Hi, Joe. Ben, thought you were with the captain. They don't need me. That intersection's blocked off up there. They're pulling them over right now. See? Yeah. Uh -huh. They got him. Costello in the car? Yeah. And that's half of the team. Now what? We go after the big man, Arthur Belmont. Took us seven months and four days to get to Costello. Lots of time. Yeah. Always seems to work out that way, doesn't it? What's that? They always run out of time before we do. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 6th at 10.45 p.m., Ralph Costello was taken to the Narcotics Bureau, the interrogation room. In a moment, the results of that interrogation. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Smokers find Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. They find that Fatima is extra mild because it's the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. 
best of all long cigarettes. With the promise of the United States District Attorney that his prison terms for the possession and sale of narcotics would run concurrently rather than consecutively, Ralph Costello agreed to furnish us vital information concerning the number one narcotics dealer on the Pacific Coast, Arthur Belmont. Next week, the big man, Arthur Belmont. You have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Hear Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman in the Halls of Ivy tomorrow evening on NBC. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, October 27th. It was cloudy in Los Angeles. We're working a night watch on a homicide detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Pat Brown, chief detective. My name's Friday. We were on the way out from Central Division, and it was 15 minutes past 8 p.m. when we got to South Peoria Street. Number 267. So gloomy, uh, uh, Sophie. Looks like we're in for some rain. Yes, sir? Police officer. Lieutenant Barker here. Yes, you want to come in? Thank you. This is Sergeant Romero. I'm Sergeant Friday, Central Homicide. How are you? My name's Sergeant Emerson. Lieutenant Barker's in here. Uh, on the phone now. Yeah. I'll listen. Hey, Romero, Friday. How's it going, Lieutenant? Not good. You met Mr. Jimerson? Oh, sure. Sit down, gentlemen. Would you like some coffee? I can have no, the right thing. No, thank you. We didn't want to bother the girl's parents any more than we had to. Jimerson here is one of the neighbors. He's been nice enough to let us use his phone. The kid disappeared about 4 this afternoon, is that right? At 3.45. Got out a local broadcast on him. Here's a missing report. Thelma <laughs> Griswold, age 11. Barbara Sperry, 7-year-old. He talked to both families. Yeah. At 3.30 this afternoon, Mrs. Griswold sent her daughter to the grocery store down on Sycamore Avenue. It's about 10 blocks from their home. The um, Sperry girl, a friend of hers, she went with her. Anybody at the store remember seeing them? According to the grocery clerk, they were there about 3.45. Mother gave the kids a note. She bought a loaf of white bread and half pound of bacon, doesn't mind. Yeah. That's right, Sergeant. I hope nothing's happened to the kids. We've been neighbors to the good world for years. Very true. Did you notice if the little girls were going in the direction of their home? Yes, they were. The last time I saw them, they were about a block away, heading straight for home. Little Sperry girl had a dog with her. Camp, I think they call him. He's a collar. He's missing, too. That's right, Joe. Not a trace of the kids or the dog. Juvenile officers from 77th Street have been checking the neighborhood for the past three hours. And are the girls in the habit of wandering off like this? Don't say no. It's the first time. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Jimerson. Well, not at all, Sergeant. So you won't have a cup of coffee? No, no, thanks. We don't like to bother you, but we may have to check back with you later tonight. Routine questions. If I can help out in any way to find those girls, let me know. Yeah, we'll let you know, Jim. Thanks again. Nice fellow. Most of the neighbors we talked to have been the same. Anxious to help. Some of them are out with our juvenile officers now trying to dig up a lead on the kids. Can you check the movie theater and the playgrounds in the neighborhood? Everything's going. Those are some of your men from juvenile, Lieutenant? Yeah, looks like it. Yeah, Schwartz and Preston. Huh? Yeah, Preston, what you got? Found a kid's jock, Tully. Where? Just about sank his drive up in the hills. Hope it's no indication. How do you mean? Dog's dead. 
collie dog was taken to a veterinarian on Jefferson Boulevard to be examined for cause of death. We put in a call to the office and a special detail of men was assigned to aid in searching the area where the dog was discovered. We got out an all-points bulletin. The fathers of the missing girls and a dozen neighbors joined in the search. With the aid of flashlights, we started from the end of Banks' Drive, and as best we could, we covered the ground for almost a full mile back into the Sunset Hills. 10.55 p.m. started to thunder. The search went on. The hilly terrain and thick patches of scrub oak didn't make the job any easier. 11.15 p.m. started to rain. What's your tip, Bill? A rock or slip, I see. I can't figure it. Not a sign. What do you think? Wait a minute. Flash the light over here. No, here. See something? I thought I did. Yeah. Scrap of brown paper. Who's this come? Sergeant. Is that you? Oh, Jimerson? Yeah. What's that you got? I found it. Right down there. Just off the path. Paper stack. Look. Uh, Loaf of bread. Three oranges. Package of bacon. Where'd you find it? Right down there. Mr. Home questioned me. We were... Heading back to the cars when I saw this bag lying to one side of the bus. We'll take the service. Thanks. Let's go, Mr. That means that Bob and Tom were up here today. You yeah. haven't mentioned that to me. They wanted to grow fathers. No, I haven't. Good. They're having a hard enough time as it is. Friday? Okay. See him for a minute? Yeah. Excuse me, Mr. Timmons. Certainly. Yeah. Schwartz and I checked with the vet who examined the dog. What did he say? Says the dog was beaten to death. We made another attempt to continue the search of the Sunset Hills area for the two missing girls, but the heavy rain and the darkness made the job impossible. The rain had also destroyed the physical evidence at the spot where we had found the grocery bag. We went back to Jimerson's house and called the office again. Another detail of men was assigned to be on hand to help in the search when it resumed at daylight. Chief of Detectives Thad Brown and Captain Harry Elliott of Homicide were notified of late developments. At 25 minutes past midnight, we started to retrace the steps of the two missing girls from the time they left their homes at 3.30 the afternoon before. We covered every foot of ground along the route which the girls reportedly took on their way to the grocery store. We got the grocery clerk out of bed and interviewed him again. We talked with two elderly ladies in the neighborhood who said that they had seen the missing children between 3 and 4 p.m. the previous afternoon. They could add nothing to what Jimerson had already told us. 3.30 a.m. was still raining hard. We drove back to South Peoria Street and sat in the car. The lights were still burning in the homes of the missing youngsters, the Griswolds, and the Spares. Jimerson asked us in for coffee again. This time we accepted. We went in and sat around the kitchen table. Glenn Chandler and Stendhal from Homicide, Lieutenant Barker, Ben, and myself. Emerson's wife made the coffee. There wasn't much talking. You want more coffee? Huh? Oh, oh yeah. Well, thank you, Miss Emerson. Uh, thank you. You want some more? No, thanks. It's fine. You want some more coffee? Is that all, sir? Sure, Lieutenant. Plenty. Go ahead. Fill the sugar bowl. Will you hand me empty? There isn't any more. You never do things right. I told you to get some at the store today. You told me? Yeah, that's all right, Jimerson. Never use it anyway. Right. You never do anything right. All right, Amy. Go to bed. Feel a little upset. Not feeling too well. I guess we'd better be going, Jimerson. Thanks. No, that's all right, Sergeant. She didn't mean you. It's this whole thing, I guess. Got everybody on edge. There's still a chance it may be all right. How do we explain the bag of groceries we found back in the hill? And the dog. If anybody's hurt those kids, we'll take care of them right here in this neighborhood. You'll get what's coming to us. Somebody at your back door. Oh, yeah, dog. Sergeant Friday here? Yes, yes, sir. Come on. Uh, Sergeant. All right, Tom. All right. What do you got? Mr. Briswell, Joe. Sure you'd like to have you come and talk to him. Says he'll make his wife feel better. All broken up. Sure. Come on, Ben. We'll be over to Griswold, Lieutenant. All right. Thank you for the coffee, Jim. Not at all. If you get a chance, tell Griswold how sorry everybody is. We'll help all we can. Sure. Bad night. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Mother's trying to get a little sleep. Father's still sitting up. There he is, by the window. Yeah. Oh, uh, this is the grizzled home. Go ahead, son. Yeah. They're going to ask court? What are we going to tell them? I don't know. I could be all right. They could do funny things sometimes, maybe. But they don't murder their pet dog. <laughs> Doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer, the police officer comes to realize that there's only so much that can be learned from his book. Time and experience make up the rest. The police manual contains no stock answers for the grieving wife who has just lost a husband in an auto accident. No firm but polite reply to the belligerent motorist and at a traffic tag. No words of reassurance for the short parents of missing girls, ages 11 and 7. Whether it's trapping criminals or comforting parents, you find the right answer the hard way. There isn't any other way. We sat and talked to the Griswolds for a full hour. We didn't tell them about the dog or the bag of groceries. Until the fate of the two little girls was definitely decided, we figured giving them the information would serve no purpose except to add to their word. Five minutes past 5 a.m., almost a full hour until daylight. It was still raining. George? Maybe the officers would like some rest. No, thank you, Tony, Miss Griswold. We had some sandwiches about an hour ago. Sure, I can't fix you something. No trouble. No, sir. Thanks, anyway. Terrible night. Sam. And now, Helen, just just a little while longer, we'll we'll find the girls. It'll be daylight soon. Uh, Miss Griswold, some of your neighbors tell us that there were two strangers here in the neighborhood this afternoon. Yes, yeah. but that was earlier. Mrs. Nelson next door and I was talking about. One was the gardener looking for work. The other one was starting to work. What time were they around, man? Folks here went here about noon. The gardener was about two o'clock. Mm-hmm. How is your daughter about strangers? Does she make friends easily? No, yeah, not at all. Tell me very careful about that. She's going to go with strangers, I'm sure. Why do you ask that question, Sergeant? You found out something? No, sir. No, we haven't. It's just a routine check, that's all. I understand that. Hey, girl. I don't know. I'm telling you something must have happened. I know. No, no, Helen. We're doing fine. Don't let down now. Joe, hmm? Sergeant's car just pulled up outside. Thanks, Sergeant. Ben? Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Griswold. Mr. Griswold. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Here, let, let me show you the door. We'll meet at the end of Sanchez Drive, Mr. Griswold, about 6 a.m. It should be light enough by then. Oh, all right. Oh, uh, Sergeant. There is a chance, isn't there? Girls are all right. There's a good chance. You try not to worry. Come on, Ben. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tom, you want to check with Barker again and see if any of his men have a line on the two men here in the neighborhood yet? Right. You want us, we'll be in Pat Brown's car. All right, sir. What time is that, Jim? Uh, 20 to 6. It's getting light, though. Yeah. Let's get out of this ring. Hello, Sergeant. Hello, Sergeant. Gentlemen, you look a little wet. Yeah, you could stand a dry pair of shoes. Still no trace of the kids? You heard about the dog with the bag of groceries. Yeah. Nothing else, Simpson? No. It'll be light in a couple of minutes, and we'll start searching the hills again. I ordered up another detailed men to help us park up on Sanchez Drive, Captain Elliott's with them. Good. We can use all the help we can get. That's rough terrain. There's a lot of ground to cover up there. Did you talk to everybody in the neighborhood? Yeah. Parents, too. Did they help you much? Well, they told us there were two strangers in the neighborhood before the girls disappeared. We're having them checked out. Yeah. Griswold thinks the kids would be safe on that town. He says his daughter's afraid of strangers. Never goes near them. Mm-hmm. How much areas you fell in the hills last night? About four miles, did you say, Dan? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sorry, from Sanchez Drive, straight back into the brush. It wasn't too sorry, not enough men, not enough life. Well, you got plenty of both right now. Ten minutes past six a.m. on Tuesday, October 28th. The search of the Sunset Hills area was resumed. 150 officers spread out over a two-square-mile area with orders to probe every foot of ground. With them were almost 50 volunteers from the neighborhood. The rain fell to a cold, steady downpour. The mud was ankle deep. 8.30 a.m., no sign of the missing youngsters. 10.30, still no sign. Search 
this went on. A neighborhood restaurant owner sent out five gallon jugs of hot coffee for members of the searching party. After six continuous hours combing the hill, still no results. Keith Brown, Ben, and I went to the car for a cup of coffee and a cigarette. Cut me, beat. Those kids wanted off. They had to come in this direction. Well, they couldn't have headed toward town. Somebody would have noticed them, sure. Yeah. No leads at all on that ATV you sent out? Two. They both fizzled. The youngsters up in those hills someplace. Gotta be. You two ready? Yeah. Let's go. Two dozen fizzles. Two square miles. We've been over it twice. We'll go over it again. Find them. Thelma Griswold, age 11. Barbara Sperry, age 7. Tuesday, October 28th, 2 p.m. They were still missing. Another detail of men from Metropolitan Division were dispatched to aid in the hunt. The daily newspapers played the story across the front page. Wire services bulletin the news across the country. Radio newscasters covered the story at the scene. On South Peoria Street, the two mothers sat in their homes and waited. The search went on. It stopped raining. Did you cover that back behind the bush over there, Joe? Yeah, I'm Yeah, yeah. Let's swing up this way. All right. Anything? No, nothing. All right, come on. It's almost 2.30. Yeah, too much coffee. Sour stomach. Me too. You got a cigarette on my own. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. All right. All right. What's that? What do you got? What is it? Supposed to be all our fault, letting the psychos run loose. No, we don't make the laws, we enforce them. 
Marshal, we got something to work with. Laws with teeth in them. These atrocities are going to go on. Nobody seems to care. We pick them up, we serve a few days, pay a fine, and they walk out of here. Nobody cares. You sure pity them. Don't cure them. Nature played a trick on them. Feel sorry for them until they kill a kid. Not a firm law to cover them as they are. Just to wait till they murder somebody. We've got a better law for mad dogs. We don't let them run loose till they bite somebody. Those two little girls have to prove something. How's the parents making out? What you might expect. Shock. Uh, excuse me. Hello, Siggy. Who? Uh, Sunderman. Handler. Here's somebody's questioning that bunch we brought in yesterday. Oh, Chief. Ben, Joe. How many possibles, Glenn? None. All we had left established airtight alibi. We checked the registrations, gave them no releases. Where does that leave us? We start from scratch. I don't think so, Chief. You got a hunch? A little better than that, Joe. I'm sold. What do you mean? You said the parents told you the little girls were afraid of strangers, wouldn't go near them. Yeah, sir. You got the same reaction from some of the neighbors we talked to the day before yesterday. Yeah. Now we find out that all the known psychos in the area are clear, perfect alibi. Well, you think the killer couldn't have been a stranger to the little girls. That's right. There were only two strangers in the whole neighborhood the day the girls disappeared, the gardener and the salesman. Both of them have been checked and cleared. Mm-hmm. As far as we know, the little girls wouldn't have gone that far up in the hills alone of their own accord, and they wouldn't have gone with the strangers. They had to be lured there and by someone they knew. Any ideas? Could have been one of the neighbors. No, we checked every possible out there, Glenn. We questioned them a half a dozen times. So do I. There's one that might fit. Who's that? Claude Jimerson. <laughs> Glenn Chandler had been a veteran homicide officer before Ben and I joined the department. He was tall, quiet, and reserved. He had a good reason for everything he did, for everything he thought. The three of us sat down and tried to put the pieces together. Number one, Chandler uncovered a point that Ben and I have missed completely. Jimerson and his wife were not close friends of either the Sperry family or the Griswolds. For a near stranger, he showed an extraordinary interest in the welfare of the children after they disappeared. Number two, Ben and I discovered that Jimerson's wife had an eight-year-old boy by a previous marriage. The child did not live with him. Mrs. Jimerson told Chandler that her husband had been cruel to the boy. He refused to elaborate. Number three, Jimerson was the last person to see the children alive. Number four, the bodies of the children had been well hidden in the underbrush. Jimerson found them. Number five, Jimerson had bent over backwards to make friends with the investigating officers right from the start. If any veteran officer can tell you, that's not the usual attitude. At 8.30 a.m., Chandler, Ben, and I left the office. We spent the day taking back 15 years into Jimerson's life. We got back to the office just after midnight. Thursday, October 30th, 10 a.m. We checked in. Okay, Joe. Hey, come on, Ben. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Jimerson. Oh. How are you, Sergeant? Glad to see you. Sit down. Sorry to bother you, Jim. Not at all. Glad to help. Anything new turn up? You kill those two little girls. That's a funny thing to ask. Of course not. You know that. We ask everybody the same thing. Hope you're not offended. Oh, you're kind of surprised me. I didn't know. Did you kill those little girls? I don't understand. I told you no. Of course not. Just that question. Routine. Should you kill them? Now look, Sergeant. How many times do I have to tell you no? Sorry. You don't have any children, do you? No, we don't. No stepchildren. No, why? Before you moved out to South the area Street, you and the wife lived out in West L.A., didn't you? Shelton Avenue? Oh, yes, how'd you know? You recall a Mary Gibbs out there? Gibbs? No. Six-year-old girl, you were charged with molesting her. That was back in 1944. They were crazy, they never proved it. Before Shelton Avenue, you lived in Santa Monica. On 10th Street, is that right? Yes. It was an eight-year-old girl. Donna Hardware? That kid died, too. She asked me to fix her doll, buddy. I never went near her. What about your stepson? Why isn't he living with you? Why did your wife send him to live with your sister? Amy's crazy. I never harmed the boy. He didn't get along, that's all. He got on my nerves. You've had four jobs in the past five years. What were they? I don't know what you're talking about. You were a janitor at a grammar school down the south end of town, then a gardener at a children's playground, then you were a shoe salesman, children's shoes. Then you worked at another grammar school. What does all this mean, anyway? What are you getting at? Have you ever been in jail? Well, six months, there was some trouble. What kind of trouble? I didn't know what I was doing. I was drinking. I didn't mean to bother the kids. Well, 
That's all, Jameson. Routine question. Didn't go now. Oh, thanks. I hope you haven't got the wrong idea about me. I like children, that's all. Sure. Thanks for coming in. Not at all, Sergeant Annie. Anything I can do to help. Well, goodbye. Okay. Jameson, I almost forgot. There is one thing. Oh? Since you're the one who found the little girls, we'll have to have you identify the body. It won't take long. The more gets up is great. That's the blood. Well, I'd like to help you, but I got an appointment. All you have to do is look at him. It won't take you long. Come on, let's go. I'd like to help, Sergeant, but I don't take these things while I get sick. We'll make it fast. Not this way. I'm sorry, Sergeant. I don't think I'd better go. Just identify him. That's all. Don't take a minute. Maybe if we had a drink before we went in, you can have one after. And watch it. There's heavy traffic. Yeah, right. Mm. We'll have to wait. I need a drink. I can't go in that place without a drink. You'll be all right. Okay, let's go. Morgue's up this way. I can't look at him. I get sick. Don't make me. Nothing to it. You'll see. Here we are. Coming down the driveway is a shortcut. This way. Hi, Joe. Can I help you? Yeah, I see. Those little girls. Thelma Griswold. Barbara Sperry. Oh, yeah. This way. to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. Your 
detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. Sixteen persons have been robbed and beaten senseless. The victims describe the assailant as a tall, beautiful woman. Your job, stop her. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Ladies and gentlemen, next week marks the beginning of National Crime Prevention Week sponsored by your local police department. These seven days are set aside to call your attention to the fact that your police officer, to better ensure the safety of your community, relies on the cooperation of the individual citizen. We feel that crime prevention should be observed not seven, but 365 days a year. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, October 3rd. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. We were on the way over from the city hall, and it was 6.55 p.m. when we got to the county hospital, Ward 9800, room 12. This way, gentlemen. The third bed. Thank you. Here we are. Please try not to excite him. Sergeant, he's had a pretty hard time. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Make your visit as brief as possible. We will. Thanks. Mr. Maloney, how are you feeling? Not so good. You fellas doctors? No, sir. Police officers. This is Sergeant Romero. My name's Friday. Robbery detail. Oh, find out anything yet? Still checking, Mr. Maloney. We'd like to have you tell us exactly what happened night before that. Well, she sure had me fooled. That's all I can say. You're not the first one. Fifteen others ahead of you. Would you tell us what happened? Well, I left this shop a little after midnight, and I started to drive home. About Central Avenue. You work at Maloney's Steakhouse down on South Commercial, isn't that right? Yes, sir. My uncle owns the place. His name is Jay Brown Maloney. He knows a lot of cops. You know him? We met him this afternoon. Could you tell us what happened after you left work? Well, uh, I started to drive home out Central Avenue. I guess it must have been around 18th Street. I pu uh, would you push that pill up a little yes, bit? Yes, sir. I'll get it here. That was oh, nice. I pulled up for the arterial. I saw this gal standing on the corner. She was hitchhiking. Do you remember what she looked like, how she was dressed? Well, you know, kind of flashy, but nice clothes. Good-looking dame. Tall, long, blonde hair. Beautiful eyes. You are sure about the color of her hair? Yeah, yeah, it was blonde. And you offered her a ride? I didn't think there was anything wrong in it. I, I'm a married man, you know. I didn't think there was anything wrong. What happened then? Well, she got in the car and we drove off. We talked a while and she pulled a gun on me. Told me to drive up an alley. Where was that? Do you remember? Around 32nd Street and 32nd is Central. And then what? And she took my wallet, watch, car keys, everything I had. Mm -hmm. Then she made me get out of the car lay down on the street. I felt to shove that gun again. Can you fix that pillow? Yeah, you bet. Just lie still. There you are. I felt to shove that gun against me, and then she pulled the trigger, I guess. That's all I remember. You know what we call her slugging you? It must have happened after she shot me. Her face looks pretty bad, huh? You'll be all right, Mr. Maloney. You think you'd recognize the girl if you saw her again? I sure would. Nice looking, you know. Tall, blonde, 
beautiful shape. Doesn't figure, does it? What's that? And she's made more money on the stage than she would rolling guys like me. Must be crazy. Maybe. Would you look at these mug shots, Mr. Maloney, and see if any of these look like her? Let's see. They are. No. This one? No. How about uh, this one here? No. Let's see. No. All right. How about this one? No, uh, she was better looking. Uh -huh. Well, here's the last one. I don't know. This might be her. The hair was fixed right. Maybe, maybe a little more makeup. I'm not sure. All right, Mr. Maloney. Thank you. We'll be back to see you in a day or so when you're feeling better. Okay. Say, my name won't be in the papers, will it? No, sir. Not unless you give it to him. I was just wondering. The wife might not understand giving a girl a ride, you know? Yes, sir. We know. Well, thank you, Mr. Maloney. We'll be checking back with you later on. Okay, officer. I hope you get a line on that day. We're going to try. Goodbye. Sure messed up, isn't it? Yeah. That dame's got some other motive besides money. Psycho. Some kind of a sadist, maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> Find out what you wanted, Sergeant. Yes, we did. Thanks, nurse. What did the doctor say about Maloney? Is he going to be all right? Well, he had a severe beating, but he'll get over that all right. The bullet wound in the back. He'll recover, won't he? The bullet shattered part of the spinal cord. There was nothing the doctor could do. Yeah? Paraplegia. He'll never walk again. We left the county hospital, went back to the office, and got out a local broadcast for the woman whose mugshot Maloney had partially identified. Her name was Beverly Allen. She had a record of three arrests and one conviction of 240 PC, assault and battery. After we checked in the office, we went across the street to the crime lab. Lee Jones had already examined the bullet taken from Maloney's spine and the cartridge casing found at the scene of the shooting. Both of them bore the same markings as those which had wounded the two previous victims. From the striations, the gun had been previously identified as a 45 Colt. Maloney's car was examined. We found nothing. We went back to the city hall and checked in at the stats office. It was 8.35 p.m. Hi, right, Ethel. Make that run for us, yeah? Just a minute, Sergeant. How are you coming, Ethel? Fine here. Same old run. Back seven years on this one. Yeah, that's right. Did you get any more names? Thank you. Let me check the list for you. All right. One of the names and DR numbers on Caucasian women. Five feet to five feet eight, 115 to 130 pounds, 20 to 30 years, blonde or brunette, assault and battery, you know? He tracks rides and robs drivers, uses gun. Yeah, that's it. Here's what the machine turned out, 19 of them. Good. Here are the names. The uh, DR numbers opposite each one. Fine. Very new name? Be more than the last time. Anything else for tonight? No, that's it for now. Thanks a lot, Ethel. Let's go. Bad start. How's that? Well, 17 of these names we checked and cleared already. And the other two? Well, one's Catherine Collins. The other one's Beverly Allen. She might tie in. We've got nothing else to go on. You want to get to the record bureau and pull the packages on these two names? Yeah, okay. I'll check robbery and see if we have any calls. Huh? All right, Joe. Okay. Hi, Captain. Any calls for us? This one, Thad Brown, wants to see you. Oh, bad mood? Kind of. Wants me, too. Let's go. Fellow Maloney tell you anything? Nothing that helped much. Same old story. No reports on that broadcast we put out for that Beverly Allen? Not yet? No. Are you banking on it? First lead in 16 nights. Hmm. Here we are. Walker, Roddy, come in. How are you, boss? Sit down. Thank Take you. a look. Woman bandit gets 16th victim. Beautiful hold-up queen robs, shoots, restaurant worker. Yeah? It's on the editorial page, too. And something else. Memo from the chief. Here, letter from the downtown citizens committee. Another one, the civic club. 
We all want answers. Men are doing all they can, Chief. We got two other teams besides Friday and Romero working the case. Special squad from Metropolitan Division. There are two. I don't care what we've done. We've got to do more. 16 nights, 16 robberies, and three shootings. Three victims still in the hospital. When do we blow the whistle on it? We've checked out every possible lead, Chief. We've got a warrant out on one suspect. We're checking out another one. Talk to that man Maloney, the one she got last night. Well, what did he tell you? Not much more than the other 15 that she took. Descriptions still don't match in one respect. Well, how do you mean? Well, in 10 of the 16 cases we've had reported, the victims tagged the girl hitchhiker as a blonde, long hair. Four of them say she was a brunette with a short hairdo. Two of them tell us the girl had red hair, long. She's using wigs, that's what we figured. Checked every place in town where she could have rented or bought them. No leads. Uh, what about some of the bigger supply houses uh, out of town? We've started in checking them. It'll take a little time. And you've got practically nothing on the woman. Same gun, 45 Colt. Lee Jones examined the bullet they took out of Maloney's spine. Hmm. How's he doing? Oh, not good. The bullet smashed his spinal cord. His legs are paralyzed. When do we stop her? Yeah? Uh, Romero? Hi, Chief. Captain? What have you got? Well, the package is on two possibles in this woman hold-up thing. It's no good, Joe. Why not? What about that Allen Dane? Jail in Kansas City. We called him. Been in for a month. And the other one? Catherine Collins. I checked Seattle. Been in the hospital up there for the past three months, the TB ward. Where does that leave you, Friday? Right back where we started. No leads and no suspects. All right, Walker. Starting tonight, we cover every street and alley in the central area until we get that woman. The order of more men and more detectives from the Metropolitan Division. Right, Chief. Get out more decoy cars. Have the area covered from sundown till sunrise until further notice. Get that woman. Right. Come on, Joe. Yeah. Hot shot. I get it. Let's go. The name on his driver's license said William Gillespie. We found him 50 feet from the corner of Gatewood Alley and Cameron Street. His face and head bore the marks of a vicious beating. There was a single bullet wound in his left shoulder. He was conscious when we arrived. Chief of Detectives Brown, Captain Walker, and Ben checked the area for physical evidence. I spoke briefly with the victim before he was placed on a stretcher and carried to the ambulance. On the way, he lapsed into unconsciousness. I went over to where Ben was standing with Chief Brown and Captain Walker. Take a look, Joe. Captain found over there near the lamppost. Yeah, 45 shell casing, same as the others. How's Gillespie, Friday? Doc says he'll be all right. Badly beaten. Tough dame. She really works him over. I wonder what makes a woman do things like this. What makes a man do it? William Gillespie was taken to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. The shell casing, which we had found at the scene, was taken to Lee Jones at the crime lab for examination. It compared with the others. Jones confirmed that the markings on the bullet which had wounded Gillespie matched those on the bullet which had been taken from Maloney's bag. Both bullets had been fired from the same gun. The dragnet operation for the woman bandit went on. The men in the special detail covered every street and alley in the central area from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. the following morning. During the next five days, 11 suspects were picked up and brought in for questioning and released after the victims failed to identify any of them. Well, at least we've got her stopped temporarily. She hasn't pulled a caper for almost a week. Yeah, that doesn't bring us any closer to her. I don't know about you, but it's got me beat. 17 jobs, and she's as free today as she was before she started. Joe, Ben, what'd you find? Nothing. The last four women we questioned were clear. What about the other men on the case, Ed? Did they get anything? Baxter and Olson are down at the record bureau. Be in in a minute. They've been out talking to some of the victims again. Mm -hmm. Tough ones. I've been thinking. How about a composite picture? We got enough to work with? Artists in the crime lab's working up a couple of sketches now. Mm -hmm. A lot of guesswork. What about the descriptions of the clothes the girl wears? Anything there we could start on? No, other than the fact that she wears flashy clothes. Hi, Olson. Hi. Any luck? Not much. None of the victims have a very good idea what the dame looked like. Tall, good looking, nice figure, that's all. Nothing out of the ordinary, huh? Well, some of them said she had kind of an unusual voice. Soft, low, about all they could remember. Well, it's not much help. Been described in three different outfits, is that right? Yeah, green dress with a pink coat, white dress, dark blue jacket, bright red sweater, and a brown skirt. All the carries a dark brown alligator handbag. Shoes to match, no hat. Not much of a wardrobe, is it? 
Maybe that's why she took up robbery. Now, look, let's get on this thing. We've been chasing this woman for almost a month now, and she's still got the run of the town. How long's it going to take us? Mm, if we only had a lead that was worth something. Find it. It's there someplace. I've never reached a thief yet without digging for him. I'll get it. Robbery, Olson. Yeah, right, Andy. I'll tell him. Anderson and Burglar Joe wants to see you and Ben. Thanks. Captain? That's all. Come on, Ben. Yeah. I'd like a day off, wouldn't you? We'll get one when we get this dame. Right, Ed. This thing isn't doing much for the skipper. It's not doing much for our time off either, is it? That fire department's got the racket. 24 hours on, 24 off. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they get three days off in a row. That's what you keep telling me. Here we are. Joe, Ben. Andy, what do you got? Checking back on a job out in Hollywood. Heard you were having troubles, came across this thing, thought it might help you out. What's that, Ann? One of the picture studios had a burglary about a month ago. Thief got in the wardrobe department, then next door in the makeup. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's see. Uh, here's some of the stuff taken. Dress, coat. Oh, here, you can read it. Okay, thanks. Mm-hmm. Red sweater, brown skirt. Hey, look down here, Joe. Where? Right, right here. Oh, yeah. Took two makeup kits and four wigs. Two blondes, one redhead, one brunette. That's it. Any leads on this job? Not so far, no. We got one thing to go on. Single footprint, size nine. Mm. Pretty large size for a woman. I didn't say it was a woman. Print was made by a man's shoe. <laughs> Listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Those words are echoing across the country. Yes, Fatima has more than doubled its sales because Fatima smokers are telling their friends it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. And why? Because Fatima contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. So for a much different, much better flavor and aroma, smoke Fatima. One of the most popular misconceptions of the working detective as offered by the fiction writers is the picture of a man with amazing talents for detecting evidence, analyzing human behavior and motives, and then, almost as if by magic, fitting all the pieces together to form the solution of the crime. The real-life picture is a little different. The working detective has a job. In a sense, it's a practical and down-to-earth job as baking bread and practicing law. It's his job to protect citizens and apprehend criminals, and it's a job he doesn't do alone. To assist him in collecting and analyzing evidence, he has the aid of the crime laboratory. To help him identify oddities and suspects, or possible suspects, he has the record bureau, blatant fingerprints, the statistician's office, the ballistics department. A battery of men and machines to aid him in reaching conclusions based on fact. Tuesday, October 9th, 9 p.m. For the past eight hours, Thaxter and Olson from robbery and Ben and I had been requesting all of the 16 victims of the woman bandit. We asked them one question. Could their assailant possibly have been a man dressed as a woman? The majority didn't think so. Those that did weren't very sure. We followed the lead through. At 9.25 p.m., we checked in and headed down the hall for the stats office. Do you think it was a man dressed as a woman? I don't know. One male footprints, pretty slim odds. Maybe the machines here can tell us. Hello, Sergeant. Back again, Ethel. Can you make a run for us tonight? 9.25. Sure, I think so. Now here's the dope right here. I'm going to try another angle, huh? Yeah. Let's see. Male protrusion. About 5 feet 8 or 9, 130, 235 pounds. Feminine features, size 9 shoe. Impersonating women, robbery and assault. That's it. Mm-hmm. Arms, 45 automatic. M.O. Hitchhikes, rides, and robs drivers. How soon do you think you can have for us? Well, you make the run on the coal later. Have to punch up the master first with all this information. And let the machine work the cards. I don't think I'll have it for you much before 11, that mm, all right? Fine, yeah. We'll check back a little before 11 then, huh? They'll be ready. Good. Come on, Ben. Did you call your wife after dinner? Yeah. I wish I had, and she's mad as a horny. What's the matter? Kid's having a birthday party tomorrow, and I forgot to order the cake. What's she gonna do for the party? Bake one? 
you have to. Then she pulled this gun on me and told me to stop the car. Well, I'm telling you, Captain, I just grabbed that gun and slapped that kid just as hard as Hold I could. Hold it just a minute, will you, please, Collins? Yeah. This man's name is Emil Collins. Mr. Collins is Sergeant Friday, Sergeant Romero. Oh, yeah. How do you do? How are you? I was just telling the captain here, I'm down here on a vacation. I'm from Sacramento, South Sacramento. And I was driving down your Figueroa Street about half an hour ago and picked up this girl hitching a ride and she tried to rob me. Collins took the gun away from her, subdued the girl and brought her in. Where is she now? Interrogation room. Baxter and Olsen are with her. The description match? Not too close. Sounds like you didn't have too much trouble with her, Mr. Collins. Well, now that I come to think of it, maybe I didn't. When she pointed that gun, I just grabbed for it and slapped her as hard as I could. So it took the starch out of her. Who is the girl? Any identification? None. Baxter and Olsen haven't been able to get anything out of her. You want to try? Sure. What do you think, Skipper? You tell me. See if you can make her talk. I'll have a stenographer take Mr. Collins' report. Okay. Glad to meet you, Mr. Collins. That's a pleasure. I'm only down here for a vacation, but if you need me, just call. You bet we will. Thanks. How do you figure them? I don't know. Let's see what the girl has to say. Olson? Joe, I want to talk to you before you go in. Sure. Did you finally get her to talk? Well, Faxter did. Pretty sure she's not the one we're after. What's her story? Said she read about this wounded bandit in the paper, decided to try her hand at it, needed money. Yeah. Claims her husband left her. She's pregnant, needs the dough for a hospital. She live here? Off the coast, Monterey. Got in town four days ago, staying at the YWCA. We checked there. She's not lying. You call Monterey? Yeah, they confirmed it. She left there last Wednesday night. She's not the one. Where do we go from here? You'll take care of having a book, huh, Olson? Yeah, as soon as we get a station. Okay, fine. Friday, Ben, this way. Hustle it. You too, Olson. What do you got, Ed? Fourth and Lucas, 211 shooting. Let's go. Any detail? Yeah. A tall blonde with a gun. Come on. The woman bandit's 18th victim was a truck driver. His name, Harry Reese. His story differed a little from that of the first victim. The woman was hitchhiking near Alvarado and 3rd Street. He gave her a ride. She robbed him at gunpoint, slugged him, and then shot him through the left shoulder. He described her as tall, blonde, attractive, and well-dressed. Guess I should have known better. Remember reading about the dame in the papers. You're sure that the person who held you up was a woman? Hmm? Ah, I don't get you. What he means is you don't think it could have been a man dressed like a woman. Oh, no, I'm sure of that. No guy ever looked that good to me. All right, Mr. Reese. We'll check with you later at the hospital. Okay. We're keeping that truck safe? Yeah, Olson's got a couple of men watching it. He's going over it. Same old story. Just another version. Don't you think she's spreading it pretty thin? Her luck can't last forever. She's got me beat. How she always manages to disappear without a trace. Yeah. Now, Ben, this way, over here. Yeah, okay. What do you got? Better hustle it. Four blocks down on Colfax is shooting. Just came in on the car radio. Let's go. Slide over, Jim. Yeah. Okay, hit the sign, Ben. Yeah. The crowd watching. All right, Skewer. That all that came over, Ben, a shooting? All they said, see the cab driver, ambulance shooting. This is working real fast. What's the address for me? Third and East Flower Hotel. Hold on. This is it coming up. Should be to the right here. Yeah, take a right. That must be it up ahead. I can't see. What's that sign say? Edgemar Hotel for young women. Here's a cab driver. Lovers, right over here. Hey, looks like blood stains to me here all over the sidewalk. Yeah, I guess it couldn't have happened any more than five or ten minutes ago. I had this fair scene, picked her up at Fourth and Bixel, and I, I drove her here. She, she paid the fare and got out. Yeah, go on. I was about halfway down the block when I... Heard a shot. At least it sounded like one. And when I looked back, this dame was down on one knee near the door to the hotel here. And by the time I backed up her, she was gone. And you noticed the blood, huh? Like, that's right. Yeah, I figured I'd better call somebody. Can you tell us what the girl looked like? Oh, not bad at all. Blonde, tall, pretty girl, nervous. But you didn't see where she went? Uh, no, but I didn't. I'll get the driver's name and address. Joe, you and Ben, see if you can follow that trail. Stuff's all over the place. Right. Over this way, Ben. Yeah. It's not hard to follow. Down this alley between the buildings. How does this figure? I don't know. Let's find out. And here we go. All the way back here. You got your flashlight? Oh, yeah. yeah. Here it is. Okay. Yeah, this way. Come on. This must be the rear of the hotel. Now look, the stains lead over this way to the back door here. And let, let me try. Right. Okay, inside. 
Still following? Yeah. Careful. Up these stairs. Yeah. Second floor. What's the matter? Did you lose him? No. Just a minute. See anything? Yeah. Stains lead on up the stairs here. Let's go. I just happened to think. This is a woman's hotel. And they ought to keep the back door closed. Come on. Third floor, let's hold it. What is it? Thought I saw a door open down the hall. See anybody? No. Let's go. This way. It's an easy trail to follow. Now, this is it. They stop here at this door. Uh, that doesn't sound like a woman. Uh, yeah. You ready? Yeah, try the door first. Yeah. Easy. Uh, yeah, it's locked. All right, come on. Together uh, now. Let's hit it. Yeah. Right. Watch it, Joe. Watch it. All right, you. Uh, I got the gun. Yeah. Well, we found what we came for. Look. Still got the clothes on. Blonde wig, makeup, everything. Please help me. My leg. Call an ambulance. It's on the way. Take it easy. Have a look, Joe. The wigs, full makeup, kit, clothes, living in a woman's hotel. The worst. It was an accident. You never would have got me. I dropped the gun. It went off. You never would have got me. Yeah, that's right, mister. It was an accident. You better get the boss in here. I'll stay with Glamour Boy. Yeah, okay. And Ben. Yeah? Leave the door open, will you? House rules. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 14th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 79, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Smokers find Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. They find that Fatima is extra mild because it's the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all long cigarettes. The welfare and security of your home and your family is a subject of national importance next week, National Crime Prevention Week. The efficiency of your local police department is dependent upon your attitude toward your police officer. Not just one week out of the year, but every day in the year. He wants your cooperation. He needs your cooperation for the enforcement of your laws. Help your officer to help you to live in a peaceful, orderly community. National Crime Prevention Week costs you nothing, just your cooperation. <laughs> James Harold Sutter, alias the Bandit Queen, was tried and convicted on several counts of assault with attempt to commit murder and robbery of the first degree. He was sentenced to the term prescribed by law. While serving his time in the state penitentiary, he was stabbed to death by another inmate. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Here, Morton Downey, tonight on NBC. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to Narcotics Bureau. For seven months, you've been working with federal and state agents in breaking a narcotics ring. You've apprehended the small fry. Next in the line... The big man. Your job, get him. 
If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, July 9th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of Narcotics Bureau. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way into work, and it was 3.58 p.m. when I got to room 24, Narcotics Bureau. Hi, Joe. Feel better? Well, not quite as tired, Ben. That Costello thing was a long haul. Narcotics Romero. Okay, Bigham. I'll tell him. Meeting's in five minutes. Chief Brown's office. Okay, I want to pick up my stuff from the captain first. Hi, Skipper. Come on in. Look a little better Friday. Get some rest. Yeah, and a couple of good meals. That's the trouble with the Flats gang. They never know where to eat. Sit down, Joe. I want to talk to you. We got a couple of minutes before the meeting. You'll probably be getting this all up and down the line from here in. Just want to let you know that we think you and all the men in the operation did a fine job. My part wasn't much. You did more than I did. No, we all worked, but you had the dirty end of it. Good job. Here's your equipment. You'll need it now. Oh, yeah, thanks. Your badge, your ID cards, you got six shells, that's all of it, huh? Mm-hmm. That's it, thank you. You're back at it. Yep. Here's one for you. Look at this. What's that you got? Mug shot of a girl picked up in a narcotics raid last night. Oh, a pretty girl. Long, blonde hair, beautiful eye. Mm-hmm. She looks young. High school girl? She was when that picture was taken, 1947. She was 16. Yeah. look at this one. Yeah, same girl. Yeah, that's the way she looked at 11.30 last night when we picked her up. She looks 50. 19 years old, three years on heroin. She might as well be dead. She is, 8 o'clock this morning. Let's go, it's time for the meeting. You just looked at the best reason I know of for getting Belmont. Did she get her stuff from Belmont? Costello was pushing to her. He got his stuff from Belmont, the old one. Romero, let's go. Why would you? Anybody to brief you on the Costello interview, Joe? No, no, not yet. Chief Brown will fill you in. Here we are. Chief? Gentlemen, come on in. You uh, men all know each other. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hiya, Craig. Uh, Captain White, I think you and your men know Policewoman Caswell. Yes, sir. How are you, Florence? Hello. Miss Caswell, Inspector Virgil Beckner, State Narcotics. How do you do? Oh, yeah. Bill Craig, agent in charge, Federal Narcotics. Hello. How do you do? Well, we got into the Belmont procedure. Let's see how we stand on the Costello case. Uh, why do you want to fill everybody in on the information we got from Ralph Costello? Yes, sir. Uh, after his arrest Monday night, we interrogated Costello for about four hours. We confronted him with the package he sold to Friday here. How the stuff test? Crime lab ran it through, about a third of an ounce of heroin, fair quality Mexican stuff. The man we picked up with Costello, Tony Morris, was questioned as well. He corroborated Costello's story. <clears throat> What'd you get from him? Well, he told us he had a great deal of information on the big man in the operation, Belmont. He said he wouldn't tell us a thing unless we made a deal with him. What kind of a deal? He wanted everything. But we finally agreed that the only thing we might possibly work out was his prison term. Mm -hmm. We called in the U.S. District Attorney. We talked another four hours. How'd it work out? District Attorney told Costello the only thing he'd do for him was to have his prison terms run concurrently rather than consecutively. Not much to pay for what we got. Costello gave us enough to enable us to start moving on Belmont right away. We've had his MO confirmed. We've got a list of most of his pushers. Now we can get to him. Any definite plan, Chief? No, White and I have been talking over here with Craig and Beck. We worked out what we think might be a pretty good plan. Uh, Craig, do you want to lay out how your men are going to handle it from the federal end? We'll work from out of town to the center here. We'll check his contacts across the state lines. We've already traced his connections to the east. New York syndicate. We'll keep working that end. 
Beck, uh, how about your state narcotics man? We work inside the state line here. We've already checked out part of his operations. We've <clears> located <throat> sources in San Francisco, Bakersfield, Fresno, as far south as San Diego, Lower California. We'll draw all those ends up tight. Keep moving. You fellows will both give us a hand if we need assistance. You bet. Yeah, that's right. Fine. Uh, White, what are we going to do locally? Oh, it's going to be a case of taking what we know and finding out what we don't know, putting the two together. Seems to me to be a case of watching the man at all times. Belmont shouldn't be able to blow his nose without one of our men knowing it. It's going to be a tremendous undertaking. You all know the tough job it is shadowing narcotics, men. They're fidgety, hypersensitive. They recognize anything out of the ordinary at once. Well, for that reason, it can't be a one-man operation. Everybody's got to work. Our undercover won't work this time. They're no doubt alerted. So we'll work it from another angle. When do we start? We've already started. Belmont lives in Manhattan Beach. His house is under surveillance. Has been since yesterday. Well, I can't impress upon all of you the importance of not letting Belmont out of your sight for an instant. A narcotics buy could be made in 30 seconds. If we're not there at the instant, we lose him. Do we have anything at all as to when he might be ready to deal again? Nothing. Nobody seems to know Belmont's exact operating time. Could be any time. And in order to prosecute him, we've got to be there when the narcotics are in his possession or under his control. So we start to live with him and stay as close as we can without being tabbed until there's a buy. That's it. Captain White has all the assignments for our local men. Okay. We'll watch him. We'll stay close to him. If he makes a move, be there. The meeting lasted four hours. During that four hours, a plan was formulated which we hoped would end in the successful apprehension of the number one man in Pacific Coast narcotics traffic. Arthur Z. Belmont. How do you watch a man, his every move, for 24 hours, day in, day out, without his knowing it? How do you watch a man whose very existence depends upon not being watched, who is expertly schooled in every trick and device of police surveillance, whose method of operation will change with the slightest disturbance of his daily routine, and if that M.O. changes, you've lost him. Thursday, July 10th, in the small Los Angeles suburb of Manhattan Beach, population 10,172, Three very ordinary events took place. A public nurse began a house-to-house -house survey. She asked the simple question, have you ever been vaccinated for smallpox? She started canvassing 27 blocks from the home of Belmont. Policewoman Florence Caswell. Two Japanese gardeners new to the city of Manhattan Beach began soliciting work. They started asking for jobs 38 blocks from the home of Belmont. Sergeant Ken Fujikuni and Patrolman John Kagawa. A team of surveyors driving a station wagon marked with the seal of Los Angeles County began taking linear measurements for the proposed enlargement of storm drains in the area. They started 14 blocks from the home of Belmont. Lieutenant John Bigham, Central Narcotics, Sergeant Ben Romero, and myself. Okay, Ben, bring in the rod. Let's knock off for lunch. What do you want to eat, John? In the wagon. Better take the transfer with us. Kids might pick it up. Okay, I got it. I can't keep the sand out of my shoes. Might as well get used to it. We're a long ways from home. Yeah. Nine years on the job is the first time I ever brought my lunch in a paper sack. Who knows, Joe? This might change your whole way of living. You bet. You want to sit in the front? No, I'm getting back. Fellas, have a look at the local paper? No, why? It happened to beat Sentinel. Down the bottom of page one in the box. Read it. Yeah, let me see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's good. What is it, Joe? Read it out loud. Well, it says preliminary work on storm drains started. Surveyors. Well, it goes on to say that surveyors have started taking measurements for the new drains. Mm -hmm. Captain White's idea had the story planted, even got a release from the planning commission. It won't hurt us a bit. Well, you said lunchtime. I've got enough here for the whole department. Four hard boiled eggs. See what kind of sandwiches I drew. Deviled egg. Look here. See, you can put them on egg bread. I hate eggs. Ooh, looks like the captain driving up the street. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's him. Driving a city car. Chief engineer. How's it going, Biggin? All right. Slow. How's your lunch? What do you got? Deviled egg sandwiches. Got plenty. Can't stand them. How about a ham and cheese? Yeah, thanks. There you go. Hmm. How's everybody else doing? Hmm. Very slow. It takes time. We've got to keep taking our time. If we tip it before we got close enough, Belmont's on his way. Mm -hmm. How long are we going to have to keep our distance? Not much longer. We can't take the chance of starting everybody out right on top of Belmont. Right. It might look funny to him. Anybody else would be okay. The average person, your operations might look normal, but we can't afford to try to get it by Belmont that way. Hmm. 
With a hop cutter, you never know. It's not so much that we don't know. We just can't take any kind of a chance. Mm, that's what I mean. He might have started right on Belmont's front lawn, and he's never got wise. But we wouldn't want to risk it. Belmont been out of his house today? He's on the go quite a bit. Left his house at 9.13 a.m., went down to the ShopRite market, bought a half pound of bacon, two dozen eggs, loaf of bread, whole wheat. Sergeant Hodges waited on him. He's clerking in the grocery department. Oh, yeah. Then he drove over to his neighborhood gas station, got a full tank of ethyl and two quarts of oil, very weight, drove home, got back at 9.42. Are you still there? Yeah. About the time you guys were back at it, huh? Right. Okay, Ben. You want to grab some of the gear? Yeah. I guess. Right, let's go. Hey, Joe, mm-hmm. give me a leftover bread crust, will you? I'll give them to Seagull. Yeah, sure. Here you go. Right. Well, foot by foot, we're getting closer to Belmont. Hope nobody tips it. Nobody should, unless you don't trust those gulls. We surveyed the city of Manhattan Beach for five weeks. Policewoman Caswell, posing as a nurse, continued canvassing. Everybody concerned with the job of standing watch over Arthur Z. Belmont carried out their routine day by day. Daily reports came in from everyone in the operation. These reports would be sifted at Central Narcotics and progress reports compiled for the use of those in the field on the Belmont case. All police cars, as well as city cars, such as we were employing, were equipped with three-way radio communication. All personnel were in constant contact with one another. Wednesday, August 12th, it was the decision of Captain Lynn White that the idea of our posing as city surveyors had been exhausted. Further use of this could possibly arouse suspicion. Belmont lived at 1227 Ocean Avenue. Two days before we were called off the surveying job, the city leased the private residence at 1216 Ocean Avenue. A van load of furniture was moved in. Drapes and curtains were hung. Regular deliveries of daily newspapers and milk were made to the house. To all outward appearances, the house was occupied by an average family. Actually, it provided another blind from which we could continue to observe Belmont. Shortwave radio equipment was installed in an upstairs room. Ben and I were assigned the night watch. Another car just stopped in front of Belmont's house. How many does that make? Three cars. Six men. Yeah, a couple of guys getting out. Went up the front door. Mm-hmm. Where? Let me see, huh? Take a look. Watch the curtain. Uh-huh. Yeah, Belmont answered the door. He's letting him in. Something's doing. What do you think? I don't know. You called Captain White, didn't you? Oh, an hour ago. Just after the first car pulled up. Should park in the alley and come up the back way. Yeah, I better check with everybody again. This portable seemed to warm up slower than our car radio. I'm about the same. Ah, here we go. Unit 140K to unit 145K. 145K, go ahead. Just checking. Your location the same? That's right. Ocean and Clipper. We got three cars to cover now. Stand by. Roger. Unit 140K to 143K. 143K, we got it. Standing by. Location still good? Same. Be talking to you. Stand by. 140K to 149K. 149K. Go ahead. Stay put. We got three cars now. Yeah, we heard. Still the same spot. Stand by. Roger. Captain just pulled in the alley, Joe. Don't worry. Good. Belmont's porch light just went out. Mm Mm-hmm. Let's see. Three guys came in the first car. Two in the second. Two in the third. Is that right? Yeah. Seven all told. Eight counting Belmont. Maybe he's running for office. Joe, Ben, any changes since you called me? Another car. Mm-hmm. Anybody you know? Too dark to see their faces. Mm-hmm. Dodge coupe, gray, black package sedan, green cherry. Well, that might be for me. I told the office they could reach me here. White. Yeah, Bigham. He must be wrong. You sure he's not lying? All right, thanks. Yeah. You sure Belmont hasn't left his house since you came on duty? Couldn't possibly. Not without somebody in a detailed spot. He got out somehow. He made a buy. Captain White called the office and talked to Benny Arredondo, our narcotics undercover man. He confirmed the fact that somehow Belmont had a meet and successfully completed a narcotics transaction. None of us could figure how, and we didn't know when the meet took place. Arredondo told us that the buy had been made sometime in the past ten hours. The arresting officers had recovered a portion of the narcotics, two bindles of heroin. They were found in the possession of one of Belmont's runners, Archie Scott. I can't figure it. What do we do now, Skipper? Sit tight and watch those three cars in front of Belmont's house over there. 
Maybe he didn't have to leave the house to make a buy. That's the way I got it, Peg. Those cars down there, those are the first visitors he's had in the past 24 hours? As far as anybody knows, we watched it close. Sometimes it's like that. Mm -hmm. It looks like somebody's coming out over there. Two guys. How many in there? Eight, counting Belmont. All right, Friday. Get to the cars. Yeah. They started to move out yet? No. Five, six, seven. That's all of them. They're heading to the car. Yeah. Looks like a three-way switch. We'll see when they start to move out. Attention, all units and special details. Stand by. Here's the license number, Joe. Oh, good. I need those things. Green Chevy's headed south. Black package going north. So's the Dodge Coupe. Uh huh. Dodge turn left at the corner. It's headed east now. Got it. 140K to all units and special detail. Unit 149K. 149K, go ahead. 1946 Green Chevrolet sedan, license 61 William 852, headed south on Ocean. Roger. Unit 145K. 145K, go ahead. 1947 Gray Dodge Coupe, license 1X Ray 1898. Headed east on Clipper Street. Roger. 143K, come in. 143K, yep. 1939 Black Packard Sedan, license 6 Mary, 6778. Headed north on Ocean. Roger, down spot. Could be a dry run. Couldn't afford to chance it either way. Nothing to do now but wait it out. It's right and pray for rain. It was eight minutes past 8 p.m., we sat back and waited for the reports to come in from the cars. At 8.25 p.m., 17 minutes after the alert was broadcast, Unit 149K reported in on the gray Chevrolet sedan. The car and its occupants were thoroughly searched. No trace of narcotics was found. 8.42 p.m., 34 minutes after the alert. Unit 143K to 140K. 143K, go ahead. On that 1939 Packard sedan, license 6, Mary 6778. Shook them down. Nothing. They're clean. 8.50 p.m., 42 minutes after the alert, the report on the third and final car came in, the 1947 gray Dodge Coupe. That's it. Not a trace of narcotics in any of those three cars. Belmont beat us. It's tough luck. It's going to be tougher. Now he knows we're after him. are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. Now, here's an authentic report from Fatima Cigarettes. In 1949, Fatima more than doubled its smokers from coast to coast. In 1950, enjoy Fatima yourself. You'll find Fatima extra mild. Because Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. You'll find Fatima tastes much better. Fatima's superb blend gives you a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. You'll find Fatima best in cigarette quality. Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. For a new year of greater smoking enjoyment, buy Fatima in the appealing golden yellow package. You will agree... Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. The three cars switch. Three cars arrive at a given point at different times. The meet takes place. The drivers of the various cars leave the given point at the same time. Each drives away from the point in a different direction, making it three times as difficult to follow them. The practice was not new to the Narcotics Bureau or the dealers in narcotics. It usually includes the dry run, in which the actual mechanics of the narcotics are carried out, but neither the merchandise nor the money is on hand. This practice forces the narcotics officer into pure guesswork. If the officer doesn't follow up, the buy could be successful. If he chooses to follow up, he takes the chance of exposing himself and tipping his hand on the rehearsal. In the case of this particular car switch, we lost. But taken in the car roundup were seven of Belmont's trusted runners. Six of these men refused to talk, but the seventh, Clifford Bissell, gave us a lead to one of Arthur Belmont's most trusted friends. His name was Floyd Ketchell. He and his wife lived at 357 Evergreen Drive, Linwood. It's a nice house. Yeah. Yes? Uh, police officers, we'd like to ask you a few questions. What about? Well, as you probably know, there's been a series of burglaries here in your neighborhood. No, I didn't, though. Oh, yes, quite a few. Would you mind if we came in and talked to you about it? I don't know anything about any robberies around here. 
Everything's okay. This is just a routine check, Mr. Ketchell. Everybody else in the neighborhood's cooperated. Only take just a minute. All right, you can come in, but I have to leave in about 15 minutes. Thank you. Now, you have a nice place here, Mr. Ketchell. Yes. Now, what was it you wanted me to help you with? You know a man by the name of Clifford Bassell? No. How about Arthur Z. Belmont? Who? Arthur Z. Belmont. Bassell says you and Belmont are good friends. I don't understand this. I thought you wanted to ask me about some robberies. I wonder if you'd mind rolling up your left sleeve. I'd like to look at your arm. What for? You're a user, aren't you? No, I'm not. Then you know what we're talking about, don't you? No, I don't. Do you have any narcotics here in the house? Certainly not. Do you mind if we look around? Why do you want to search the house? Why won't you show us your left arm? Floyd Ketchell would admit nothing, but he allowed us to search his home and grounds. An extra detail of men was called out to aid us in the search. We covered every foot of the acre of ground. This took two days. We found nothing. On the third day, under the flooring of an upper bedroom of the Ketchell home, we found Ketchell's plant. He was using heroin. You want me to call Belmont, is that the idea? That's right. We want you to set up a meet with him. I'm not going to rat on Art. He's a friend of mine. Well, suit yourself. We found your plant there. We've got you. You'll be the fall guy. You mean I take all the heat? Why not? Bassell put the finger on you. We've got to have somebody. Why pick on me? We just told you. We found the stuff here. Bassell fingered you. You're it. All you have to do is make a phone call. You won't have a clean slate, but it's going to sound a lot better in court. All right. It makes sense. You know what to tell him. We've already been over all that. Call him now. Friday, listen in on the extension. If Ketchell changes his mind in the middle of the conversation, I'll see that he hangs up. Yeah. Ketchell. Oh, hey, Ketch. Fine. How's Edna? She's fine, Art. Say, I got a friend on his way to Honolulu. Uh-huh. He wants to take a little package along. Got to have it. You know him? Is he okay? Yeah. Old friend. You sure? Yeah. You have to be pretty careful. He got hit Wednesday night down the beach. Yeah? Who'd they get? The cell and the six guys from New York. Get off easy. It's a dry run. I didn't know that. Nothing in the papers. He hasn't hit yet. It will. How much do your friend need? Going to be in the islands for quite a while, so there's a couple of ounces should do it. You got the money now? He's good. Can you swing it tonight? Boat leaves from San Francisco day after tomorrow. He hasn't got much time, has he? Okay, you want to pick it up? Yeah. Uh, all right, if I bring him along, I want you to meet him. Good customer. Are you sure about him? Yeah. 8.30 at the store. We'll be there, Art. 1100 cash. Yeah. Better be okay, Kitch. He is. Better be. I had one dry run this week. I can have another. <laughs> 3.22 p.m. We took Mr. and Mrs. Floyd Ketchell back to Central Division where they were booked on suspicion of violation of the State Narcotics Act. 4 p.m. We met in the office of Chief of Detective Thad Brown. You need $1,100, is that right? Yeah, that's right. How much was in the Secret Service fund? $223. A lot for this month's all gone. Well, where'd you get the rest of it? You haven't got it all yet. From Meredith, the banker. How you got it figured, Ben? Well, let's see. I've got it all written down here. First off, we got $223 cash. And these fellows all gave us their personal checks. Jack Donahoe and Robert gave us $200. Johnny Begum put up $100. And Captain White's in for $150. Joe pin in $35 bucks and $22 is all I can swing. That's uh, $720. You need $380, right? Yeah, that's the way I got to figure. Okay, I think I can make up the rest. How about Wynn's Cadillac? He loaned it to you? He's out getting it washed. It's $41, isn't it? Yeah, sedan. A little old, but it looks good when it's wise. Flashy. Now, oh, that's what you need. You gonna make the buy away? Yeah. Ketchell will be with me. Okay. It's all here. $1,100. Yeah, we've only got one hitch. It's 5 o'clock and the banks are closed. Yeah? Not much time to run around getting checks cashed. It was 5 p.m. We had three hours to cash $720 in personal checks. We split up and covered every possible place in the city where we were known and where we knew they would cash them. By 7.45 p.m., we had the 1100 in cash. The serial number on each bill was listed and the money turned over to Captain White. The scene of the meet was a hardware store on East 9th Street, which Belmont used as a front. Belmont's hardware was located in a small neighborhood shopping district. On Friday nights, the stores remained open until 9 p.m. Promptly at 8.30, Captain White and Floyd Ketchell pulled up in front of the store and went in. Ben and I waited in our car a half a block down the street. It was 8.35. There they are. They're coming out. Must have made the buy. Starting the car. Here they come. Watch for the skipper signal, huh? Yeah. There it is. Let's go. 
Okay, pull over here. Come on. There's a clerk back there. You see Belmont? No. Can I help you? Is Mr. Belmont around? No, sir. He just stepped out. You sure? Yes, sir. He went out the back door not a minute ago. Bigham and Cassidy are out there, aren't they? Yeah, he won't go for it. Oh, there's Mr. Belmont. Mr. Belmont, these gentlemen want to see you. Running up the stairs to Mezzanine. Come on. All right, Belmont. Wait a minute. What's that barrel? Watch it. Look out! Pushing that barrel down the stairs. <laughs> There he is. He's trying to reach that skylight. Belmont, get on. You'll never make it. He's slipping, Joe. Belmont! <laughs> Come on. He didn't do that showcase any good. Yeah. He's through. Piece of that glass is right through him. Yeah. It's a rough way to go. And... Yeah. At least narcotics didn't kill him. Didn't it? The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 10th, 1948, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 87, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Smokers find Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. They find that Fatima is extra mild because it's the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild. Enjoy extra mild Fatima yourself. Best of all long cigarettes. <laughs> Twelve members of Arthur Z. Belmont's narcotics gang were finally rounded up by federal, state, and local authorities. All twelve were tried and convicted of violating the Harrison Act and the State Narcotics Act. They received sentences as prescribed by law and are now serving their terms in state and federal penitentiaries. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. The team of cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Be sure to hear Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman in Halls of Ivy tomorrow on NBC. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to Bunko Detail. An expert confidence man has resumed operations in your city. His criminal record dates back 35 years. He's a master in the art of the gentle swindle. Your job, stop him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima.
It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. <laughs> documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, July 28th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch at a bunko detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Fab Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the record bureau, and it was 10.45 a.m. when I got to room 38, bunko fugitive detail. Friday? Captain, they're bringing him in now. Mm, sit down. Thanks. There's the mama sheet on him. Oh, Gentleman Wallace. I thought he was out of our hair for good. So did I. It was turned up. I heard he was working in New York. Mm, look at the package on this guy. Uh -huh. It's like a good-sized dictionary. Yeah. Check the date of his first arrest there. Uh -huh. June 2nd, 1913. He's been in and out of jail all over the country. Of Lane County, Oregon, forgery. Bum check beef, San Francisco, 1914. Embezzlement, Santa Ana. Parole violation, Seattle, Portland. More checks, Reno. Billings, Montana, forgery, 1920. Dayton, Ohio, Pittsburgh, New York. Grand larceny. Bunko Raps, Las Vegas, Cleveland, Chicago. That's only the first page. There's a couple more there. Yeah, it reads like a novel. Just about as long. What's the story on Wallace this time? What have we got? We reached a couple of used car dealers Saturday. Took them for 2000 each, and we can't touch him. Why not? How'd he work it? Well, Saturday afternoon, he went to a car lot in the corner of South 3rd and Washington and bought a 1948 Lincoln sedan. Mm -hmm. Showed him his identification, wrote a check for $1,500 for a down payment, and drove away. Another bum check deal. Uh, that's a little more than that. About 45 minutes after he left, he drove into another used car lot two blocks away from the place where he bought the Lincoln. Yeah. Told the salesman there that he didn't like the car and he wanted to trade it in on another one. Mm -hmm. The salesman offered him $900 less than he paid for it. Wallace accepted and offered them a personal check to cover the balance. And the salesman went for it? Almost. Wallace seemed so anxious to get rid of the car that the clerk got suspicious, but it was late Saturday and he couldn't call the bank on Wallace's check. So he called the place where Wallace bought the car. That's all right. We found out that the sale was made less than an hour before and that Wallace had given them his personal check for it. Mm -hmm. and then the two used car dealers got on the phone, decided that Wallace was pulling a fast hustle, called a cop and had him jailed. Mm -hmm. Hold that line a minute, will you? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, then what? Well, when the banks opened Monday morning, they called about Wallace's account. He had enough money in to cover both checks. Wallace got a lawyer and threatened suit against the two car dealers. He had both of them cold. They settled out of court for 2000 apiece. Quick deal. Sounds like a master. He's been grifting for 35 years. Knows the con game any way they want to play it. We can't even book him on a vag charge. He's got a job. And who's he working for? Plastic outfit out in Pasadena. Salesman. Is he registered under 5238? Yes. No, just a minute. Yeah? All right, send him in. Romero, he's got Wallace with him. Oh. Captain? Ben? Wallace, this is Captain Bryce. Captain, I'm very happy to know you. I've heard a lot about you. Yeah. Start on Friday, how are you? I would like to talk to you, Wallace. Sit down. Oh, well, thanks. <sighs> Warm up today. Mm -hmm. Spying. Now, what is it I can help you gentlemen with? Always glad to cooperate. You don't have to give us a build-up, Wallace. We're not buying. You know me better than that, Sergeant. No point in making this visit an unpleasant one. Cordiality, that's a secret. My mother always used to tell me that. She used to say... Good, mister. You're not here to get the keys to the city hall. You're here for investigation. I'm here out of courtesy, Captain. My lawyer informed me I didn't have to come. I don't believe in making enemies, that's all. For a guy that's not trying, you've done pretty well, haven't you? Now, how long do you plan to stay here in town? Los Angeles is my home. It's my place of business. That's fine with us, Wallace, just as long as it's honest. Now, let me hand you a piece of advice. You try copping any more jobs in this town, and we're going to lean on you, understand? I don't think I do understand, Captain. The incident with the used car dealers, I hope that isn't what upset you. You guessed it, and it better be the last keeper you try around here for a long time. I had every right to take action against those car dealers. False arrests. They humiliated me. They damaged my reputation. 
Here's your reputation, Wallace. 35 years of it. Ten jail terms, larceny, bunco, forgery. Have you ever heard of rehabilitation, Sergeant? Oh, yeah. I did my time. I don't owe them a day. I've got an honest job. I've been off the grift for years now. Well, take a hint, Wallace. Stay off. You'll do better. That's all, Wallace. Just remember, the next time we tag you, you're going to fall hard. You got it straight? Captain, I've been square since I got to town. I'm not switching. Is that it? That's all. Well, that wasn't so bad. Would you gentlemen care to have some lunch with me at the club? Is it just a snack? No, thanks. Sure, I can't persuade you. Club's just up the street. Fine food. Some other time, Wallace. Goodbye. Well, goodbye, Sergeant. Goodbye to you, Captain. Yeah. Well, we gave him the word. I don't know how much good it's going to do. What do you think, Skipper? The two things about grifters, they never retire and they never change. Watch him. For the next four months, Charles Wallace was kept under surveillance. From his daily actions, there was nothing to indicate that he had returned to his former profession of confidence man. From experience, we knew it was too good to be true. For a man who had worked the con game from every conceivable angle for as long as Wallace had, chances of his going straight amounted to less than one in a thousand. Just as a dope addict is a slave to drugs, the full-fledged con man or grifter is obsessed with the idea of swindling for a living. He loves his work and he takes pride in it, just as much as a doctor, a lawyer, or any legitimate professional man. He has a life and a code of ethics all his own, he even has his own language. The grifter's victims are wealthy, middle class, and poor, and many more than the average citizen imagines. Wednesday, December 1st, 1 p.m. Ben and I had lunch and checked back in at the office. Food's getting better at the cafeteria, don't you think? Yeah, beef stew is pretty good. You got an extra coat hanger in your locker? Oh, yeah. Yeah, here you are. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Conlon. Joe. Did you see this report the post office detail sent over? You mean that lonely heart thing? No, this is a different one. Bill Twist. How do you mean, Harry? Let me look, huh? Yeah, here. Uh, Barney Grant, uh, that's the name he uses anyway. A couple of weeks ago, he planted a small want ad in the newspapers around town. Been cleaning up ever since. How'd he work him? Here, take a look at the ad he was running. Remember, tomorrow is the last day to send your dollar to Box 565, Main Post Office, Los Angeles. Was that all? That's all it took. Last couple of days, I've been getting about 40 letters a day from people in this city. With a dollar in each one. Ad doesn't promise a thing. Just send your dollar. People send them. They picked the guy up, Harry? He called for the last batch of letters two days ago. Probably pulled out. Postal inspectors checked the address he gave when he applied for the box. They never heard of him there. Hmm. Barney Grant. That sound familiar to you, Ben? A little, yeah. Maybe R&I has a package on him. Mm-hmm. Friday, see you in a minute. Right, Captain. Ben, you and Common want to check that name through R&I. I'll be in with the skipper. Yeah, okay, Jack. Right. Friday, uh, close the door, will you? Sure. Uh, this is Mr. Sawyer. He's with the Western Central Railroad. Sergeant Friday. Sergeant? How are you? It's about Wallace Friday. Mr. Sawyer has a complaint against him. We've got the crime report. Gentleman Wallace? Yeah. You want to fill him in, Mr. Sawyer? Well, Sergeant, I'm employed as a standards engineer for the Western Central Railroad. Wallace first approached me about a month ago. He said he was an inventor and he was working on plans of a new type of air brake for use on railroad cars. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. He said he'd conceived the idea, but that he needed more time and money to perfect his invention. He told me I'd share in half of the profits he got from his idea. It sounded more than fair. How much money did you give him? All I had in my savings account, 3000 I talked it over with the wife and the idea looked real good on paper. Yeah. I didn't expect to make too much money for myself out of this, but I thought that if I could get a hold of this braking system, it would certainly help the company out. Mm -hmm. He took your money and you haven't heard from him since. Well, I presented the plans to the chief specifications engineer in our eastern office. Yeah. I got an answer yesterday, airmail. Our New York office has been working for two years on exactly the same set of brake plans. Then how do you get a hold of them? From the patent bureau in Washington. Oh, the company yeah. has a patent pending on a new mm-hmm. device. It's all legal, isn't it? Yes, yes. He simply got the information from them, drew up an exact copy, and submitted them to me. He sold you an invention that your company already owns. Yes, sir. And I'm out $3,000. You know where Wallace might be now? We've checked the boarding house where he was staying. He left there last night. No forwarding address, nothing. We've got an all-out points bulletin on him. Do everything we can. 
Well, thank you, Captain. Sergeant Friday. Mm -hmm. You have my card. If there's anything I can do to help, please call. All right, Mr. Sawyer. Goodbye. Come on. Well, what are we looking for, Joe? Well, let's see. What's that, Romero? On that phone he had, the post office detail reported this morning. Check the name Barney Grant through the crime index. That's the name the guy used. Yeah. Oh, this is the package in Gentleman Wallace. That's right. The alias list goes for three pages. Read them again. Charles French, Walter Grant, Charles Grant, Barney Grant. That's right. Gentleman Wallace, Barney Grant, same guy. <laughs> We got out a local broadcast, an ACB, and a radiogram on Charles Gentleman Wallace. For a full month, there wasn't a sign of him. Then we received a communication from the Denver, Colorado Police Department. Wallace had cashed worthless checks in that city in the amount of $2,500, and then he'd skipped town. But before he left Denver, he managed another deal. He sold 30 cartons of electric razors, which, one, did not belong to him, two, had been stolen from another con man and resold, and three, the razors didn't work in the first place. The mechanisms had been taken out and replaced with lead weights. Another 60 days passed before we got the next report on Wallace from Cleveland, Ohio. By means of forged papers, two well-versed assistants, or ropers, and a fast line of talk, Wallace had sold a Cleveland hardware concern a shipment of ten penny nails, much below the market price. He collected $1,200 as partial payment for the shipment, but it was never delivered. 8 a.m., Monday, March 3rd. Ben and I checked in for work after a weekend off and found a message in the book to report to Chief of Detectives Thad Brown. Chief, you wanted to see it? Come in. Yes, sir. Gentleman Wallace is back in town. Where'd you get that? Driver by the name of Patterson. Well. All right, thanks. Egan, have Patterson brought to the interrogation room. Is that Mouth Patterson, Skip? Yeah, a small-time grifter. He was running with Wallace as late as a month ago back in Pittsburgh. When was Patterson picked up? Last night at the big hotel out in Hollywood. He was working a fast deal. You think he came to town with Wallace? I know he did. One of Conlon's informants spotted Wallace and Patterson last night. We nabbed Patterson. Wallace slipped away. We figured that he'd been operating in the city for about two weeks. Any idea what his angle is this time? I think so. Take a look at this. Uh -huh. Obituary notice he's slipped in the newspaper. How do these tie in? The con artist takes a dead man's name from the obituary list, finds out a little bit about him, and then writes him a letter. He writes the dead man a letter. Here's a sample we had reported to us. Read it. Uh-huh. William Radford, 233 South Brookway, Hollywood. Dear Bill, I heard you were sick, and I didn't want to bother you at this time, but believe me, I'm desperate. I don't mean to hound you about the $400 you borrowed from me, but we are having sickness in our family, and I do need the cash. Wait a minute. Wallace writes a letter like this to a man knowing he's dead, and the family opens it and reads it. And they figure it's some unpaid debt that they didn't know about, which the deceased owed. That's right. And the con man collects. Yeah. Letter's been showing up right in the middle of funeral arrangements. The family's bereaved, grief stricken, caught off guard. They don't suspect anybody could be that ruthless, so they pay off what they think is a legitimate debt. Yeah. That sets a new load, doesn't it? <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Ron, please. All right, thanks. I got Patterson in the interrogation room. You two question and find out everything you can. All right, Chief. When you're through talking to Patterson, you can start checking on these names. What's this? It's a list of all the names that appeared in the obituary column in today's paper. It's a long list. Don and Myberg are checking half. You and Romero take the rest. Right. Get to those families before Wallace does. We went down the hall to the interrogation room and questioned Patterson for an hour and a half. He denied that he even knew Wallace. He refused to tell us anything. We had Patterson return to his cell in the county jail and... Ben and I started us to check with the relatives of the deceased who appeared in the daily obituary list. Adams, Connolly, Craig, Denberg, Donzetti, Edmund, Fowler. None of them had received letters claiming payment of secret debts owed by the deceased. Well, there are more pleasant jobs than bothering families with an investigation in the middle of their sorrow. It wasn't easy, but it was necessary. The eighth name on the obituary list was Foreman, Carl J., he was survived by his wife, Jean. She lived at 5821 Santiago Street out in the valley. We're sorry to intrude at a time like this, Miss Foreman. We know how you must feel, but 
It's an important matter. That's all right, Sergeant. Carl was sick for so long. Probably better this way. What did you want to know? Since your husband passed away, have you received any letters asking for payments on a debt that he might have owed to somebody? Funny you should ask. Yes, I have. I got it yesterday. Yesterday. Do you know the man who wrote the letter? No, I, I didn't. I took it for granted that it was someone Carl knew in the Army. Someone he borrowed from. And how much money was it he said your husband owed? Four hundred dollars. There's a letter over the mantel. I'll, I'll get it for you. Fine. Here it is. Thank you. Signs his name, Howard Michaels. This man contacted you, sir? Why, yes, he has. He called me last night and said that he just heard about Carl. He apologized for writing the letter. Mm -hmm. Said he had some medical bills of his own to pay. I went to the bank this morning and got the money for him. Is there anything wrong? And he's supposed to come here and get the money? He already has about two hours ago. He seemed to be a very good friend of Carl's. Ben, you got that mug shot on. Yeah. Yeah, here it is. I don't understand, Sergeant. Is uh, this the man who picked up the money this morning? Yes, that's Mr. Michaels. Mm -hmm. Don't you think he was Carl's friend? I don't think so, Miss Foreman. But no one would do that. Who could be that low? You're looking at his picture, Miss Foreman. His name's Wallace. <laughs> to Dragnet for the step-by-step -step solution to an actual police case. Here, step-by-step, -step are the reasons why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers from coast to coast. Step one, the name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Step two, long cigarette smokers discover Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Step three, long cigarette smokers find Fatima extra mild. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why more and more smokers every day agree. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, the name Fatima on that golden yellow package is your insurance of an extra mild smoke. So... Enjoy Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. Over the past century, the confidence man here in the United States has earned the dubious title of aristocrat of the underworld. Among small-time thieves, cutthroats, dope peddlers, pickpockets, and similar small fry, he's looked up to and respected. The true con man does not consider himself a crook or a thief in the ordinary sense of the word. He's smooth, courteous, fast-talking, and he lives by his own code of rules. He never uses violence. He makes his living by his wits alone. Generally, he's far above average intelligence, and he's totally without a conscience. He thinks no more of fleecing a day laborer of his wages than he would of fleecing a millionaire. Because of their carefully planned operations, only a handful of confidence men are ever brought to trial. Monday, March 3rd, 6 p.m. Ben and I completed our interviews with the families of the deceased and returned to the office. All right, are you two having luck? Wallace is the guy. We found out that much. Who identified him? Woman out in the valley, a Mrs. Foreman. Wallace poses an old friend of her husband's, took her for 400 bucks. How about Colin and my bird, Captain? They get anything? I haven't checked in yet. I'm waiting for him. How does Mrs. Foreman make the payoff to Wallace? Through the mails? No, sir. He came out and picked up the bill in person. And then there's no chance of tracing him through the post office. Seems like he comes up with a new ammo every day. We checked out the rest of the families of the deceased on the list. The chief gave us no leave. Don Myers and handwriting checked the letter Mrs. Foreman got. The writing matches with the others. It's Wallace. Hi. No, Conlon. My bird with you? Down the hall in handwriting. Checking a couple letters with Myers. Do any good today, Harry? Some. We found two families got phony letters through the mail. Same deal, Wallace. Did he pay off to him yet? Mm, neither one. He told him to sit tight and call us if the guy should contact him again. Explain the setup. Who are the people, Harry? Let's see. One's an old fella. Uh, Oscar Dunn lives over in Highland Park. The other's a pretty wealthy family, Bel Air. Uh, here it is. Elizabeth Secor, she's the wife. Mm -hmm. Husband's name, Burton James Secor. Investment broker, died day before yesterday. How much of a debt is he supposed to have owed? The guy in the letter claims 1200 bucks. 
sign himself William Kilbright. The letters mention anything about how the payoff's supposed to be made. A guy wrote he'd contact him by phone first, then make arrangements to meet him. Both families will call as soon as they hear from him. Now, if he doesn't change his M.O., we're set. Count on you and Myberg stick with the family in Highland Park. Make sure they understand perfectly what the setup is. What if makes a contact, be there. Okay, Cap. Joe, you and Ben cover the family out in Bel Air. Okay, you got Secor's address here? Well, here's a crime report. It's got all the dope. Good. Well, I'll grab Bunko, fugitive, Conlon. Yes, ma'am? When? All right, thanks. We'll take care of it. Secor's. Wallace just called him. What's the pitch? Once it pays respects, he's going to visit him tonight. 7.35 p.m. Monday, March 3rd. Ben and I drove out to Bel Air to the Secor place. It was an English-type mansion with a circular driveway out in front. The wake for Mr. Secor was being held in the living room. The butler showed us into the library where Mrs. Secor was waiting. She told us everything that had transpired since she first received the letter from Wallace following her husband's death. She said Wallace had promised to be at her home promptly at 9 p.m. We waited. 9 p.m. came and went. We told her that if the suspect should call to make any concessions, we'd agree to anything in order to set up a meeting with him. At 10 minutes past 10, the phone in the library rang. Mrs. Secor answered it. I listened in on the extension. I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Secor. I did want to get out to pay my last respects, but I'm afraid that will be impossible. Oh, I'm sorry you won't be able to come. I'd like to settle up that debt, the money that Bert owed you. very difficult for me to bring up such a subject at this time of your bereavement, but I do have need of the money. Uh, you see, it's my wife. She's quite ill, and, well, there are medical expenses to be met. Oh, I understand. Uh, when would you like to come for the money? Well, uh, would tomorrow be all right? My husband's funeral is tomorrow. Oh, I see. Well, where will that be? At the cathedral on Sunset Boulevard. A requiem mass at St. Mary's at 9 o'clock. Well, since I don't want to bother you personally anymore, I wonder if it would be possible for you to leave the cash with the head usher there at the church. Well, yes, all right. I, I think that would be the best way. All right, then. Good night, and thank you. Uh, yes, good night. Sorry, I know that's not easy for you. That's all right, Sergeant. It's strange, isn't it? What's that? One man burns out his whole life making money. The next man spends his time trying to steal it. What does it all mean? I don't know. We got 2,600 men down in the county jail. We all think they've got the right answer. <laughs> Tuesday, March 4th, 9 a.m. In St. Mary's Cathedral on Sunset Boulevard, the final rites, the Requiem High Mass, was being celebrated for Burton James Secor. Ben and I were stationed at the rear of the church. Conlon and Myberg, together with two other men from Bunko Detail, covered the side exit. An extra detail of men were placed at strategic points around the cathedral. The head usher stood a few feet from the main entrance. With him, he carried a plain manila envelope filled with pieces of newspaper cut to resemble the size of currency, along with a single dollar bill. He had instructions to hand over the envelope without question to the person who asked for it. Fifteen minutes past nine, Joe. Yeah. I see that head usher all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to spot it. All right. Pretty good-sized crowd here. Secor must have had lots of friends. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Nice choir. Just wondering, Joe. What's that? Suppose he doesn't show up. Well, that's possible. He might have gotten suspicious. Could be. What time you got now? Nine twenty. Bill Ruff, uniformed messenger, just came in the door. Yeah. Looking around. He's going up to the usher, talking to him. That's it. I should give him the envelope. Last year's leaving. I know. Let's hold it. Give him a lead. All right, let's go. Now, let's go, Ben. Don't lose him. 
He's getting into that cab. Come on. Slide over. You got the cab number? Yeah, let's move. 10.30 a.m. Ben and I trailed the cab to a bus depot in downtown Los Angeles. We followed the messenger in and watched him check the manila envelope in a key locker. We waited. At 11.45 a.m., another uniform messenger entered the bus depot, picked up the envelope, and left. We followed him to the Union Railroad Station, where he left the envelope at the traveler's aid desk. At 3 p.m., the envelope was still there, unclaimed. No signs, Joe. What do you think? Uh, it's a pretty fancy switch he's got worked out. Yeah. What time's the next train leave? 325, Coast Limited to San Francisco. 321 now. Wait a minute. See that porter over at the desk? I'm talking to that girl there. I don't know. That's it. She's giving me the envelope. Come on, man. He's heading up the ramp. Yeah, let's hustle. You turn up the left? Yeah, passenger platform. Coast limited. Not much time. Come on, run. Come on, Ben. Where'd the porter get on? Next car. Come on, run. Let's jump. This way. Through here. That's the same porter? Yeah. He's not at the door to that compartment. Handing in the envelope. That's it. Let's go. Yeah, it's locked. Knock. Yes? What is it? Conductor. Uh, just a minute. What is this? All right, Ben. Now, look, Sergeant, there's no need for any unpleasantness. Certainly, we can sit down and talk this thing over like intelligent human beings. Grab the luggage, will you, Ben? Uh, let's go, Wallace. Uh, look, uh, uh, will you wait a minute, please. I, I'm sure we can come to some agreement. I have plenty of money. Look, uh, right here alone in this envelope, uh, plenty of... There's only a dollar here. The rest is newspaper. I know. I've been taken. So have a lot of people. Let's go. <laughs> story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 23rd, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 87, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Long cigarette smokers find Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Long cigarette smokers find that Fatima is extra mild because it's the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos Superbly blended to make it extra mild. So enjoy extra mild Fatima. Best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. <laughs> Gentleman Wallace was tried and convicted on four counts of grand theft and sentenced to the state penitentiary for the term prescribed by law, with holes being placed on him by four other states. You have just heard Dragnet, authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Dragnet wishes to thank the editors of True Detective Magazine for their considerate appraisal of this program. For those of you who may be interested, the behind-the-scenes story of Dragnet appears in the March issue of True Detective. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Tomorrow, hear the Ronald Coleman's in the charming series, Halls of Ivy, on NBC. you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. <laughs>
You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A police officer is shot down on the front steps of his home. There's no apparent motive for the shooting. The assailant escapes in a blue sedan. Your job, get him. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, king-size Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Long cigarette smokers find Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Long cigarette smokers find that Fatima is extra mild because it's the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. So enjoy extra mild Fatima. Best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Sunday, May 23rd. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was off duty reporting back in on an emergency call. It was five minutes past 3 a.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Hi, Joe. Hi. How is he? He's dead. Oh. Huh? Went kind of fast. I just got the call a couple of minutes ago. He died in the White Hospital. Friday, Ben, let's go. Dad Brown's out. All right. How did it happen, Skipper? I haven't got all of the details. Guy used a shotgun, point blank. Fillmore didn't have a chance. See from the detective's office. He got crime lab? Yeah, not there now. Right. Chief Brown Egan? Down the hall with Captain Wright, intelligence officer. Said to have you wait. Okay, we'll be inside. All right. You want to fill us in, Skipper? No, not much to tell. Fillmore was working the day watch at a robbery. He left work at 6 o'clock last night, drove home. Yeah. He had dinner, then he and his wife went to a show. He got home about 11.30, went to bed. Yeah. About 1.30 this morning, the front doorbell rang and Fillmore answered it. His wife said she heard him open the door and there was a gunshot. She ran to the front door in time to see a guy jump in a car and drive away. Fillmore was lying on the porch, chest ripped open. You say the guy used a shotgun? Yeah. No other information on the car he used? Blue sedan, that's all the wife could tell us. She didn't get the license number, said it looked like a new model car. No physical evidence. I haven't found anything yet. Here's the ball. Chief? Elliot, you briefed Friday in Romero? Told him much as I know. Any idea what the guy's motive was? Revenge. Any leads? Just one. Then White Intelligence came up with it. A guy by the name of Jake Carver. Carver? Not familiar. He got out of Folsom three days ago. Served seven years armed robbery. Yeah. Fillmore was the man who got Carver and sent him up. At the time he was sentenced, Carver swore up and down he'd get Fillmore when he got out. Hot-headed punk. Where do we look for Carver? Already checked where he's supposed to be staying, not there. Mm -hmm. The list of guys he used to run with before he went to Folsom. Thanks. Let's see, Joe. Here it is. Ralph Danton, Ernie Travis, Jaime Flores. Carver been seen around town since he got out? Once that we know of in a bar out on Sunset Boulevard. Flores is with him. Well, how about Travis and Danton? They still around? Well, let's see. Travis went east two years ago. Danton's around. Still runs with Flores. That's where you start. Flores? Yeah. Okay. Any reason? Two. Flora's sister used to go with Carver. Yeah. Flora's owns a blue sedan. 3.20 a.m. We checked Jaime Flora's last known address, the old 76 hotel down in South Alameda. Flora's had moved. His forwarding address was his mother's house, 1232 Alabama Street, out in Boyle Heights. His mother told us Jaime was living on County View Avenue in Highland Park. 4.30 a.m. We located the address. Hmm. No garage here. Wonder where Jaime keeps his car. Mm -hmm. Not parked on the street. Yeah? What do you want? Police officers. Oh. Like to talk to Jaime Flores? Jaime? It's late. We're in bed. It's important. We'd like to talk to him. All right. Wait. 
I'll go get him up. Heidi, come on, get up. Mm -hmm. Come on, Heidi. Cops at the door want to talk to you. What did they say? They want to talk to you. Yeah, officers. What can I do for you? You, Jaime Forrest. That's right. We're looking for Jake Carver. You know where he is? I wish I did. I'm through with that guy. Why? What's the matter? He borrowed my car the day before yesterday. Said he'd only be gone a couple hours. I'm still waiting. You own a blue sedan, is that right? Yeah, 48 Chevy. Why, did he crack it up? Couldn't tell you. Do you have any idea where we can look for Carver? If I did, I'd be looking myself. You know if Carver's got a gun? Why, that punk pull a job? Does he have a gun? In the trunk of the car. I use it on hunting trips. What kind? Shotgun. <laughs> 4.45 a.m. We got out a broadcast and an APB on Jake Carver, containing a complete description of the car and its license number. Roadblocks were set up on all main roads leading out of the city, and police details at the airports, bus depots, and the railroad terminals were alerted. All of the people whom Carver was known to have run with before he was sent to Folsom Penitentiary were rounded up and brought in for questioning. While Captain Elliott from Homicide supervised the interrogation, Ben went across the street to check with a coroner at the morgue. I contacted Lee Jones at the crime lab. 6 a.m., we met in Chief of Detective Stad Brown's office. Crime lab found anything? Single footprint, that's all. Jones found it in one of the flower beds in front of Fillmore's home. Is it tie-in? Size 10. It's Carver's size. A little help. Is there any indication Carver might still be in the city? No, there was a good three hours between the time Fillmore was shot and the roadblocks went up. What about Carver's pals? Did they help any? Well, Flores is the only one I've met seeing him since he got out. What about Flora's sister, Dorothy? She lives out in Long Beach. And Sinus and Burton are bringing her in now. That guy, Flores, did you question him again, Elliot? Yeah. You satisfied with everything he, he told you that he knows? That's right. He doesn't seem to be too close to Carver. No record of any correspondence with him while he was in Folsom. What about the coroner's report this morning? Shotgun close range. Hit him hard. Well, his mug shots at Carver, are they out? Photocopy's still working on it. Turning out 2,000. Excuse me. Brown speaking. Albert. Right. They got Dorothy Flores in the interrogation room. You want to talk to her, Elliot? Uh, ben, you and Joe talk to her. Tell them Cenas and Burton to check in here. I got another angle I want them to start on. All right, let's go, Joe. Mm -hmm. He must be as mad as a hatter. Three days out of Folsom and he kills a cop. Yeah, if it was him. You got any other ideas? We need more than a footprint. We got to find the gun. We got to prove that he used it. All right. You two gonna take over? Yeah, Lloyd. You and Gil check in at the chief's office. The captain wants to see you. Okay. You want the police woman to stand by? It's fine. Let's go, Gil. See you guys later. All right. Tomorrow. You're Dorothy Flores? Yeah. You know why you're here? Jake Carver. That's what they told me. That's right. You know where he is? No. Have you seen Carver in the past three days? Look, I don't want any part of the guy. He's nothing to me. He never was. You used to go around with him, didn't you? Seven years ago, before he went to Folsom. Mm -hmm. What happened to your eye, Miss Flores? Those bruises there on your arm. Mm. We had a party. I saw them bump myself. Looks like a pretty new black eye. Did you have the party last night? I told you, Jake's nothing to me. He's a crazy hothead. I don't want any part of him. Was he around to see you last night? I used to go with him, that's all. I don't care what happened to him. You saw him last night. Huh? I didn't. This is on a murder rap, Miss Flores. I didn't want to see him. He came to my room. He forced his way in. I didn't want any part of him. When was it? Early this morning. What time? About 2 o'clock, maybe 10 after. He wanted money. I acted like a crazy man. I told him I didn't have any money. He slugged me. That's how I got this mouth. What do you want the money for? He said he got the cop who sent him up. He had to get out of town. He took my purse. $48 in it. Was he driving your brother's car? Yeah. I, I didn't want any part of him. I got nothing in this. Did he tell you where he was headed? Mexico. He's got friends across the border. Tijuana. All right. Stay with her, Ben. And uh, get a stenographer, too, will you? Yeah. Friday? The Flores girl, Skipper. Carva saw her this morning. Admitted shooting Fillmore. She says he's headed south for Tijuana. Maybe he stopped off on the way. How do you mean? The drugstore in San Pedro just held up. The owner was shot and killed. Yeah? The guy was driving a blue sedan. <laughs> An immediate alert was teletyped to the coastal town south of Los Angeles in the vicinity of San Pedro. 
The San Diego police were alerted, as were the Mexican authorities in Tijuana and other designated points of entry along the California-Mexico border. 7.50 a.m., Ben and I, together with Lloyd Barton and Al Chambra of Homicide, drove down to San Pedro and checked in with Lieutenant Maxwell at San Pedro Homicide. What kind of a gun did the guy use, Lieutenant? I checked the body. Looks like it could have been a 45. No chance it might have been a shotgun? No, not that kind of a wound. Who saw the guy make his getaway? My wife did. We live right across the street from the drugstore. Wife heard the shooting ran to the window. She says it was a blue sedan. She didn't see the license plate? No. I got a look at the car before it disappeared. It looked like a Chevy to me. There's been no sign of it since the roadblocks went up? Not yet. It's pretty hard to understand. How do you mean? Uh, take a look at the map here. Here's Palos Verdes and Clifton to the west. Roadblock there. Yeah. Uh -huh. Here's the roadblock to the north, just this side of Harbor City. Another one northeast, near Wilmington. Yeah. This one here, outside of Long Beach. Had four roads to pick from. They're all blocked off, huh? No turnoffs, no detours. All the roads are under patrol. You think he got south beyond Long Beach before the roadblocks went up? Not a chance. It's hard to figure. He could be hiding out somewhere along the way. Hey, excuse me. Uh, this is Lieutenant Maxwell. Where? Okay, be right there. Anything? I found the car off the coast highway. Blue Chevy sedan. How about Carver? Blood stains in the front seat. That's all they found. You are listening to Dragnet for the step-by-step -step solution to an actual police case. Here, step-by-step -step are the reasons why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers from coast to coast. Step one. The name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Step two. Long cigarette smokers discover Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Step three. Long cigarette smokers find Fatima extra mild. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why more and more smokers every day agree it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, the name Fatima on that golden yellow package is your insurance of an extra mild smoke. So enjoy king-size Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. Eight forty-five a.m. We found the blue Chevrolet sedan. It was lying overturned in a ditch just off a dead-end road on the edge of a grove of eucalyptus trees. Oil was still dripping from the crankcase. There were blood stains on the upholstery in the front seat. In the glove compartment, we found two empty shotgun shells. Ben marked them with his initials for evidence and wrapped them in a handkerchief. The fingerprint men were called. We fanned out and started a search of the general area. See if we can't pick up a trail in this eucalyptus grove here. Sure has got me beat. What's that? The car all smashed up back there, blood all over. The guy must have been hurt. How'd he get this far away from the car? What makes you think he did get far? Either that or he's hiding right under a nose. Mm -hmm. No sign of a trail through here? No, there's nothing. There's a clearing up ahead. Come on, let's cut through this brush here. Ben, come here. Yeah. Take a look. The trunk of this tree. Brown smears on it. The blood? Maybe. Look, higher up on the trunk there, the same thing. Wait a minute. Up in the tree. Can you see anything up there? No, the branches are pretty thick. The trees go pretty high up. It's a good 60 feet up there. Come here, Joe. Yeah? Follow my hand. Oh, no, just over to the left, where I'm pointing. Oh, yeah. Come here, Ben. You all right, Joe? Yeah. Can you see him? Yeah, up near the top. Right. Wait. Stay off, Burton. Don't come in the clearing. He's up in one of the trees. Throw that gun down, then come down yourself. All right, Ben. It's Carver. Shotgun's over there. You alive? Yeah. A hard tree to climb. Wonder how he got up there. I don't know, but this was the only way to get him down. <laughs> 
called an ambulance and had Jake Carver taken back to Los Angeles to the county hospital, the prison ward. We took the shotgun and the empty shells and booked them as evidence with the property clerk. The wrecked blue sedan was impounded. Two counts of murder were filed against Carver with the district attorney. There was still one important piece of evidence missing, the 45 pistol used in the robbery and murder of the San Pedro druggist. A month passed. While Carver recuperated in the prison ward of the county hospital, we were busy building a case for his conviction. We still had only enough evidence to convict him for one of the murders. Another two months went by. On August 30th, Jake Carver was brought to trial for the shotgun murder of police officer Robert Fillmore. Ten days later, the jury found him guilty of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to a life term in Folsom Penitentiary. Knowing that we didn't have enough evidence to convict his client for the murder of the druggist, Carver's lawyer demanded an immediate trial on the second charge. Wednesday, September 12th, 10 a.m., I was called at the chief of detective's office. Friday? Sit down. Thank you. Elliot and I have been talking about this Jake Carver thing. They set the trial date yet? Starts next Tuesday. Bringing Carver down from Folsom tomorrow. Bum luck. We're not going to convict him on the evidence we've got. We don't even have the gun. We've got to get a conviction. He beat the death rap for killing Fillmore. If he gets over this one, that means he's still eligible for parole. Yeah. So he serves 10 years, maybe. Good behavior. He gets out, and he's ready to start in all over again. Yeah, if we could just sew him up for killing that druggist, we could put him away for good. I don't know how, Skipper. It's a pretty good bet that no jury will convict him unless we find that gun. We've got another out. Just one. What's that? If we can get Carver to admit he killed that druggist. It's a neat trick. When you and Ben got him last May, uh, <clears throat> did he see you at all? You, you think he'll recognize you again? Well, couldn't have gotten a very good look from where he was up in that tree. Ben did all the testifying at the trial. I wasn't even there. Now you wouldn't know me. Why? When they bring Carver down from Folsom tomorrow, they'll put him in county jail while he's waiting trial. Yeah. Chief figures that we could plant you in the same cell with him as a chance he might talk. If you play it right. No, I don't know. He's no beginner. Neither are you. You carve enough of the right bait at the right time, there's a chance you'll put his foot in it. Maybe. All right, will you set it up with the county jail? Yeah, and remember, he's a killer. Don't take any chances. Suppose he gets wise. Well, then we'll know you tried. The following day at 2 p.m., I was booked at Central Jail as Joe Ramos, a robbery suspect. Ramos was the actual name of an Eastern thief whom we knew was not acquainted with Jake Carver. After being mugged and fingerprinted, transportation officers took me to the 12th floor of the Hall of Justice where I was booked into the county jail. After that, I was taken down to a cell block on the 10th floor known as the High Power Tank, where prisoners charged with major crimes are held. During the day, the individual cells are left open and the prisoners are allowed to visit with one another. I was taken back and shown the cell I was assigned to. Jake Carver was already there. He was playing two-handed poker with another inmate on the lower bunk. Here you are, Ramos. This cell here. You can take the top bunk. All right. How many cards you got? Make it two, Jake. Hey, uh, move, will you? I want to get in my bunk. Come on, make your bet. There's two cigarettes. Your two, bunk you six. I said I'd like to get in my bunk. Go on, Sam. Play the game. Okay. I'll see you. Maybe you didn't hear me, Sam. I said I want to get in my bunk. I heard you, Mac. I don't like shoving around like this. All right, now sit down. What's your complaint? Didn't they tell you when you came through the door? They'd bury you in a hole for beefing in here. Then as long as I'm in here with you, let's get it straight right now. Don't bother me. And while you're at it, keep your rum dumb pals out of here, you understand? I don't think I do. You'll be around uh, quite a while, smart guy. I won't forget this. Oh, yeah. Trial time. Come on, here it is. <laughs> What are you doing down there, Dobbin? Nothing. I always sit on the floor. Get back to your cell. Ciao. Yeah. See you, Jake. Yeah. What's this junk they feed you? Boiled beef, boiled potato? It's a habit with them here. Junk. Can you buy from the outside? Candy. Sometimes pie. Guy comes around in the morning. Who are you? Joe Ramos. Ramos, huh? Chicago? I've been there. So have I. I'm Jake Carver. Hiya. Hi. Right. What are you up for? Talk to my lawyer. You got a smart mind. You got a big one. 
You take care of your own worries, huh? I'll take care of mine. I ain't got no worries. I got it made. Hey, you want that piece of bread? I don't want any of it. Take it. Tell the truth, I never had it so good. No witnesses, no evidence. You can't touch me. Sure, that's why you're in here. Three days passed. By playing the part of the tough gunman from Chicago, I succeeded in getting close to Carl. Because of the close confinement, I was with him almost constantly, but he still refused to confide. In a roundabout way, I pressed him as much as I could for the answer without making him suspicious. No result. 8.55 p.m. Sunday, two days before the trial opened. Sam, Jake Carve, and I were playing blackjack in the aisle just outside our cell. All right, Sam, hit me. There you are. Okay, I'm good. Ramus? I'll stand. 18. Pay 19. <laughs> That's all for me. Me too. I'm gonna hit the sack. Yeah, just when I start to come back. Always crying. Hey, Ramis, seems me I remember you. Haven't I seen you around City Hall? Sure, I live there. All right, time. Lock up. Yeah. Ramis, who? What's she talking about? I don't know. I get a headache. It's killing me. Yeah. Well, let me crack your neck. It'll help it. No, it's no good. You got any of them brown pills? Come on, I'll crack your neck. Loosen up those nerves. Always helps me. Yeah? Yeah, here, let me show you. Come on, sit around. Take it right, easy. Just relax. Let yourself go. Yeah. I'm going to get my hands around the back of your neck. Come on, relax. Yeah, well, this won't hurt you. All right. You got to be careful with this stuff. You could break a guy's neck, you know? Take it easy, huh? Yeah. What's the matter? Come on, relax. All right. Let me get a better grip on your neck. Easy, huh? All right, now. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Stuart, how's that? That's not bad. Feels a little better. I'll work sometime. Sure. Hey, I noticed you had a visitor today. One of the boys in the East? No. A friend of mine out here. He just got in town. The coppers are trying to pin a killing on him. No? Who is he? Max Wesley. A good man. Tried to say he pulled the job down to San Pedro. Pedro? What kind of job? Stick up. Drugstore a couple months ago. Yeah? That's what they got me on, you know? Funny. Well, I think I'll get some shut eye. What about this job they're trying to hang on him? Tell you? I don't remember. The guy who ran the store was shot up and died. Max wasn't even in town when it happened. Happened in May? Last May? I don't know. See you in the morning. Yeah. Hard bed. They didn't have nothing on Max, huh? They let him go. Oh, that's yet he's out on bail. No, I mean, no evidence on him. No gun, huh? Well, they got a gun. I think that's what Max did. Where'd they find it, they say? I don't know where they found it. Go to sleep, will you? You mention anything else about Pedro, like San Pedro Hills? Yeah. Well, maybe that's what they thought. I think Max said that. No. Man, that couldn't be. All right. Max. Hey, uh, Ramos, it wasn't the Harbor Drugstore, was it? What's he doing? Will you go to sleep? Look, Ramos. Ramos, I gotta know. It's important. What are you talking about? I gotta get some sleep. Will you listen a minute? I ditched a gun down there in the San Pedro Hills. All right, what are you worrying about? They don't send you up for a hiding gun. Listen, I'm hot on that job. They got me on one murder rap. They tagged me on another one. It's for keeps. What do you want me to do? Talk to the governor? Are you sure this guy, Max, said that they found a gun? Now, look, Carver. Max said they found a gun in the San Pedro Hills. Now, you get on down in your bunk and let's talk about it in the morning, what, huh? What, what kind? Did he say what kind? I don't know. I don't remember. Was it a forty-five? Something like that. Yeah, forty-five. I guess that was it. I get Let's go. The jailer barking down here. Fire it down in there. All right. You go to sleep now? Can't. Nothing's any more interesting. They couldn't have found it. They haven't talked to anyone. Ramos. Hmm? When did they find the gun? Did Max tell you that? Oh. When did they find the gun? When? Hmm? I don't know. He didn't say where? San Pedro Hills. Ramos. Hmm? 
Ross, I gotta know. It wasn't by a covert, was it, on the Hill Road? I don't know. I'll ask, Max. The next time I see him, is that when you ditched yours? They, they couldn't have found it. Nobody could. Uh, we see that this covert, see, back on the road. Yeah. There was a piece of cement broken off the bottom edge of the covert, kind of a hollowed out space inside. I pushed the dirt all around it. You gotta ask Max. Mm -hmm. Ask him where they found that gun. Yeah, I'll see him Wednesday. I'll ask him. You gotta find out. They could put me away for good. What are you worrying about? They haven't paired you up yet with the gun they found. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Maybe they didn't figure it. Maybe they forgot. Maybe. Yeah. Cops are dumb. They forget. That's what everybody says, isn't it? Yeah. That's what everybody says. <laughs> The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On September 18th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 91, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, king-size Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Long cigarette smokers find Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Long cigarette smokers find that Fatima is extra mild because it's the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. So enjoy extra mild Fatima. Best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. The murder gun, a 45 caliber automatic pistol, was recovered from the San Pedro Hills and Jacob John Carver was brought to trial. He was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. The jury again refused to recommend the death penalty. Carva is now serving a life term in the state penitentiary without possibility of parole. You have just heard Dragnet, authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Dragnet wishes to thank the editors of Radio Best magazine for their considerate appraisal of this program. For those of you who may be interested, a novelized version of Dragnet appears in the April issue of Radio Best. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Tomorrow, hear Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman in the Halls of Ivy on NBC. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. A confessed murderess is paroled from the state prison for women. After seven months, the parole office loses contact with her. Your job, find her. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke king-size Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. 
That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. <laughs> the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, March 9th. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working in day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. We were on our way back from the state building, and it was 2.45 p.m. when we got to the city hall, room 29. Handwriting analysis. Want to have a seat, Fred? Okay, thanks. I'll see if Don's around. Maybe in the back room. All right. Don Meyer. Don, are you here? Yeah, come in just a minute. Oh, hi, Ben. Got a quick job for you, Don. Can you spare a few minutes? Thanks, so. Hi, Joe. Good to see you. I'd like to have you meet uh, Fred Galloway, state parole. Fred, this is Don Myers, our handwriting man. Mm-hmm. Hi. Oh, yeah. Got a couple of signatures here. I'd like to have you check them now if you can. No, I can try. Let's see what you got. You want to show them, Fred? Yeah. Uh, these uh, three sheets here, Don, mark November, December, January. I'd like to know if the signatures on them compare with the signatures on these two here. They're marked... February and March. Let me see. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, this shouldn't take long. Uh, why don't you fellas have a seat? Yeah, okay. How's this thing shape up, Fred? You figure that the Johnson woman's jumped her parole? Got me. I don't know what to think. How long has it been since you got out of prison? Well, let me check you out on the details. I got the dope right here. All right, fine. Anne Marie Johnson. You sent up for a life term, 1933. Murdered her husband, John. Shot him to death. Started appealing for parole 1940, finally won it May 14th last year. Paroled into the custody of Mrs. Laura Jean Muller. Mm-hmm. Where does this Mrs. Muller live? Down Wilmington. Old friend of a Johnson woman. She fought for ten years to get her released from Tehachapi. Have you been in touch with Mrs. Muller lately, Fred? Only by mail. We've been sending her monthly report forms all along. She's the person that Annie Johnson was paroled to, so the form has to be filled out and signed by Mrs. Muller and mailed back to me. Yeah, I know. And that's where you figured that something was wrong. Well, we got the February and March reports back from her on time. All the usual questions answered properly. And it was the signature. Writing didn't look like Mrs. Muller's at all. You think the Johnson woman is faking the signature? Maybe. I tried to contact the Muller house half a dozen times the past couple of days. Nobody home. There you go, man. You got it? Yeah. You see, these three here, November, December, January, they were signed by the same person. Yeah. Signatures on the February and March reports, uh, they're pretty bad imitations. One person signed these two, another person signed these. No match at all. Well, then the signatures on the last two reports were forged. I'd say so. She went up for murder. That's your department. You want to run it down? Sure. What's it add up to? Could be a lot of things. Could be nothing. Annie Johnson ought to know. Ben and I checked out of the office and drove down to Wilmington. We located the home of Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Muller on Seaboard Drive, just off Anaheim Street. It was an old-fashioned two-story house set back on a big corner lot along with plenty of shrubbery. It was a faded gray with lots of Victorian gingerbread hung all over it. Fancy carved gables, carriage driveway with hitching posts, and pieces of thick colored glass set in some kind of a design in the window of the front door. Out in the harbor beyond Terminal Islands, you could hear the foghorns. They sure get the fog out here, don't they? It's pretty thick today. My aunt used to live just above here, Grand Avenue. Oh, uh uh-huh. Couldn't take the fog, so she moved out the valley. Hmm. Garden could stand some taking care of. Yeah, weeds are doing fine. Want to try it again? What do you think? Let's try the neighbors, huh? Yeah, all right. That house across the street must be somebody there. I saw a woman shaking a dust mop out the window when we drove up. All right. 
Kind of a bleak looking spot up here on the hill, isn't it? Not many houses around. Yeah, and this fog's doing nothing for me. Chills you right down to the bone. What's the name on the mailbox there? Let's see. Miss Flora Carpenter. Well, maybe she can tell us something. Are you the sewing machine man? No, ma'am. We're police officers. Like to ask you a few questions. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you came about my finger. No, ma'am. I can't do any more work on my peasant skirt until the machine is fixed. And it has to be done by Saturday. Our folk dancing group's having a big jamboree Saturday night. Will you step inside? Thank you. This is Sergeant Romero. My name's Friday. Oh, how do you do? This fog's so refreshing, isn't it? Very vitalizing. Yes, ma'am. Are you acquainted with Mr. and Mrs. Muller across the street, Miss Carmen? The Mullers? Yes, I've known them for years. And uh, they have an Annie Johnson living with them? Yes, one of my very good friends. She's employed as a housemaid for the Mullers, is that right? Well, I guess you could call it that. Actually, she's more of a companion to Mrs. Mueller since poor Mr. Mueller got sick. What's his trouble? His mind. Poor man just lost his senses. He's at the state hospital at Norwalk. Mm -hmm. When did they send him there? Let me see. This is March. It must have been last November. Yes, became violent. Do you know where Mrs. Muller is now? In the sanitarium out near Pasadena. Not well at all. And um, Annie Johnson, is she still living at Muller's house across the street? Oh, yes. She went downtown to do some shopping today. Did she say when she'd be back? No, she didn't. But we have a meeting of our book appreciation club at 8.30 tonight here at my house. And I certainly don't think she'd miss the meeting. I see. Miss Carpenter, do you happen to know the name of the sanitarium where Miss Muller's staying? Gareways. That's what Annie told me. Gareways rest home out by Pasadena. Mm -hmm. Have any of the neighbors been out to visit her? Well, no, we haven't. Annie said the doctors there thought it'd be better if Mrs. Mueller didn't have visitors. I see. I wonder if you'd tell us where we could find a public telephone in the neighborhood. Oh, you can use my phone, Sergeant. It's right back there in the hall. Fine, thank you. I'll call him, Joe. All right. I'll have the operator charge it to our office. You room. sure you can find your way back there, Sergeant? It's right under General Pershing's picture. Yes, ma'am. No trouble. <laughs> I was just thinking, Sergeant Friday. Yes, ma'am. Would you know anything about repairing sewing machines? No, I'm afraid not. Oh, This is Anna Johnson's cat, Sergeant. Isn't he simply gorgeous? Look at that fur. Yes, ma'am. Genuine person. Annie brought him with her when she came to live with the Mueller's. Did uh, Mrs. Johnson and Mrs. Muller always seem to get along fairly well together to you? I mean, no argument? Oh, my, no. Annie's the easiest person in the world to get along with. All those girls in the neighborhood just adore her. Uh, Joe. Talk to Sanitarium. Yeah, I double checked the name. Yeah. Mrs. Muller's not there. They never heard of her. Ben and I left and interviewed some of the other people in the neighborhood. They all had the same high opinion of Annie Johnson as Miss Carpenter did. They all had the impression that Mrs. Muller was under doctor's care at the Garraway Rest Home in Pasadena. Annie Johnson told them so. We found out that Mrs. Muller had one other living relative besides her husband, a niece. Lorraine Muller. She lived out on Norwich Drive in Beverly Hills. 5.30 p.m., Ben and I drove back to the office and made a spot check of every private rest home and sanitarium listed in the Los Angeles area. Mrs. Muller wasn't at any of them. We called the state hospital at Norwalk, and they informed us that Joseph Muller was there, having been committed the 2nd of November of the previous year. He was critically ill. We put in another call to the Muller home. Still no answer. 6.15 p.m., we drove out to Beverly Hills to the home of Mrs. Muller's niece, Lorraine. She was a tall, good-looking girl with blonde hair and a bad cough. I don't think I can help you, Sergeant. I moved out of my aunt's house three months ago. <coughs> I haven't seen her since. 
Oh, were you staying at the house when Annie Johnson came to live there? I was raised in that house. Mother and Dad died when I was a baby. Uncle Joe and Aunt Laura took care of me. They're wonderful people. Would you mind telling us why you moved? I don't mind. <coughs> Everything was fine until Annie Johnson came. I didn't get along with her. We fought all the time. Oh, is that so? I don't know why. I just didn't like it. <coughs> when Annie moved in, she took over the whole house. Uh, what's the connection between your aunt and Mrs. Johnson? Any blood relationship no, there? No, no. Annie was a school chum of Aunt Laura's. When they sent her to prison for killing her husband, she wrote for help. And your aunt helped her? She worked for 11 years at it. I don't know how much money she spent. Lawyers, you know. Yeah. <coughs> she finally got Annie <coughs> parole. And then uh, she <coughs> took Mrs. Johnson on as a housekeeper, is that right? Yeah. She never did any work. She acted like she owned the house. Like my aunt and uncle owed her everything they'd done for. When's the last time you heard from your aunt? It was a few months ago, around Christmas time. I called her up to wish her a Merry Christmas. You had no idea where Mrs. Muller might be now. Some friends that she could be staying with me. No. Aunt Laura only has a few friends. They all live in the neighborhood. She's not in the habit of going off without telling anyone, is she? No, never anything like that. I don't understand it. Something must be wrong. Annie... You think she's done something? Do you? No, she couldn't have. She was everything to Aunt Laura. Her freedom, good home, nice clothes, money. Everything my aunt could give her. Some people are like that. If it's free, they never get too much. Before we left Lorraine Muller's house, we got the name of her aunt's lawyer. We had dinner at a lunch counter on La Siena, and then we drove back to Wilmington to the Marr house. Lights were burning in the front windows. The fog was thick now. Guess that's her singing. Yeah. Want to ring the bell? Mm -hmm. Can you see in through the curtains, Joe? Yeah, she didn't hear it. Let's ring it again. Hey, here she comes. Yes? Are you Mrs. Johnson? Yes, that's right. What is it? Police officers, for identification. Oh. Yes, won't you come in? Thank you, ma'am. You. We'll go in the parlor, shall we? All right. Now, what is it you gentlemen want to know? Well, it's about your monthly parole reports, Ms. Johnson, the ones for February and March. Yes? We think the signatures on those two reports are forged. Oh, those. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I, I don't know what to say. I, I really didn't think it was that serious. I knew the reports had to be sent in. Did you sign Mrs. Muller's name on them? Well, yes, I did. You see, Laura Muller's at a sanitarium now, resting up. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to bother her with all this business, so I signed them and put them in the mail. But forgery, I, I didn't think it was that serious. Mm -hmm. Which sanitarium is Mrs. Muller staying at? Garraway's. A very nice place. It's near Pasadena. She's been there about two months now. Have you been out to visit her yet? No, I haven't. I'm a little ashamed of myself. I've just been too busy keeping up the house here. It's lots of work. Yes, I understand. I suppose you drove Mrs. Muller to the sanitarium. As a matter of fact, I didn't. You see, we don't have a car, so she took a taxi cab. Have you telephoned Mrs. Muller at the sanitarium? Yes, just once the day she went in. She's there for a good rest. I don't feel that anyone should bother. Not even myself. Does she have any other relatives? Besides her husband, that is. None at all. Poor Mr. Muller. We had to send him away, you know, to Warlock State Hospital. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Got out of hand. Just terrible. He almost murdered poor Laura once. And those were awful days. He's much better off where he is. Yeah, it's too bad. Well, that's about all, Miss Johnson. Oh, here. Let me show you to the door. Thanks. You'd uh, better contact your parole officer the first thing in the morning and clear up this matter of the reports. I'll do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good night, Miss Johnson. Thanks again. All right. Good night. What time you got? 20 minutes after 8. Hmm. Light just went on in the attic. Yeah. What do you think? We better go take a look around. 
What do you think we'll find? I don't know. Maybe a reason for some of those lies she told us. 8.35 p.m. Annie Johnson left the house and crossed the street to Miss Carpenter's place. In the Muller house, in a small desk in one of the rear bedrooms on the first floor, we found a file for Mrs. Muller's business papers. In the file, we located three of her insurance policies. It was one for $5,000 and two for $3,500. Each policy had a writer attached, changing the beneficiary from Joseph Muller, the husband, to Annie Johnson. $12,000 worth of insurance. Yeah. Let's get them back in this folder. Did you get the policy numbers? Yeah. What's this? Let's see. Phone bill. Light bill. Here's one. Labor bill. Dollar and an hour paid to Tom McCray, charged to Annie Johnson. Uh-huh. Let's go. Yeah, I want to get this address here. Uh, Tom McCray, I think he's Jefferson. Okay. Huh. There's a cat. Yeah, let's go. See what we can find upstairs, huh? It's a pretty cat. We went upstairs to the second floor of the house and searched the rooms. We went up another flight of stairs to the attic. For a full half hour, we searched through dozens of corrugated cartons crammed with souvenirs and picture postcards. Joe, come in. Yeah. Take a look. Wrapped in newspaper. Mm -hmm. 3220 Colt. Three empty cartridges. Mm -hmm. We got a gun and we got a suspect. Those insurance policies could be the motive. Let's pray to God there's no victim. You are listening to Dragnet for the step-by-step -step solution to an actual police case. Here, step-by-step -step are the reasons why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers from coast to coast. Step one. The name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Step two. Long cigarette smokers discover Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Step three. Long cigarette smokers find Fatima extra mild. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why more and more smokers every day agree it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, the name Fatima on that golden yellow package is your insurance of an extra mild smoke. So enjoy king-size Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. Ten PM. An immediate stakeout was placed on the Muller residence in case Annie Johnson made an attempt to leave during the night. Then and I took the gun that we'd found to the crime lab for analysis. The next morning we checked with the Muller's family attorney. He had no idea as to the whereabouts of Mrs. Muller, but he told us that about three months ago she'd ordered him to draw up a new will for her. Under the new provisions, Annie Johnson was to be the sole heir of the Muller house and property, plus an additional $1,500 in bonds. Friday, March 10th, 11 a.m. While Ben checked with the insurance company, I met with Captain Elliott of Homicide. You got everything but a victim, huh? Where are you looking? We'd like to shake down the Muller house again before we look anyplace else. Didn't have a chance to give it a thorough going over last night. You sold on the idea it's a Johnson woman? Looks like it. Sure it couldn't be a freak disappearance. No, sir, not in my book. Annie Johnson's got some big reasons for lying to us. I'd like to find them. How do you figure on doing that? Well, if we could pull her in and question her, just to get her away from the Muller place, I'd, I'd like to take a detail of men out there and shake the house from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. Just checked with the insurance company that issued Miss Muller's policy. Yep. And we got it right. Annie Johnson gets the door if Mrs. Muller dies. Oh. Something else. The changes in the policies were made during the last two months at her home. It doesn't jive. Why not? Well, Annie Johnson told us that Mrs. Muller's been in the sanitarium for more than two months. Here's a gaffer, Joe. What's that? Gill and Phoenix went out to State Hospital at Norwalk to talk to Miss Muller. Yeah. Joseph Muller died at 8 o'clock last night. Death from natural causes. What's that proof? Wait a minute. When, um, when Joseph Muller was committed to the institution, Annie Johnson figured prominently in that commitment. She had a lot to do with sending him away. Didn't take any chances, did she? 
Annie Johnson is left with the house, the bonds, and the insurance money. She had all the answers. Yeah, all but the right one. While Captain Elliott called in Annie Johnson and questioned her, Ben and I, together with a detail of men from Homicide and Lieutenant Lee Jones from the crime lab, drove out to Wilmington and started a thorough search of the Muller house. We took it floor by floor, starting with the attic. By 4 o'clock that afternoon, we searched the attic and the second floor completely without finding any additional physical evidence. 5.30 p.m., still nothing. The fog was coming in thick now. Captain Elliott called and said the Johnson woman was on her way home. The search went on. Anyone check the cellar yet? Let's give it a look, huh? Joe, come on down. Lee's with me. We're checking some stains. Uh, what do you got, Lee? Picked up this line of stains here, Joe. They run down from the top of the stairs. Pretty faint. Let me see. Mm-hmm. Try a few drops of benzodine. See what happens. Okay. Let's have a look around, Gil. See what we can find. There's no lights down here. You're going to have to use your flash. I got one. Not much of anything, is it? I guess they use the attic for this storage place. Yeah. Wait a minute. Put the light over this way, will you, Gil? No, no, in the corner. That's it. See something? I don't know. Yeah, have a look here. Mm. New patch of cement. Looks pretty new alongside the rest. Yeah. There's a sledge and a couple of shovels back in the garage. Get them, will you? Yeah. No. Yeah. Turned blue. Blood. Lee Jones took some sample scrapings and went back to the crime lab to give them a precipitate test to determine if the stains were made by human or animal blood. We broke away the patch of new cement work in the cellar and we began digging. 6.30 p.m. Annie Johnson came home. We met her in the living room. Sergeant, I wonder if you'd mind explaining this intrusion. No, not at all. Will you sit down? I believe I'm the one to offer hospitality here. It's my house. Is it, Miss Johnson? Well, it's in my charge. It's my responsibility. Yes, ma'am, it is. We'd just like to clear up a few things, that's all. I think the police department's taken up enough of my time. I spent half the day at the city hall answering silly questions. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have an appointment at the beauty shop at 7 o'clock. Maybe you better cancel it. I don't see any reason why I should. What is that noise? Coming from the cellar. Someone's down there. We're police officers, Miss Johnson. We're searching the house. Searching this house? With whose permission? Maybe they didn't make it clear to you downtown. We've got a good reason to believe that a crime's been committed. Why? Mrs. Muller. She's missing. I told your Captain Elliot this afternoon, Laura could have left the sanitarium. She might have gone east to visit some friends in Cincinnati, I think. She has some friends in Cincinnati. How could Mrs. Muller leave the sanitarium? She was never there. Maybe she didn't stay at Garraway's. Could have been another rest home. But she said you phoned her at Garraway's. She said you talked to her there. There's men downstairs. They... They're going to dig up the whole house? I try. Uh, this bill, Mrs. Johnson, would you mind telling us what it was for? It was a section of the cellar floor. It had never been cemented. I decided to have it done while Laura was away. The men are digging it up, Miss Johnson. Well, why are they digging it up? What right have they? Investigation. We'll see that the cement work is redone when we're finished. Well, this is impossible. I forbid it. This house is, is my responsibility. No need to worry. Everything will be left exactly the way it was. We'll leave the house just as soon as the men are finished. Oh. Well, then perhaps I can keep my appointment with the hairdresser. I won't be long. Should be back around nine. I'm sorry. I think you better stay. But I've told you everything I know. Did you kill Laura Muller? Did I kill... I can't take any more of this... Why would I want to kill Laura? She's done everything for me. She's given me a new life. Did you kill her? I know, of course I didn't kill her. Well, then there's no need to be upset. Oh, my nerves. I got to have something. A glass of sherry. Yes. How long is it going to take them? That all depends, ma'am. There's no reason for this. You don't know that anything's happened to Laura. That's right. Laura's the best friend I have in the world. Eleven years, that's how long she fought to make them let me out of prison. She's the only one who believed in me. Yes, ma'am. She is. She's given me everything. 
She wants me to have everything, everything I want. I wouldn't have a reason for killing her. What my clothes, my home here, money. They're all lost. She's given them to me. Would you like a glass of sherry, Sergeant Friday? No, no thanks. You know, Laura was much older than I, Sergeant. She could have taken her own life. She didn't have much to live for. Old and sick. But I got everything to live for. Laura used to tell me that. So she gave me everything. Laura was much older than I. Would you care for a glass of sherry, Sergeant Romero? No, thank you. This whole thing's so silly. Laura's away on a trip. She's much older than I am, you know. I'm 38. You wouldn't take me for a woman 38 years old, would you, Sergeant? No, ma'am. I know I'm not really young anymore, but I'm still attractive, don't you think? A lot of men prefer mature women. Women with experience, background. I'd know how to take care of a man. Joe. Yeah. Joe, come on my way. Yeah. We found her. She wanted to die. Call the coroner, Gil. Yeah. Let's go, Miss John. Oh, I wouldn't want this. She knows I didn't mean it. She's the only one who knows what I went through. Years in prison. Laura understood me. She gave me everything, everything. Yes, she did. <laughs> Ask anybody. They all know how Laura felt about me. Ask anybody. We can't ask her. <laughs> The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 14th, trial was held in Superior Court, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, king-size Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Long cigarette smokers find Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Long cigarette smokers find that Fatima is extra mild because it's the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make it extra mild. So enjoy extra mild Fatima. Best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. <laughs> Annie Marie Johnson was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. She was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. You have just heard Dragnet, authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Dragnet wishes to thank the editors of Radio Television Life magazine. They have judged Dragnet the outstanding new program of the past radio season. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Tomorrow, hear the Ronald Coleman's charming series, The Halls of Ivy, on NBC. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet.
Detective Sergeant, you're assigned to robbery detail. Four young hoodlums wanted for a series of robberies are headed for your city. They're armed, reckless, cold-blooded. Your job, get them. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke king-size Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Friday, December 10th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 7.55 a.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery detail. Morning. Hi, Joe. Morning. Hi, Joe. Cold out, isn't it? Right. What are you doing here this early? Can't you sleep? I'm waiting for something. Special delivery letter from my brother. Hmm, well, up in Frisco with the police department? Yeah. Only up there, they don't like it when you call it Frisco. Yeah. He's in robbery detail. Called him last night. All three kids had their tonsils out the same day. Thought it'd be nice to call, see how they were. All three at once? Yeah. Tonsils and nothing these days. How'd they make out? Good. They're home already. What's the letter got to do with it? Oh, well, my brother told me he was sending down some dope on four pretty rough characters. Thinks they're headed our way, sending mug shots, too. You and your brother running a detective agency on the side? Mm, it's a little irregular. The official correspondence will come a little later. What do you know about the guys? Almost killed a man. I didn't get any details. It's all in the letter. Mm -hmm. Ought to be here any minute. Mailed it at noon yesterday. How come you moved down here with your family, Frank? Don't you like it up north? Well, like L.A. better. More elbow room. Here you live in a house and lot, not just an apartment. Uh, I get it. Robbery, Freddy. This is Wilson. Tony Sharp, is that, Joe? Yeah, I think so. Hold up, will you? Tony here? Huh? Oh, I didn't see you behind that paper. For me? Yeah, he's here. Well, if he's not busy, ask him to come over to order, sir. Especially a couple of Mexican girls. Can't speak English. Well, I guess we can spare him for a while. I'll tell him. What's up? Well, that's uh, Wilson, an auto detail. He'd like you to go over and ask the interpreter for a couple of Mexican girls. Are they pretty? You're not going down there to marry him. I'll bet you wow him at party. Mm, nothing much doing. Slow day. They don't come often enough for me. If they did, we'd be out of a job. It was one of those rare slow days. We killed a couple of hours going over the daily reports. Cleaned out the top drawer of my desk, sharpened a few pencils. At 10.15 a.m., the special delivery letter came from Franks. He slipped the top open with his pocket knife and shook out four mug shots. Here it is. Following four men wanted for robberies, auto thefts, and safe burglaries in San Francisco Bay Area. Cliff Small, 19. George Shum, 20. Both escaped from Preston. Julius Carver, 18, Fred Malik, 20, both Army deserters. Well, that checks out with that APB from SF last week. What do the records look like? Small shot an Army captain during an argument at a bar. And on two capers, these men shot it out with us and escaped. Information shows all four left for Los Angeles several days ago. Driving stolen car, blue Chevrolet, probably using cold plates. Mm -hmm. Let me see those mug shots. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Well, now we know who we're looking for. Brother, tell us where. Just a couple of nice girls that got mixed up with the wrong guys. Take a look at these pictures, will you, Tony? Oh, the marks from San Francisco. Yeah. 
Says they're in a stolen car, cold place. That's how these girls were picked up, in a hot car. Huh? They went for a ride with a couple of guys they met at a movie. When the car ran out of gas, the boys dug, the girls got picked up. Did they have a lead on the guy? No, not a thing. The young guys? Around 20. You think these might be the ones from Frisco? Well, let's talk to the girls. Come on. Uh, Frank, you want to cover the office? Oh, yeah, sure. Do they speak English at all? Not enough to make sense. That's Dolores, and this one is Marie. Wendy. Senorita, that's the senores son empleados the robbery detail. They say in a terra of status, algunos preguntas. Nosotras no hicimos nada. Nada. She says they didn't do anything. I suppose they told you all they know already. They're not much help. They say they don't know anything about the fellows they were with. Show them these. Ask them if they've ever seen them before. Yeah. Conocen a estos de estos individuos. These are the guys who took them out last night? Ask them. Uh, ¿Quieren decir que estos dos son los que los llevaron una noche? Sí. ¿Ellos son? Carver and Malik, the army deserters. Ask them to describe them, will you? Uh, ¿Cómo eran los muchachos? Ya le decimos. Estuvimos en el carro todo el tiempo. Estaba oscuro. Pero parecían muy guapos. Y hablaban bien. She says they sat in the car all the time it was dark. But they looked very handsome and they talked nice. Where did the fellas pick them up? They told me in front of the Jubilee Theater, second and Broadway. Yeah. And then what? And the girls couldn't understand English, but they understood when the boys motioned them to hop in. Yeah. Uh, and I said, Tato, ustedes paseos con extraños antes. Por supuesto que no. María creo haberlos visto en la iglesia el domingo. She says no. María thought she recognized them from church Sunday. Pero estaba equivocada. But she was mistaken. Must have been some date. The boys couldn't talk Spanish and the girls couldn't talk English. Where'd they go on this ride, Tony? They don't know the streets. They just know they got to the beach and then they turned around and were about halfway back when the car ran out of gas. Mm. Ask them again. See if you can get Marie here to talk. Uh, Maria. Sí. Eh, ¿Qué camino tomaron para ir a la playa? Yo no sé. Ay, María. Primero, paramos cerca de un hotel, hotelito. Esperamos mientras los muchachos llevaron a un perito y lo dejaron en su cuarto. She doesn't know, but she remembers they stopped near a little hotel. The girls waited while the boys took a little puppy out of their car and put it in their room. A puppy? Well, if they don't know where the hotel was, maybe they can tell us what it was near. ¿Qué edificios había cerca del hotel? En la esquina había una estación de gasolina. And she says there was a gas station on the corner. What else? ¿Qué más? Del otro lado de los rieles había dos o tres garajes. Dos o tres. Creo que sí, dos o tres. Mm. She says across the car tracks there were two or three big garages. Yeah. Oh, could be in the West Lake District. Mm -hmm. Lots of garages and second-way hotels around there. The East First Street. Mm -hmm. Maybe Grand Avenue Pico. Pico! Pico! Ahora me acuerdo. Esa calle era Pico! We took the girls with us and drove out to Grand and Pico, and then up and down Pico slow until the girls pointed out a hotel just south of Flower. They weren't sure. Ben and I got out. We walked up to the hotel desk. The clerk was just starting to vacuum. We're looking for Julius Carver and Fred Malik. Are they staying here? What's the name? Can't hear you over the vacuum. Julius Carver and Fred Malik? No, I'm not here. Police officers. You take a look at these pictures? Well, could have been two of the boys who checked out this morning, but they didn't look as tough as this. How many were there? Four. Here are two more pictures. Can you have a look, please? Could be. About the right age. How long did they stay? Just two nights. Did they have a pup with them? What? I said they have a pup with them. A puppy dog? Yes, they did. Just a little collie pup. Did they pay up? No, they skipped out, owing me two days. Can we see how they registered, please? Shut off this dang vacuum. person can't hardly hear himself think over that dragon. Now, you want to see the register. We use cards here. Let me see. Now, here they are. Bob 
Bob Reynolds, Jack Sharp, Jim Smith, and uh, William Grant, Las Vegas, Nevada. I have to pick those names out of a hat. They say where they were going. No, no forwarding address. Do they write these cards out themselves? You bet they did. That's the law. You mind if we borrow them for a while? We'll have them photostatted and return to you. We're supposed to keep them, you know. You'll get them back. I like to do everything legal. Are those boys in some kind of trouble? They leave anything in their room? They did. It's all in the vacuum. If they happen to come back, give us a ring, will you? Here's that card. Robbery detail. Who'd they rob? They took you for two days, right? It was 2 p.m. when Tony Chappells picked us up. He had Frank O'Donnell with him. We stopped at a dairy lunch, and I called the office, and we split up into two teams. While Tony and Frank checked parking lots in the neighborhood for stolen cars, Ben and I ran down the other hotel. In the next three hours, we talked to a dozen desk clerks and rooming house managers. Always the same answer, no. 5.30 p.m., we tried the Achilles Hotel on Grand Avenue. We walked into an overheated lobby crowded with modern furniture. There were a couple of canary cages in front of a faded wall tapestry. The desk clerk was a woman in her early 40s. Good afternoon, ma'am. Police officer. Police officer. Walter! Walter, will you see what these policemen want? Well, just take a minute. We'd like to know if you recognize these pictures here. No. This one? No. No, we only take in honest, hard-working men. Sure. I don't like anybody lazing around the rooms all day. It keeps me from cleaning up. Maybe your room has got a collie pup. A dog? I'd die before I'd allow a dog in this house. Well, if these fellas with a dog try to rent a room, would you please for us? Here's the number. Lily. Now, get on back in there, honey, where it's nice and warm. Go on, Lily. Go on, go on. Lily's on the nest now. Yes, ma'am. We'd appreciate you watching for these men. For your own protection, too. No, I'll let you know. Thank you, ma'am. Let's go back. Well, say, before you go, would you gentlemen do me a favor, seeing as how you're a policeman? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Marinelli up in room 14 is a week behind his rent. Would you do me a favor and go up and talk to him? I'm sorry, lady. We can't handle that. That's a civil matter. I'd advise you to go to room 260 down to City Hall. See the city attorney. They'll help you. Well, then what did I tell you? They won't do it. That's the way it went. It was dark out now and getting cold again. We walked back to Pico and Flower to pick up Frank and Tony. Tony was there waiting for us. All right. Come on up to the next corner. Frank's up there. He's got a hot car stake up. Yeah. Just half a block from the hotel where the guy checked out. You had any luck? No. Did you find anything in the car? Key's still in it, nothing else. I could have stolen it last night after they left the girl. Huh? I called in and checked. It was taken in front of uh, 1192 Doheny Drive between 2 and 4 this morning. We got out of code for it. Mm -hmm. That's about six blocks from where they ditched the car with the girls in it. Yeah, we're out of gas. It's all downhill. It would have been a natural way for them to go. Could be the right car. Better keep the stake out. Yeah. All oh, right, hi, Frank. All right. You do any good? No. Frank, you mm -hmm. and Tony want to go eat, and Ben and I'll cover the car. When you get back, we'll go for chow. Good deal. Swell. Come on. Well, let's sit in the car, huh? Yeah, all right. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, get the radio on. Want a cigarette? No, all right. What do you think? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's the same guys, maybe not. In the same neighborhood. A couple of things might tie in. I yeah, can't be sure. So we're really making headway. About all we know is they're in town. Yeah, and it's a good-sized town. Right now, it's the biggest in the world. 7 p.m. We knew the four gunmen were in town. We knew they'd been seen. We figured there was no reason for them to skip town until they pulled a job or heard that we were looking for them. Time was in their favor. Time to rob, time to kill, time to get away. The check on the hotels continued. We left Frank O'Donnell and Tony Chavez on the stakeout, and Ben and I picked up the hotel routine, one place after another. 8.30 p.m. We walked down a long, narrow lobby to a little bald-headed man at the desk. He was wearing glasses and reading a magazine called Astrology. When we walked in, he tried to hide the bottle. Police officer. <coughs> oh. Would you take a look at these pictures, please? <clears throat> what for? See if you can identify them. No. No, they don't look familiar to me. They may be carrying a collie pup. Collie pup? Hmm. Let me see those pictures again. All right. Mm. They look familiar now? They had a pup with them, all right. Yes. 
I think so. I study faces. Yes? The same. Are they here? I don't know. You mean they're out for the evening? I don't know. Are they registered here? Yes, they are. What room? Are they expecting you? Now, listen. This is important. Just answer the question. What did they do? What's their room number? Uh, second floor, room 22. Do you have a key? Uh, just a second. Here, thank you. Come on, Ben. Cover me, huh? Yeah. 22. Give me the key. Yeah. Now watch it. Maybe we're home. Clothes, shoes, all this stuff's here. They'll be back. You are listening to Dragnet for the step-by-step -step solution to an actual police case. Here, step-by-step, -step are the reasons why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers from coast to coast. Step one... The name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Step two, long cigarette smokers discover Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Step three, long cigarette smokers find Fatima extra mild. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why more and more smokers every day agree it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, the name Fatima on that golden yellow package is your insurance of an extra mild smoke. So enjoy king-size Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. In the files of the Los Angeles Police Department, there are countless case histories that never got space in the daily newspapers. The case of Cliff Small, George Shum, Julius Carver, and Fred Malik was one of these. Four young hoodlums wanted for a series of robberies and petty burglaries. These men were armed, and they'd shown that they wouldn't hesitate to shoot. By comparison with the sensational crime headline, the news value of this story rated an inch of type on the fourth page of the second section. Yet the line separating these four young thieves from banner headlines and back page space is much thinner than the average citizen realizes. The danger in a criminal case isn't always determined by the space allotted to it in the newspapers. Many a peace officer's name has appeared in the obituary column of the same newspaper that allotted one inch of back page space to the crime story that was considered unimportant. I phoned the office and asked for two men to cover the stolen car. And as soon as the replacements arrived, Frank O'Donnell and Tony Chavez left the stake out on the stolen car and joined us at the hotel. It was 8.55 p.m. So when are they due back? Any idea? No, sir. I told these other officers... I did tell you, didn't I? Yeah, you said they were out for the evening. That's it. I knew I told you something. Was it you two? Or was it you two? It was this fellow and I. Oh, yeah. I don't remember things I say so good. But I know faces. Things. Uh, you're the manager here? Oh, no. This place belongs to Claude. Claude who? Timmy. Then you're in charge now. Only when Claude's not around. This is one of his places. Where are we going to stake out, Joe? Not enough room to turn around this lobby. That's what I've been telling Claude. Uh, Claude Timmy. This is one of his places. Yeah, maybe you better leave that bottle alone when we get this straightened out, huh? Oh, no, I don't hit it heavy anymore. Just a little nip now and again. Crafty in here. Any idea where we can wait for these fellows and keep an eye on the lobby? No, not enough room in this lobby to turn around in. I said that to Claude. Yeah, we know. Hey, clerk, what does this door lead to? <laughs> no, don't go in there. Is there a light in here? <laughs> I save old bottles. Ragman gives me a penny each for them. Is that a storage room? What's that? That room over there. Oh, that's the linen room. We keep all the linen there. That's about the only place there is, Joe. That's the one to wait out in the car. All right, we'll wait in there. Now, there's a couple of chairs in there. I'll send the boys back when they come in. Be better if you tell them nothing. How are they going to know you're here? We'll tell them. You just don't say anything. All right, sir. Now then, I can just have your names. I'll see that the boys get the message. Now, look, mister. 
You just sit there and read your magazine. Don't say anything. You got that? Okay. That's the way you want it? Come on, let's go. I can get you, gentlemen. No, you just stay at the desk, will you please? Say, Claude Tinney's his name. He's the manager. Remember you asked me about that? Yeah, yeah, we know. What do you want him for? Look, you're gonna have to stay away from this door. We don't want him to know we're here. Okay. That's the way you want it. I could use a cigarette. Yeah. All we need in here now. Smoke. What time is it, Frank? Oh, never mind. Frank, Tony, stay here. Right. All right. We're checking out tomorrow. It's Carver and Malik. Let's go, Ben. Yeah, come on. Now, get your hands up. Hey, what's going on? Stand still. Okay. What's the beef, Frisco? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a 380 automatic on Carver. 38 caliber revolver in this hip pocket. Another 38 on Malik. Go oh, hold it. That's it. Put out your hands. Cuff, Joe. There you go. Where are your pals? What pals? Cliff Small and George Shum. We know you're running with them. You know that? You know where they are? How old are you? 18. What's your name? Fred Mallet. 20. Total. Yeah. You and Frank want to take them downtown? Right. We'll see you down there. Let's go, Frank. Say, you got them, huh? Got two of them. We're going to wait for the other two now. You just play it straight and stay away from that linen room. How long are you going to be in there? Chambermaid starts making up the beds around 7 a.m. She'll have to be getting out that linen in there. It's only 10.30, lots of time. We change the sheets three times a week in this hotel. Not a worry in the world. Just get back in there. I know what that smell is in here. It's all. Yeah. Oh, I forgot about that pup. That'll be the tip off. I'll go get him. Oh, come on, little fellow. Here we go. Come on, boy. Hmm. He's hungry, Joe. Yeah. Look, I'll put him down on the floor. Don't step on him.
York again. Well, say, listen. I've been all over the lobby. You fellas are in the clear. What do you mean? That dog of theirs. He's gone. You're in the clear. Look, he's in here with us. Now, will you stay away from here, please? Yeah, it's okay. The dog's gone. Hey, Pop, give me the key for room 22. Yes, sir. That's their room. Come on. Yeah. Get your hands up. Watch him, Joe. Wait a minute, you. You hold it. Get your hands Come up, on. please. All right. Hands up. Oh. You didn't have to slap me. You didn't have to pull that gun. All right, now over here. Stand still. 38 revolver on this one. Well, here it is, 45 Colt. What's your names? I'm Cliff Small. He's George Shum. How old are you? 19. Cops? We weren't. You'd be in a lot more trouble than you are. That's all of us. Yeah. Now let's feed that pup. 12.15 a.m., we took the prisoner down to the city hall to the interrogation room. Tony Chavez and Frank O'Donnell were there with the other two, Carver and Malik. While Ben helped question the suspects and made out the necessary reports, I went across the street to the federal cafe. I picked up two 10-cent bottles of milk and a few slices of bread. <laughs> Look at him go. He was hungry. Yeah. How'd you come out? Well, I got it all here. Oh, let's see. Four stolen cars, eight known robbers in San Francisco that they copped out to. Three jobs in Portland, they admitted. You remember that Bakersfield liquor store hold up about four weeks ago? The Watson job? They pull that? Yeah, probably a lot more. They haven't told us all of it yet. Get that out of an APB. We'll probably get a lot more warrants on it. Well, that's it. None of them read more well enough to vote yet, but they've committed practically every crime in the book. There's just one thing more left to work out. What do we do with the pup? How about the SPCA? That's my home for him. No, not this little guy. Why don't you take him, Tony? You got kids. You got a deal. Aquí. Aquí, Felipe. Eh, tu madre era cole, pero de hoy en adelante eres cero policía. Translation. Your mother was a cole, but from now on you're a police dog. just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On February 9th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 88, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, king-size Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Long cigarette smokers find Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Long cigarette smokers find that Fatima is extra mild because it's the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. So enjoy extra mild Fatima. Best of all, long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Clifford Small, George Shum, Julius Carver, and Fred Malick were released to San Francisco authorities where they were tried and convicted on eight counts of robbery in the first degree. A hold was placed on them by the state of Oregon. They are now serving their terms in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. Tomorrow, hear the Ronald Coleman's charming series, The Halls of Ivy, on NBC. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. <laughs> Thank you.
Detective Sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. Attempts have been made on the life of a notorious hoodlum in your city. His death could mean an open gang war. Your job, stop it. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke king-size Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild. Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, July 18th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 5.35 p.m. when we got out of the car at Sunset Boulevard and Paris Avenue and walked down the street to the scene of the machine gunning, Lupo's Cafe. Look at that, Jill. Yeah. Ripped up the whole front of the place. Yeah. Hi. Yes, sir. Romero and Friday, homicide. Oh, I'm Sheldon from Hollywood Division. Taylor and I picked up the call in our car. Nobody hurt. What's the story? Just a second. It's Captain Elliot. Hold it a minute, will you, Sheldon? Hi. Hi, Captain. Hmm. Not much of it left. Sheldon here was in the cruiser car. He'll fill us in. All right. The intended victim was Gus Valentine. He's over there with Taylor, my partner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. According to Valentine, he stopped in the restaurant here for a drink. He was in there about 15 minutes, came out to hail a cab, and this car came around the corner. Down there, Sunset and Clayton. They whipped by close to the curb and opened up. Mm -hmm. There's a laundry there on one side of the place and a dry cleaning joint on the other side. Yes, sir. Miracle, but nobody was hit. You get anything on the car? Something so far happened so fast, nobody got a good look at it. How about Valentine? Does he have any idea? I don't know. Taylor's getting the information. Nobody saw anything? Any witnesses? Uh, yes, sir. A couple. Uh, newsboy Tim Benson, the lady in the dry cleaning place, Agnes Rebart. Mm -hmm. Neither of them got a license number. Okay. I'd like to talk to Valentine. But Sheldon, keep the area clear, will you? We'll have men are on their way out. Yes, sir. Come on. I have many ideas. Green Fort Sedan, that it? Yeah. Elliot, Central Homicide. Yes, sir. This is Mr. Valentine, the intended victim. Yeah. This is Sergeant Friday, Sergeant Romero. Sergeant Friday, how are you? Fine. It's been a long time. Finally got out of the uniform, huh? Seven years ago. Who was it, Gus? If I knew, I'd tell you. I don't like being shot at. Let's go sit in the car. This way, Valentine. You want to get him back? All right. All right. What's the story, Valentine? How do you mean? Let's not play it cozy. Who's after you? I suppose this would have happened if I knew. Who's carrying the beef? Somebody's unhappy with you. You must know who. I don't. You know what kind of a car it was? I told the other cop over there. Sedan. Green Ford. We're not going to press you, Valentine. You might as well know how we pegged this kind of thing. Yeah? We got your number. Had it for a long time. You're all up and down the blotter from Lincoln Heights to the county jail. You got a record everybody in this town knows about. Aren't you a little mixed up? I'm the guy that got shot at. We know that. I pay my taxes for protection, not a lecture on my past. Let me give you the word, Valentine. I've known you for a long time, and I've read about you in the newspapers. I've watched your so-called climb from two-bit penny ante rackets all the way up. Now, you've been told more than once about keeping your nose clean. This is a switch, isn't it? Man got shot at, cop freed, riot act, innocent victim. Look. 
We know you, and we know that crowd you run with. If you want to start a war, run a battlefield. Don't pick the streets of Los Angeles to fight it out. I think I asked for it the way you men talk. You did somewhere up and down the line. We know your operation. You walk the sideline marker all the way. Always got one foot inside the law. When you make yourself a target for some punk's machine gun, that's where you step outside. Oh, what are you going to do? Eat me out and let the man with a machine gun get away? We'll get him. Whether you want to help us or not, we just don't have the time to run around jamming a cork in the barrel of every gun in town. Before you get out of this car, let this sink in. There's not going to be any innocent people cut down by bullets that were meant for you. Oh, I get it. My tax money's no good, huh? I pay a bigger chunk than most of the clouds in this town. You haven't got a clear title to the city yet, and until you do, don't set up a shooting gun. Well, what do I do? Dig a foxhole? Will you get ready to tap whoever's taking pot shots at me? You can tell us who it is. You got all I know. Don't you think I'd want him picked up? I think you're a liar. I think you better square your beef and knock off this gangster stuff. It's not going to be any more of this kind of thing, understand? That's the trouble with civil service. It makes a big man out of you 200 bucks a month. I've never passed an exam, but I keep in step. You missed the first one from the gutter to the sidewalk. Almost without exception, every city in the United States has its Gus Valentine. These men remain out of custody, not because of any lack of law enforcement, but because of their ability to hide behind the laws which are designed to protect the innocent and use them to their own advantage. They operate allowing only the thinnest margin possible between themselves and the state penitentiary. We drove back to Central Division. At 6.18 p.m., we were called to the chief of detectives' office. He wouldn't give you anything, huh? Not a thing. Usual line of smart talk. Who's ever after him meant business. Our storefronts were a mess. Well, no, they won't quit now. Just a minute. What's that intelligence number? 2821. Oh, yeah. Miss Brown, Captain White gone home? Oh, no, I'll ask him to come up to the office, will you please? Thanks. If they do manage to tag Valentine, it could cause a pretty sour mess. He's got enough flunkies around to parlay it into a fair-sized shooting war. Seen him started on less. Was there any chance of pulling Valentine in until things simmer down? No chance. We've got nothing on him, nothing we can prove. We've got a few boys close to him. Maybe one of them could tell us. Mm, same two lawyers work for all of them. We'd pull him in, they'd be out in an hour in a wrist. You want to see me? Yeah, all right. Sit down. But uh, Valentine's shooting this afternoon. Yeah. What's your guess? There's been some talk. We heard he was hot. You knew that. Yeah. The way we figured, he's getting too big for his pants. He's coming up fast. Stepped on a lot of toes on the way. Shouldn't be too tough to find out why. That's half of it. If we get that much, maybe we can find out who. You got a big field to pick from. I can find you a dozen possibles. No, we don't need a dozen. All we want are the ones in the car this afternoon. Who do you figure, Captain Roy? Well, I kind of go along with Joe. Like I said, I think maybe we'll be able to peg the fly a little faster. And we can go from there. All right. Well, let's take what we know about the guy. Let's just take this past year. We know he's got more than a good share of the Mexican narcotics traffic. That means he's taking business from the Eastern Syndicate. That makes one of those boys a candidate. That's right. Then there's the pinball machines. He's given Big Ernie Jacobs and Monk Watson a big push on those. That puts them in the running. Yeah, it's a long list. The horses, fancy poker games, prostitution, the works. He's squeezing them all. A lot of guys could be shooting at him with a machine gun. Where do we start? Leg work, lots of it, fast. We'll start nosing around, see what we can pick up. Friday, uh, you and Romero can give us a hand there. Yes, sir. All right, with you, Elliot. Fine. I don't have to tell you we've got to move as quick as we can. We've got a lot of places to hit, and we haven't got too much time. We'll keep Valentine under surveillance to make sure he doesn't try to square things with a gun. Yeah. This is one the taxpayers wouldn't understand. Yeah. Trying to keep a guy alive that'd be more dangerous dead. Wednesday, July 19th. Ben and I started making the rounds to find out why someone was out to get Gus Valentine. The captain was right. The list of his enemies was long. For two days, we talked to gamblers and bartenders at the usual hangouts. The few slim leads we picked up led nowhere. Saturday, July 22nd, we met with one of Ben's informants, a bar boy at a cafe out on Santa Monica Boulevard. That's him over there at that table. Oh, yeah. Jerry? How are you? Hiya, Ben. Grab a chair. You know my partner, don't you? Sure, sit down, Joe. Uh, want a beer? No, no thanks. We're working. Coke? You're okay. Well, one's enough. We'll do it. Good and cold. Uh, 
doctor cut me down one beer a day. Well, I don't know. It's a spot on a hot day, don't it? Yeah. What about Valentine? What about him? You hear anything since I phoned you? A couple of things. Word's getting around. He's a welcher. Horses? I don't know. Big money. He hasn't paid off yet. Who does he owe? I can give you the name of one of them. Sal Tapper. I don't know him. Meatpacking business. Wholesaler. Got a big plant down at 54th and commercial. Owns a little neighborhood bar. That's where he spends most of his time. Where's that? Gardena. Hmm. Calls it the Mile High. Well, what about this Sal Tapper? What do you mean? How close is he to Valentine? You mean one of his boys? Yeah. No. Valentine's his book. That's all. Supposing Valentine owed him a wad of dough, would he push his point? How do you mean? Would he use pressure to collect? Maybe a meat cleaver, not a machine gun. I don't figure him in on that Tuesday caper. Sure you don't want this set of coke? No, thank you. What time do you go to work? Plenty of time. <sighs> One bottle of beer ain't hardly enough. Any rumbles about the shooting? How do you mean? Anything worth repeating? Oh, everybody says the same thing. He's got it coming. Who is everybody? The homeowners, neighborhood Joe's, they got it all pegged. What's the popular guess? A dame. Well, what's about it, huh, Jerry? What's about it? What's your guess? Fresh out, I don't know. How come you guys are so worried about Gus Valentine? I didn't think you care whether he lived or died. Either way, we're in trouble. We left the cafe on Santa Monica Boulevard and drove out to Gardena to the Mile High Bar. It was a typical neighborhood tavern with the windows painted in black except for two small ovals in the center of each window. They were filled with beer signs and red neon. The cloth sign advertised shuffleboard and life-size television. Inside, the walls were covered with alpine mountain climbers trying to fight their way up a mountain that looked twice as steep as the Matterhorn. Can you tell Nichols when you're alone? Can you tell us where we can find the Sal Tapper? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks, Lynn. What do you want? Police officers. I'd like to talk to you. Sure, what about? Gus Valentine. Yeah? He owes me money. Is that all you've got against him? As much as he owes me, that's enough. It's a real tough machine to make. How much money does he owe you? Enough. How long has he been booking for you? I didn't say he was booking for me. No, we did. About two years. Come on. Come on. Get it. Ah. Four thousand on the first ball. I got to do better than that. Where were you Tuesday afternoon? At the packing house. Can you prove it? Would I say it if I couldn't prove it? When that little gate up there turns green and you go through it, you get an extra ball. It's red, it doubles your score, but it's real tough to get in there. How long has Valentine owed you money? Oh, a little over a week. When did he say he'd pay you? He didn't say. Said he was trying to raise the dog. You're the only one he owes? No. guys in town. You know who they are? No. How do you know he owes somebody besides you? I heard. Did he say why he hasn't paid up? Uh, what'd you say? Did he say why he hasn't paid up? I told you. He said he was trying to raise the money. You sure you haven't tried to put the bite on him? Sure I have. Sure I have. I want the dog. But I didn't gun him. Somebody did. Yeah, I know. No, it wasn't me. You had a reason. It's a lot of people. Yeah. We're looking for the one with the machine gun. Well, I can't help you there. Oh, come on. Oh. Get in there. Hey, hey, look at that. Free ball. It's 26,000. Now, that's a real tough machine to beat. What did you say you worked using? At my packing plant, 54th and commercial. Okay. How long have you known Gus Valentine? About four years. I met him at a party out in Hollywood. It's the first time I've ever known him to Welch. Mm-hmm. Hey, 
in there. No. Uh, 27,000. I'm not doing so good, am I? I don't know. It depends on where you were Tuesday. 12.30 p.m. We talked with the superintendent of Taffer's meatpacking house. He told us that Sal Tapper had been there all day when Gus Valentine was shot at. We talked to several employees of the plant. They corroborated his story. We checked Tapper out and found him to be a fairly respectable businessman who gambled a great deal on the side, but we felt reasonably sure that he had no part in the shooting. We knew that if we could run down the others to whom Valentine owed money, we'd be closer to finding out why he was being shot at and eventually get to the right man. 1.45 p.m., Ben and I went upstairs to the eighth floor of the city hall, the lunchroom. We had a sandwich and coffee. Too close to dinner to have a piece of that pie, isn't it? Yeah, I'd say so. Hand me another napkin, will you? No. Oh, yeah, thank you. Think you'd do any good to talk to Valentine again? Maybe, I doubt it. He's not going to tell us anything. I figure we're on the right track. A lot of reasons why he might be a target, but this welching business, that's new to him. Could be. You Sergeant Friday? That's right. Telephone. Wait a minute, I'll go with you. I'm finished. No, you got the check. I'll get the tip. All right. Hello? Slide this phone over, will you? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Friday. Elliot, come down to Chief Brown's office right away. Yes, sir. Let's go. Well, I sure did look good. Come on, let's get that elevator. Yeah. Hey, who called? The skipper. He wants us to go to Chief Brown's office. Campbell Street floor, please. What's up? I don't know. You make the rounds again tonight? Yeah. A couple places we can hit in the south end of town. I called Charlie Flint's place this afternoon. Maybe he'll have something for us. Yeah, I hope so. Come on. Uh, wish now I'd had that pie. I'm still hungry. I got a candy bar in my desk. You can have that. I can't eat those two bars in late. Oh, it's some kind of a fudge bar. Oh, sorry. Come in. Yes. Get over to Georgia Street right away. Why? Gus Valentine. They did it again. Yeah. This time they didn't miss. Listening to Dragnet for the step by step solution to an actual police case. Here, step by step, are the reasons why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers from coast to coast. Step one the name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Step two long cigarette smokers discover Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Step three, long cigarette smokers find Fatima extra mild. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why more and more smokers every day agree it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, the name Fatima on that golden yellow package is your insurance of an extra mile smoke. So enjoy King Size Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. Saturday, July 22nd, 5.30 p.m. We drove to the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital and went up to the third floor. We talked to the doctor in charge who told us that two slugs had been taken from Gus Valentine's right leg and one from his right shoulder. They had been marked for identification. He was in fair condition. We talked with the patrolman who made the ambulance follow up. They told us Valentine had been shot as he entered his apartment house garage. There were no eyewitnesses. We went in and talked to Valentine. You told the officers that the guy who shot you was on foot. Yeah. Who was it? Couldn't tell. You haven't any idea who it could have been? No. You don't expect us to swallow that again, do you? I don't care either way. Why don't you pay up what you owe? What do you mean? You owe some big money you haven't paid off. Where'd you get that? That's the word going around. Looks to us like you either pay up or get shot up. Did I ask for advice? No, and here's something else you didn't ask for. Twice in one week you've been mixed up in shooting scrapes. We told you the city doesn't belong to you. I don't claim ownership. Now listen, 
We've been over this before, and this is the last time. Don't push us any courage. We know you talk big, and you haven't got the guts to go along with it. Yeah, you. sure. Now, come on. Who's shooting at you? I know your phone number. I'll call you if I need help. I'll take care of this myself. Valentine, the first time you pull a cap gun, we're going to sit on you. If there's any retaliating, we'll do it. I'm tired of sitting like a duck on a pond. Then tell us who's gunning for you. That's between me and them. I'll meet them when I'm ready. All right. We're through talking. When we get to the bottom of this and find out who's been doing all the shooting, we'll have an answer. And if we find out you've been withholding evidence, it's going to go hard for you, understand? Yeah, sure. Now leave me alone. Come on, me. Yeah. I better call the office. Homicide, Graham. Captain Elliot there? I'll see. Captain, will you take two? Elliot? This is Friday, checking in on the Valentine thing. What's the story? Couldn't get anything out of him. He isn't hurt bad. Right leg and shoulder. All right. Here's something you run down. Yeah? Got a tip from White in Intelligence. He's got a man out at Freddy's Fish and Chips on Slauson. Says a couple of guys in there blowing off about Valentine. Who are they? Billy Keel and Tony Farrar. Uh -huh. They're not on Valentine's team. That's right. White's man says the party's getting rough out there. You, Romero, better follow up on it. Right. Another thing, if it looks like anything, you better bring him in for questioning. Okay. Check me when you get in. Right. Let's go. Where is it? Keel and Farrar. Skipper wants us to pick him up and bring him in for questioning. What do they know about the shooting? They know enough to talk about it. 7 p.m. We located Freddy's Fish and Chips place on Slauson near Montgomery Street. A dozen or so tables at the back of the restaurant were already taken with the overflow lined up too deep at the bar. The man from intelligence detail was down at the far end of the steam table nursing a cheese sandwich. He motioned us over and pointed out Billy Keel and Tony Ferrar. They were sitting at one of the tables along with four other men drinking boiler makers and eating French fried potatoes. Ben and I made our way through the crowd toward the back tables. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Pardon me. Can I get through here, please? All right. So I figured. Don it. You, Billy Keel. That's right. Which one's Tony Farrar? He's getting a beer. What do you want? Police officers want to talk to you and Farrar downtown. What's the matter? I'd like to ask you a few questions. You want to get your hat? You got any questions? You can ask them here. Hey, Vic, how about buying around? Come on, Keel. Let's go. I got nothing to tell you now. Let me alone. There's two ways to go downtown, the hard way and the easy way. Let's take the easy way. All right. This way. Okay. One of the officers in the ambulance follow-up drove our car back to the city hall. Tony Farrar and Billy Keel were taken to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital for emergency treatment. We went in the same ambulance. Ben had a broken index finger, a two-inch cut in his scalp, and a deep gash in his right thigh. I had five stitches taken in my upper right arm and three above my left eye. My right eye was swollen shut. The man from intelligence detail was taken to the PNF ward to be treated for a minor concussion. It was 9.15 p.m. when we got back to the city hall, the interrogation room. 
How about it, Keel? What? What do you know about the Valentine shooting? I don't know anything about it. You're worried. About what? You tell us. You started that fight out there. I didn't see any reason to go downtown. Does Valentine owe you any money? No. You've been talking a lot. Any law against that? Why'd you shoot Gus Valentine? I didn't shoot him. Can you account for your time Tuesday afternoon? I don't have to answer that. Where were you this afternoon? My lawyer's coming in. Ask him. How much money does Valentine owe you? Kill. Ever see this before? I don't even know what it is. You found that machine gun in your apartment. Doesn't belong to me. We got your car downstairs. Green Ford sedan. Doesn't belong to me. White slip's got your name on it. Here's something else with your name on it. Two chits for $750 signed by Gus Valentine. Money he owes you on the horses. You shot him, didn't you? I don't see how you can prove it. I'll tell you how. We ran this Tommy gun through the crime lab. We dug the same slugs out of the front of those stores where you tried to kill Valentine. Your prints are all over the gun. How much more do you want? It's not my gun. All we got to do is find the 45 you used this afternoon and match it up with the slugs we dug out of Valentine's leg, and Mr. You'll be away for a long time. All right. We used the Tommy gun. We didn't hit him. Didn't try. Only wanted to scare him. I got tired of waiting for my dough. I got no use for a Welcher. What about this afternoon? No, sir. Me and Farrar didn't have nothing to do with that. I'll take the machine gun wrap, but it wasn't us this afternoon. Elliot, Friday, step outside a minute. Yeah. Valentine. Yeah? Somebody just blew his hospital room full of holes. It took us 17 minutes with red light and siren to get to the Ferndale Sanitarium where Gus Valentine was recovering from his gunshot wounds. Three cruiser cars were out front when we pulled up. We went to room 12 in the west wing. There's the doctor, Joe. Yeah. How is he, doctor? He was dead when we got in here. He had a private nurse. Shot her, too. Dead. Anyone else hurt? It was visiting hours. Some woman was in there talking to him. She got hit. We're treating her down in the emergency room. Uh, appreciate it, doctor, if you keep your staff out of the room here until we finish our investigation. Yes, sir. Thank you. Let's have a look inside. Mm-hmm. Look at that. Oh. <laughs> didn't fool this time. Too bad he wouldn't give us more help. Yeah. We're no worse off than we were. We still have to find out who it was without him. I hope we can get to him before Valentine's crowd starts shooting back. We got to. Anyway, this cancels out his debts. You know his record. Yeah. He owed a lot more than he could ever pay. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 26th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 97, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, king-size Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Long cigarette smokers find Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Long cigarette smokers find that Fatima is extra mild because it's the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. So enjoy extra mild Fatima. Best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Billy Keel and Tony Farrar were tried and convicted of assault with intent to commit murder. They were filed on by the federal authorities, Bureau of Alcohol and Tax Unit, for the illegal possession of a machine gun and were found guilty in federal court. Because they were both in custody at the time of Gus Valentine's murder, they were cleared of any complicity of the crime. Valentine's killer was still at large. Next week, The Big Gangster, Part 2. You have just heard Dragnet, 
Authenticated. To authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Today, the American Red Cross is carrying on a campaign to finance one of the greatest programs in peacetime history. Give now to the Red Cross. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portions transcribed from Los Angeles. The story you're about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A notorious hoodlum in your city has been shot to death. A gang war is threatened if his followers seek revenge. Your job, find the killers. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke king-size Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers coast to coast. So enjoy Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild. Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Saturday, July 22nd. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 10 p.m. when we walked out of the murder room at the Ferndale Sanitarium and went down to the end of the hall, the emergency room. I'm sorry. I know this hurts. You have to irrigate the wound. Where are the bullets that were removed from his skull? Right on the table, Doctor. There they are, Captain Lloyd. Thank you. Romero, you want a marker for evidence? All right. Thanks. Doctor? Yes, sir. Wonder if it'd be all right if we asked Miss Stallings a few questions. I think so. She's still in a bad state of shock. If it'll be as brief as possible. Yes, sir. Miss Stallings, these men are police officers. This is Captain Elliot. This is Sergeant Flighty, all right? That's right. It's my partner, Sergeant Romero. Yes. You were in the room when Gus Valentine was shot? Yes. Do you feel up to telling us what happened? No, excuse me, please. Shall I? I have to paint this. Get the compress on it. You were visiting Valentine? Well, you better wait until the nurse finishes up there. All right, sorry. She got hit twice, just flesh wounds, but the very painful. Yeah. Excuse me. Surely. You're all right. I can reach it. <laughs> yes. All right. You were in the room when Valentine was shot? Yes, I saw it. Did you get a look at the men that did the shooting? I don't remember. Did you describe them? I don't know. Are you sure you're feeling up to talking now? I don't know. Have you any idea who the men were? No. Maybe we can talk to you later. I don't care what you do. I don't care what you do. You hear me? You hear me? Nervous shot. I'm sorry. We didn't mean to upset her. You didn't. I thought maybe she might be able to help you a little, but I guess not. Better make it sometime tomorrow morning. She'll be all right then. Okay, thanks. I don't know if I saw him. I don't know if I saw him. Too bad. Better have an ambulance move her up to county hospital. I don't think you should try to move her tonight. She needs rest. All right. We'll have a detail of men stand watch here until she's moved. What time tomorrow could we see her? If you can make it close to noon, it'll be better. Good rest. She'll be all right. Better let me give you a ring. Right. Could you give us her full name and address? Yes, I have it right here. 
Ida May Stalling, 837 Donahue Street, Lindwood. All right, thanks. Tom. Anybody else here in the cemetery and see the shooting? Well, I saw the man. I couldn't describe him, just their backs as they ran down the hall after the shooting. How were they built? Do you remember? About average, I'd say. Hard to tell. How were they dressed? Well, one of them was wearing a hat. Looked like some kind of summer hat. Straw? No, it was one of those, uh, what am I trying to say? You know, the kind. Was it an open weave hat? Oh, um, well, you know, very common in the summer. You mean a Panama? Panama, shit, I was it. White. What kind of suits did they have on? I couldn't tell you. I was in my office when I heard the shots. They came out in the car, and they were just making to the back door. Anyone else see it? Sylvia Proctor, the nurse who was in the room at the time. Why'd they kill her? I don't know. Any of the patients? Is it possible one of them might have seen them? Yes, one of them did see something. Bert Anderson. Like to talk with him? Yes, we would. And down this way, he's in room 38, just down the hall from the shooting. All uh-huh. right. I should tell you, Mr. Anderson lost his speech about nine years ago. He uses a child's slate to write up. Why is he here in the sanitarium? He's old, 73, he lives on a pension. Except for losing his speech, he's as sharp as a high school boy. Hello, Bert. Sorry to bother you after all the excitement. Yeah, all right. We won't keep you up long. It's after your bedtime. Uh, would you hand me that box of chalk over there? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Bert, these men are police officers. They want you to tell them what you know about the shooting tonight. Uh-huh. I thought you might have seen it. This is Captain Elliot from the Homicide Department. How do you do, Mr. Anderson? And this is Sergeant Friday. Is that right? Yes, sir. How are you, sir? And this is Sergeant Romero. How do you do, sir? Well, where were you at the time of the shooting, Mr. Anderson? Sitting in here with the door open. Uh-huh. Did you get a good look at the men? Uh, what would they look like? Hmm. Question, Nor. I don't think he understands what you want to know. Yes, that's a trouble. Uh-huh. Let's put it this way, Mr. Anderson. How many men were there? Uh, let's take one of these two men. Can you describe one of them? That's the way, Captain. That slate's rather small, and you can only get so much on it at a time. He's like all of us. He wants to talk fast, and this is the only way he knows, so we have to make it easy for him. I understand. Built like the captain. You're Bill, Skipper. Same man had a thin mustache. That's all I can tell you about him. How about the other man, Mr. Anderson? Can you describe him? Please. What's that second word? I can't make it out. Understand. Uh They're running very fast. Thanks. Yes, we understand. Did you see the other man at all? Fine. What can you tell us about him? All he could see was the man was wearing a hat. A white Panama hat, Mr. Anderson? He says yes. Was there anything peculiar about the way they walked or ran? Did one of them have a limp, for instance? Didn't notice anything. He says he didn't notice anything. Could you tell us anything about the men's faces? It, they passed by so quickly. I was worried about the gunshots. Yes, we can understand that, but do you think you could identify them if you ever saw them again? He says he could try. Could Mr. Anderson come downtown if we ever show up? Let me see why not, but gets around fine. Now he wants to know why they killed Miss Proctor, the nurse. Says she was one of his best friends. We don't know, Mr. Anderson. As he wishes he could talk, maybe he could help you more. It's all right, Bert. You talk loud enough. Monday, July 24th, a roundup of all known racketeers and their gang members was ordered by the chief of detectives. Three show ups were scheduled one at 10 a.m., one at 2, and another one at 3 p.m. The witnesses that we had were unable to identify any of the men. The incomplete descriptions we had of the suspects was not enough to help the artist in the crime lab to build a composite picture of the killers. No matter what approach we took, it seemed that we were getting nowhere. The immediate apprehension of the killers was not only important because of their danger to the private citizen, but because of the ever-present threat of an open shooting war between Gus Valentine's followers and members of the murder gang, whoever they were. 3.15 p.m. Hi, guys. Homicide, Romero. Oh, yeah, they... All right, thanks. Crime they make a run on those slugs you got at the hospital? Yeah, no match. Oh, that's great. How foul that can it get? Yeah. Hi. Come on, Romo. I'm with you. Hi, Rombo. Romo's messenger to call you why. Oh, yeah, better do it right away. Just know the skipper. Post Army me to work with you guys on the Valentine thing. We can use all the help we can get. Joe, you your side the phone over? Oh, yeah, here you go. What's the matter? Change your mind? You let her ring once. She knows the signal. She's over at the mother-in-law. Yeah? Mother-in-law's got lots of money and a limited phone. Let her call me. You got any ideas, Earl? 
Well, I don't know anybody who likes Valentine. A lot of them could have killed him. He's got word from the crime lab. There's no match on those slugs. And you didn't get anything out of the show up. No, no. Maybe that Stallings woman can give us something, huh? You haven't been out there yet? No, not yet. We've been sweating out the show ups. Tommy and I read your reports. Rough go. We had an idea. Yeah? One of Vanstein's boys you didn't get around to yet. Who's that? Danny Davis. He was pretty close to him. Thought a lot of him. If anybody figures to take over his interest, it's probably Davis. Well, you think advancement could have been the motive for him? No, he wouldn't kill him. Anyway, he couldn't have. Just got in from Florida this morning. That doesn't mean he couldn't have engineered it. Possible, but I doubt it. Stormy and I know his operation pretty well. Pulled him in on that Patterson killing six months ago. Checked back to his record. Never picked up carrying a gun. Well, it doesn't mean he couldn't get one in a hurry. I'm not going to guarantee, Davis, but I don't think he's your man, Joe. You got a line on him? He lives at the Church of Arms out in Wilshire. Yeah, uh, UCLA. All right, we'll talk to him. What was the name of that girl who was wounded, the one at the sanitarium? I had my stalling. We'll go out and talk to her if you like. Fine. Who's going to see the stallings woman at the sanitarium? We are. The doctor just called in from out there. Oh, yeah? Says she got something important to tell us. What do you think? She ran with Valentine. She knew his friend. Yeah. Maybe she knows his enemies. As we planned, Detectives Rombo and Stromwall went out to the Ferndale Sanitarium to talk to Ida Mae Stallings. Ben and I drove out to the Church Alarms apartments to see Benny Davis, one of Gus Valentine's close friends. He left a message with the desk clerk that he would be at his tailor's most of the day. The clerk gave us the address. It was an exclusive custom shop on Crescent Drive in the heart of Beverly Hills. Franklin Smith Limited it was one of those places that featured imported Scotch tweeds and fine English woolen. Good afternoon, gentlemen. May I serve you? Please tell us if Benny Davis is in here. Uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, yes, sir. Third fitting room. Uh, to the rear, on your left. Thank you. Come on. Hmm. Look at that brown cloth over there, Joe. Yeah, that's Donegal tweed. It's a nice fabric. I had one of them once. Where's that guy? Oh, yes. Yeah, this is a little pinstripe. Certainly, if it's a great deal of the brown one, you can turn around. Yes? Yes. Excellent fit. Yeah, it looks fine. Yeah. I don't know if I like that right shoulder. Looks a little low, Mr. Davis. Excuse me. Oh, this fitting room's taken, gentlemen. Benny Davis in here? Yeah, what is it? What if we could see you alone? What about? Confidential. Uh, no, Cedric, not like that. Pull the shoulder up. More padding. Oh, do you think so? I, I don't know if I agree, Mr. Davis. Well, you can see how it slopes off there. I uh, like a good pull shoulder. Well, you've got a good pull cut here. Of uh, course, too much padding is going to ruin the line of the jacket. I'd like more padding. Yes, very well. The number two pad in the right shoulder and easy arm hold. Number two pad, right shoulder, easy arm hold. What is it, income tax? What's the secret? We're police officers. I'd like to talk to you alone for a minute. All right, be finished in a second. That takes care of this one, Mr. Davis. You want two inch cuffs in the trousers? Yeah, no. Uh, Cedric, be sure to get these sleeves short enough. I'd like lots of linen to show. Oh, yes, surely. Now, if you'll slip on the green tropical. <laughs> okay. I'll take your jacket. Thanks. <laughs> hey, tell me what it's all about. I'd rather talk to you alone. Here are the trousers. Okay. <clears throat> Good looking suit, huh? Fine. Yeah, get all my stuff made here. I'll let Smith here make you a suit sometime. Got a fine suit of clothes. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Is that jacket, Mr. Davis? Right. Ah. That looks fine. Yes, the trousers are just right. And for fullness in the back of the jacket here. Uh huh. And take in the center seam. Take in the center seam. How much? And <sighs> thin. Here's the back. Raise the back. Short mm. collar. Short and collar. Yeah. It looks just fine. That's a nice soft roll of the lapels, isn't it? Yeah, good. It's all right, Mr. Davis. Now, how about the white Palm Beach? Nice Panama hat. It'd go good with that one. I never wear them. I like a coconut palm with a wide puggery band. Wonder if you could hold off the next fitting for a minute. We won't keep you long. All right. Any place around here where it's private? We can use Smith's office. Okay, Frank? Certainly. Go right ahead, gentlemen. Thank you. Which way? Back here. Okay, what's on your mind? Gus Valentine. Yeah, that's a tough one to lose. You got any idea who killed him? We're working on it. How do you mean? Because that. Well, that makes us even. There's only one difference. Yeah? We get paid for it. You don't. We thought a lot more of Gus than you did. Any law against striking down the killer? The law against shooting him down. Tell that to the boys who cut down Gus. I don't think you can get to him without us. We've done it before. You're a little late with Gus. We tried to keep him alive. We warned him for a month. He knew what was coming. We talked to him. Yeah, he told me. Funny guy. He had a mind of his own. He had a reason for not telling you. What was it? When we get there, we can ask him. You think you know who did it? Won't be too tough to find out. Meantime, you can 
work it from your end. And if you get to him first, maybe we'll give you a call. Now, you listen, Davis. I'll tell you the same thing we told Valentine. It's not open season for murder. This town's had all the shooting it's going to have. Valentine's killer's going to go to the gas chamber. That's the only way he's going to go, you understand? Nobody said you different. All right. Then you can tell us what you know. Who do you think shot Valentine? I can't be sure. You've got somebody in mind. There's a dame. Who? Audrey Thompson. What about it? She runs around with a couple of guys. Yeah. There's never any love lost between them and Gus. They were always talking big about what they'd do if Gus got out of line. What'd they have against him? Business. Claimed Gus was squeezing them out. Was he? I never knew much about Gus's out-of-town business. That's where these guys are from. They're new in town. Figured Gus was cutting them off out here in the coast. Who are they? Shakespeare Brothers. Bud and Carl. Where can we find them? I don't know. They're town somewhere. What about this Audrey Thompson? Nice dame. Hard to figure. Husband died a year ago. Real nice woman. Been doing the town of the Shaker boys. Nobody can figure it. You think she's in on it? No, but she could finger him if anybody could. Lives at 8700 North Toronto. All right, Davis. Thanks. What's the new wardrobe for? Going east to catch the new Broadway show leaving Wednesday. Better hold off for a week, huh? All right. Come on, Betty. Think he's got anything? Could be. We'll run it down. Yeah, wait a minute. Yeah. Hmm. Sure do like that brown cloth. It's nice. Yes, yeah, Sheldon. Can I help you? Um, how long does it take you to make up a suit? Anywhere from three days to a week. Uh-huh. You interested in having us make one up for you? Yeah. Yeah, how do they run? Prices start from 175 and up. This Donegal Tweed here makes up for $250. Oh. Well, I guess not, thank you. Wears like iron. Four thirty p.m. We drove out to eighty-seven hundred North Serrano to the home of Audrey Thompson. There was nobody home. We went back to the office to check with Rombo and Stromwall. We drove in the Spring Street entrance of the City Hall garage. There's Rombo and Strom. They must have just got in. Hey, Rombo. Hi. How'd you make out? Stallings woman tell you anything? No, well, we talked to her. Think maybe we got a lead. What's that? Girl around town by the name of Thompson. Audrey Thompson? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. What'd she say about her? That if anyone can put the finger on Valentine's killer, the Thompsons are okay. Many Davis told us the same thing. What do you think, Earl? Two and two makes four. Let's find her. Listening to Dragnet for the step by step solution to an actual police case. Here, step by step, are the reasons why Fatima has more than doubled its smokers from coast to coast. Step one the name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Step two long cigarette smokers discover Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Step three long cigarette smokers find Fatima. Extra mild. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why more and more smokers every day agree it's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Yes, the name Fatima on that golden yellow package is your insurance of an extra mild smoke. So enjoy King Size Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. Five o'clock Monday afternoon. We tried for three hours to get in touch with Audrey Thompson. A few minutes after 8 p.m., we contacted her landlady. She told us that the Thompson girl was out of town and would be gone for two days. She didn't know where she'd gone, but she told us that she would be back. We checked her apartment and found all of her clothing and personal effects. A stakeout was placed at 8700 North Serrano, and then we went back to the office and got out a local broadcast on Audrey Thompson. Tuesday morning, 8 o'clock, Ben and I met with Captain Elliott, Detectives Rombo and Stromwall. Get a line on the Shaker Brothers? I'm located them at the Eagle Towers apartment. Set them under surveillance. I don't think it'd be a good idea to pull them in yet. See what the Thompson girl has to say, then we can move on them. That's what we figured. Pull the packages on them? Yeah, they both got fair records. Been up on three raps, one conviction, second degree robbery in Tulsa. That's where they're from. A couple mm -hmm. of tough ones. Always had to use a gun. Apparently got a lot of dough somewhere. They've been throwing a lot of money around town. 
Pick up any rumbles about him? Well, we've been nosing around. We can't get anything on him for sure. They're not known around here. Showing the mug shots of the Shaker brothers to Mr. Anderson's sanitarium. The doc, too. Yeah. Looks like the guys to them. Everything hinges on the Thompson girl. Check her out? Yeah, she used to be married to a newspaper man, Blaine Thompson. Died last year in an auto accident. No children. Went to high school here in town. Local girl. Reputation's good all along. Why the sudden switch to tough guys? I don't think she knows. You satisfied Davis is leveling with you? Well, if he's not, he did a good job briefing the Stallings woman. We both came up with the same lead, the Thompson girl. We had him in on the Patterson killing. You remember that, Skipper? He cooperated then. That time it was his skin. This time it's not. Well, I laid it out for him. He's been told. Now, how's it feel to you fellas? Pretty quiet around town? Yeah, it seems to be. I wouldn't make book on what might happen if we don't wrap this thing up quick. I think after Joe and Ben gave Davis a word, he passed it down along the line. Anyway, there's an outside channel. They just brought in the Thompson girl. The sender in. Right. Thank you. You sit there, Miss Thompson. All right. Uh, Detectives Friday, Romero, how do you Hello. do? Bramo, Rambo. How do you do? How do, you do? How do, you do? I guess you're wondering why you've been picked up. Yes, I was rather surprised. I was down at Palm Springs for a few days. I don't often get away. My boss gave me a two-day holiday. What do you know about the Shaker brothers, Miss Thompson? They're friends of mine. I go out with We have reason to believe they might be mixed up in a murder. I don't believe that. What's this all about? The Gus Valentine killing. You think they're mixed up in that? How well do you know the Shaker boys? Well, to be truthful, I don't know them at all, really. I met them at a dance. Who introduced you? Nobody. I go to the Brookdale Ballroom every Wednesday night with some of the girls from the office. It's open to the public. Carl Shaker asked me for a dance one night, and that's how I met him. You ought to pick your companions a little more carefully. Both of these men have criminal records. I didn't know that. You've been out with them quite a lot, have you? I've known them a little over a month, yes. Have they ever said anything that might lead you to believe that they were mixed up in any rackets? No, I never heard anything like that. You're sure you never heard them discuss any business dealings of any kind? Yes, I'm sure. You've been seen in quite a few night spots around Los Angeles with them, is that right? Yes, they always take me to some nice place. You always go alone with them? How do you mean? Which one of them do you go with? Bud or Carl? Well, I never really thought about it. Both of them, I guess. When you go out, they never take another girl along in the party? No, Bud, Carl, and myself. You go to most of the expensive clubs around town, is that right? Yes, like I said, we always go to some nice place. Do you ever wonder where they got the money? Well, they told me they worked for one of the aircraft plants. I thought you told us they didn't discuss their business with you. Well, I didn't consider telling me where they worked or discussing business. Did you consider that an aircraft worker's salary wouldn't even handle a cover charge at most of the places they've been taking you? Well, no, I guess I was having too good a time to question. You see, Miss Thompson, you could spend a great amount of time with people and not remember things about them. Now, you sure you've told us everything you know about the Shaker brothers? Yes. All right, that's all. If you find out something you think we should know, we'd appreciate it if you'd give us a call. Well, I won't be knowing anything about them because I'm going to stop seeing them. I didn't know they had criminal records. That's entirely up to you. I think it's only fair to warn you that if you do have any information you're withholding, it'll liable you to persecution. I understand. And I'm not going out with them anymore. I wouldn't let them know you've talked with us. If they are the men we're looking for. It might put you in danger. I'm not afraid of it. Neither was Gus Valentine. <laughs> For the next 10 days, Audrey Thompson, along with the Shaker brothers, was kept under close surveillance. It was obvious that she'd either lied to us or changed her mind. She continued going out with them. She was seen in all the important night spots around town. Thursday, August 9th, we met with Captain Elliot. Skipper, maybe we better pull the Thompson girl in again for questions. Let's hold off for a few more days. I'm afraid if we bring her down here again, the Shaker brothers could get wise. If she decided to ignore what we told her, they might get rough with her. Why can't we move on them? Shake down their apartment. If we're lucky enough to come up with a murder gun, we can work from there. I don't think so, Joe. The record and only one conviction, I think we'd be playing a long shot. That's the way it looks to me, Earl. Maybe something will break if we can hold out just a few days more. Yeah, being watched awful close. If they try to move in any direction, our men will be with them. Friday. Yeah. Uh, can you step out here for a minute? Right. Excuse me. Oh, sure. Come back when you're through. Yes, sir. Yeah, the lady out here to see you. Thanks. Mr. Friday. Hello, Miss Thompson. I didn't stop seeing the Shaker boys. Yes, we know. What you men told me a couple of weeks ago just made me sick. You think I've been going out with these men, been seen with them. I've never done anything like that in my life. Yes, ma'am. I decided to try and find out what you wanted to know. You didn't ask them any leading questions. Oh, no, I knew better than that. Last night we were out and they had a little too much to drink and they got to talking. Yeah. I didn't say anything. I let them talk and acted interested. Yeah. I confess now, I'm terribly frightened. I spent the night with my sister-in-law. Could I stay here till you get this thing straightened out? Certainly. We'll give you protection, Miss Thompson. I wouldn't tell you. 
First, they got to talking about some girl called Ida May. I didn't catch the last name. Said they wondered if she saw them at the sanitarium. Yeah. Said they wished they'd finish the job that night, whatever that meant. Then Bud said, I don't think she saw us or we'd have heard. Anything else? Yes. Carl said, did you see the look on Gus's face when we opened up? Then what? They laughed. <laughs> I had a stenographer take Audrey Thompson's statement, and I filled in Captain Elliot, Rombo, Stromwall, and Ben. We checked the stake out on the Shaker brothers' apartment. The suspects hadn't been seen since early that morning when they'd gone in. Detectives Rombo and Stromwall, together with Ben and I, drove to the Eagle Tower's apartment. It was 4.35 p.m. Stromy and I will go up the back way. We'll notify the men on stakeout. Keep sharp eye all around. Right. Let's go. Apartment 410 is the top floor. Yeah, let's take the elevator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Push four. Right. Just thinking. Yeah. That Thompson girl, long on nerve. This way. Cover me. Yeah. Uh, police officers. You all right? Well, yeah. hit the door. Come on. Uh, one is open so far as game. Come on. There they go over by the ventilator. Watch it. Rombo coming out the door under the roof. Rombo, watch it. They're up here. There, there goes one of them. Come on. All right, hold it right there. Uh, I give up. There goes the other one. He's making for that table house. Stay with this one. I'll get him. All right, Shaker, let's put the gun away. You make a break onto the roof, they'll cut you down. Hold it, Shaker. Joe? Yeah? Did you shoot him? No. He's trying to make it to the roof. He grabbed that hot terminal over there and knocked him cold. Oh, yeah. Move your foot, will you? Yeah. What's that? White Panama hat. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 19th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 89, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to Fatima. Here is the actual report. From coast to coast, king-size Fatima has more than doubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day are discovering that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Long cigarette smokers find Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Long cigarette smokers find that Fatima is extra mild because it's the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make it extra mild. So enjoy extra mild Fatima. Best of all long cigarettes. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. It's wise to smoke extra mild Fatima. Adolph Bud Shaker and his brother Carl Shaker were tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. On recommendation of the jury, they received life sentences. They are now serving their terms in the state penitentiary. <laughs> You have just heard Dragnet, authentic cases from official police files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, is brought to Dragnet from Los Angeles. Tomorrow, hear the Ronald Coleman's in the Halls of Ivy on NBC. NBC.